Welcome to The Autobiography of Malcolm X, as told to Alex Haley, part of a Radical Guides audiobook series. I'm Jason Bayless, and I'd like to take a moment to introduce you to a story that resonates deeply with those of us who believe in challenging the status quo and striving for a more just world. Malcolm X's life was not just a series of events, but a profound journey of transformation. His story reflects ideals that we at A Radical Guide hold dear, empowerment, resistance, critical thinking, solidarity, justice, equality, and the courage to speak truth to power. But before we begin this journey together, it's essential to recognize the complexities of the narrative you're about to hear. Some of the language and perspectives in this book are products of their time and may seem inappropriate or uncomfortable by today's standards. I don't take pride in these words, but it's crucial to preserve them as they are an authentic part of the story. Please, let's approach this with an open heart and a willing mind recognizing the discomfort as a lens to better understand our own beliefs and our place in the ongoing struggle for dignity and equality. Now, sit back and immerse yourself in the life of Malcolm X, a man whose transformation and ideals continue to inspire us. Through his voice, we find a rallying cry for those who dare to think differently, those who yearn for a world where justice isn't just a dream, but a reality we can all strive for. This is not just a historical document, but a living testament. Malcolm X's story belongs to us all. It's a beacon for those who wish to create a more humane world, and it's a story that needs to be heard. The Autobiography of Malcolm X. With the assistance of Alex Haley. Introduction by M.S. Handler. Epilogue by Alex Haley. M.S. Handler. Introduction. The Sunday before he was to officially announce his rupture with Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm X came to my home to discuss his plans and give me some necessary documentation. Mrs. Handler had never met Malcolm before this fateful visit. She served us coffee and cakes while Malcolm spoke in the courteous, gentle manner that was his in private. It was obvious to me that Mrs. Handler was impressed by Malcolm. His personality filled our living room. Malcolm's attitude was that of a man who had reached a crossroads in his life and was making a choice under an inner compulsion. A wistful smile illuminated his countenance from time to time, a smile that said many things. I felt uneasy because Malcolm was evidently trying to say something which his pride and dignity prevented him from expressing. I sensed that Malcolm was not confident he would succeed in escaping from the shadowy world which had held him in thrall. Mrs. Handler was quiet and thoughtful after Malcolm's departure. Looking up suddenly, she said, You know, it was like having tea with a Black Panther. The description startled me. The Black Panther is an aristocrat in the animal kingdom. He is beautiful. He is dangerous. As a man, Malcolm X had the physical bearing and the inner self-confidence of a born aristocrat, and he was potentially dangerous. No man in our time aroused fear and hatred in the white man, as did Malcolm, because in him, the white man sensed an implacable foe who could not be had for any price, a man unreservedly committed to the cause of liberating the black man in American society rather than integrating the black man into that society. My first meeting with Malcolm X took place in March 1963 in the Muslim restaurant of Temple No. 7 on Lenox Avenue. I had been assigned by the New York Times to investigate the growing pressures within the Negro community. Thirty years of experience as a reporter in Western and Eastern Europe had taught me that the forces in a developing social struggle are frequently buried beneath the visible surface and make themselves felt in many ways long before they burst out into the open. These generative forces make themselves felt through the power of an idea long before their organizational forms can openly challenge the establishment. It is the merit of European political scientists and sociologists to give a high priority to the power of ideas in a social struggle. In the United States, it is our weakness to confuse the numerical strength of an organization and the publicity attached to leaders with the germinating forces that sow the seeds of social upheaval in our community. In studying the growing pressures within the Negro community, I had not only to seek the opinions of the established leaders of the civil rights organizations, but the opinions of those working in the penumbra of the movement, underground, so to speak. This is why I sought out Malcolm X, whose ideas had reached me through the medium of Negro integrationists. Their thinking was already reflecting a high degree of nascent Negro nationalism. I did not know what to expect as I waited for Malcolm. I was the only white person in the restaurant, an immaculate establishment tended by somber, handsome, uncommunicative Negroes. Signs reading, Smoking Forbidden, were pasted on the highly polished mirrors. I was served coffee but became uneasy in this aseptic, silent atmosphere as time passed. Malcolm finally arrived. 
He was very tall, handsome, of impressive bearing. His skin had a bronze hue. I rose to greet him and extended my hand. Malcolm's hand came up slowly. I had the impression it was difficult for him to take my hand, but, noblesse oblige, he did. Malcolm then did a curious thing, which he always repeated whenever we met in public in a restaurant in New York or Washington. He asked whether I would mind if he took a seat facing the door. I had had similar requests put to me in Eastern European capitals. Malcolm was on the alert. He wished to see every person who entered the restaurant. I quickly realized that Malcolm constantly walked in danger. We spoke for more than three hours at this first encounter. His views about the white man were devastating, but at no time did he transgress against my own personality and make me feel that I, as an individual, shared in the guilt. He attributed the degradation of the Negro people to the white man. He denounced integration as a fraud. He contended that if the leaders of the established civil rights organizations persisted, the social struggle would end in bloodshed because he was certain the white man would never concede full integration. He argued the Muslim case for separation as the only solution in which the Negro could achieve his own identity, develop his own culture, and lay the foundations for a self-respecting, productive community. He was vague about where the Negro state could be established. Malcolm refused to see the impossibility of the white man conceding secession from the United States. At this stage in his career, he contended it was the only solution. He defended Islam as a religion that did not recognize color bars. He denounced Christianity as a religion designed for slaves and the Negro clergy as the curse of the black man, exploiting him for their own purposes instead of seeking to liberate him and acting as handmaidens of the white community in its determination to keep the Negroes in a subservient position. During this first encounter, Malcolm also sought to enlighten me about the Negro mentality. He repeatedly cautioned me to beware of Negro affirmations of goodwill toward the white man. He said that the Negro had been trained to dissemble and conceal his real thoughts as a matter of survival. He argued that the Negro only tells the white man what he believes the white man wishes to hear, and that the art of dissembling reached a point where even Negroes cannot truthfully say they understand what their fellow Negroes believe. The art of deception practiced by the Negro was based on a thorough understanding of the white man's mores, he said. At the same time, the Negro has remained a closed book to the white man, who has never displayed any interest in understanding the Negro. Malcolm's exposition of his social ideas was clear and thoughtful, if somewhat shocking to the white initiate, but most disconcerting in our talk. Was Malcolm's belief in Elijah Muhammad's history of the origins of man and in a genetic theory devised to prove the superiority of black over white, a theory stunning to me in its sheer absurdity. After this first encounter, I realized that there were two Malcolms, the private and the public person. His public performances on television and at meeting halls produced an almost terrifying effect. His implacable marshalling of facts and his logic had something of a new dialectic, diabolic in its force. He frightened white television audiences, demolished his Negro opponents, but elicited a remarkable response from Negro audiences. Many Negro opponents in the end refused to make any public appearances on the same platform with him. The troubled white audiences were confused, disturbed, felt themselves threatened. Some began to consider Malcolm evil incarnate. Malcolm appealed to the two most disparate elements in the Negro community, the depressed mass and the galaxy of Negro writers and artists who have burst on the American scene in the past decade. The Negro middle class, the Negro establishment, abhorred and feared Malcolm as much as he despised it. The impoverished Negroes respected Malcolm in the way that wayward children respect the grandfather image. It was always a strange and moving experience to walk with Malcolm in Harlem. He was known to all. People glanced at him shyly. Sometimes Negro youngsters would ask for his autograph. It always seemed to me that their affection for Malcolm was inspired by the fact that although he had become a national figure, he was still a man of the people who, they felt, would never betray them. The Negroes have suffered too long from betrayals, and in Malcolm they sensed a man of mission. They knew his origins, with which they could identify. They knew his criminal and prison record, which he had never concealed. They looked upon Malcolm with a certain wonderment. Here was a man who had come from the lower depths, which they still inhabited who had triumphed over his own criminality and his own ignorance to become a forceful leader and spokesman, an uncompromising champion of his people. Although many could not share his Muslim religious beliefs, they found in Malcolm's Puritanism a standing reproach to their own lives. Malcolm had purged himself of all the ills that afflict the depressed Negro mass, 
drugs, alcohol, tobacco, not to speak of criminal pursuits. His personal life was impeccable, of a Puritanism unattainable for the mass. Human redemption, Malcolm had achieved it in his own lifetime, and this was known to the Negro community. In his television appearances and at public meetings, Malcolm articulated the woes and the aspirations of the depressed Negro mass in a way it was unable to do for itself. When he attacked the white man, Malcolm did for the Negroes what they couldn't do for themselves. He attacked with a violence and anger that spoke for the ages of misery. It was not an academic exercise of just giving hell to Mr. Charlie. Many of the Negro writers and artists who are national figures today revered Malcolm for what they considered his ruthless honesty in stating the Negro case, his refusal to compromise, and his search for a group identity that had been destroyed by the white man when he brought the Negroes in chains from Africa. The Negro writers and artists regarded Malcolm as the great catalyst, the man who inspired self-respect and devotion in the downtrodden millions. A group of these artists gathered one Sunday in my home, and we talked about Malcolm. Their devotion to him as a man was moving. One said, Malcolm will never betray us. We have suffered too much from betrayals in the past. Malcolm's attitude toward the white man underwent a marked change in 1964 a change that contributed to his break with Elijah Muhammad and his racist doctrines. Malcolm's meteoric eruption on the national scene brought him into wider contact with white men who were not the devils he had thought they were. He was much in demand as a speaker at student forums in Eastern universities and had appeared at many by the end of his short career as a national figure. He always spoke respectfully and with a certain surprise of the positive response of white students to his lectures. A second factor that contributed to his conversion to wider horizons was a growing doubt about the authenticity of Elijah Muhammad's version of the Muslim religion, a doubt that grew into a certainty with more knowledge and more experience. Certain secular practices at the Chicago headquarters of Elijah Muhammad had come to Malcolm's notice, and he was profoundly shocked. Finally, he embarked on a number of prolonged trips to Mecca and the newly independent African states through the good offices of the representatives of the Arab League in the United States. It was on his first trip to Mecca that he came to the conclusion that he had yet to discover Islam. Assassin's Bullets ended Malcolm's career before he was able to develop this new approach, which in essence recognized the Negroes as an integral part of the American community, a far cry from Elijah Muhammad's doctrine of separation. Malcolm had reached the midpoint in redefining his attitude to this country and the white-black relationship. He no longer invade against the United States, but against a segment of the United States represented by overt white supremacists in the South and covert white supremacists in the North. It was Malcolm's intention to raise Negro militancy to a new high point with the main thrust aimed at both the Southern and Northern white supremacists. The Negro problem, which he had always said should be renamed the white man's problem, was beginning to assume new dimensions for him in the last months of his life. To the very end, Malcolm sought to refashion the broken strands between the American Negroes and African culture. He saw in this the road to a new sense of group identity, a self-conscious role in history, and above all, a sense of man's own worth, which he claimed the white man had destroyed in the Negro. American autobiographical literature is filled with numerous accounts of remarkable men who pulled themselves to the summit by their bootstraps. Few are as poignant as Malcolm's memoirs. As testimony to the power of redemption and the force of human personality, the autobiography of Malcolm X is a revelation. New York, June 1965. Chapter 1. Nightmare. When my mother was pregnant with me, she told me later, a party of hooded Ku Klux Klan riders galloped up to our home in Omaha, Nebraska one night. Surrounding the house, brandishing their shotguns and rifles, they shouted for my father to come out. My mother went to the front door and opened it. Standing where they could see her pregnant condition, she told them that she was alone with her three small children and that my father was away, preaching in Milwaukee. The Klansmen shouted threats and warnings at her that we had better get out of town because the good Christian white people were not going to stand for my father's spreading trouble among the good Negroes of Omaha with the Back to Africa preachings of Marcus Garvey. My father, the Reverend Earl Little, was a Baptist minister, a dedicated organizer for Marcus Aurelius Garvey's UNIA, Universal Negro Improvement Association. With the help of such disciples as my father, Garvey, from his headquarters in New York City's Harlem, was raising the banner of black race purity and exhorting the Negro masses to return to their ancestral African homeland, a cause which had made Garvey the most controversial black man on earth. 
Still shouting threats, the clansmen finally spurred their horses and galloped around the house, shattering every window pane with their gun butts. Then they rode off into the night, their torches flaring as suddenly as they had come. My father was enraged when he returned. He decided to wait until I was born, which would be soon, and then the family would move. I am not sure why he made this decision, for he was not a frightened Negro, as most then were, and many still are today. My father was a big, six foot four, very black man. He had only one eye. How he had lost the other one, I have never known. He was from Reynolds, Georgia, where he had left school after the third or maybe fourth grade. He believed, as did Marcus Garvey, that freedom, independence, and self-respect could never be achieved by the Negro in America, and that therefore the Negro should leave America to the white man and return to his African land of origin. Among the reasons my father had decided to risk and dedicate his life to help disseminate this philosophy among his people was that he had seen four of his six brothers die by violence, three of them killed by white men, including one by lynching. What my father could not know then was that of the remaining three, including himself, only one, my Uncle Jim, would die in bed of natural causes. Northern white police were later to shoot my Uncle Oscar and my father was finally himself to die by the white man's hands. It has always been my belief that I, too, will die by violence. I have done all that I can to be prepared. I was my father's seventh child. He had three children by a previous marriage, Ella, Earl, and Mary, who lived in Boston. He had met and married my mother in Philadelphia, where their first child, my oldest full brother, Wilfred, was born. They moved from Philadelphia to Omaha, where Hilda and then Philbert were born. I was next in line. My mother was 28 when I was born on May 19th, 1925, in an Omaha hospital. Then we moved to Milwaukee, where Reginald was born. From infancy, he had some kind of hernia condition, which was to handicap him physically for the rest of his life. Louise Little, my mother, who was born in Granada in the British West Indies, looked like a white woman. Her father was white. She had straight black hair, and her accent did not sound like a Negro's. Of this white father of hers, I know nothing except her shame about it. I remember hearing her say she was glad that she had never seen him. It was, of course, because of him that I got my reddish-brown marony color of skin and my hair of the same color. I was the lightest child in our family. Out in the world later on, in Boston and New York, I was among the millions of Negroes who were insane enough to feel that it was some kind of status symbol to be light-complexioned, that one was actually fortunate to be born thus. But still later, I learned to hate every drop of that white rapist blood that is in me. Our family stayed only briefly in Milwaukee, for my father wanted to find a place where he could raise our own food and perhaps build a business. The teaching of Marcus Garvey stressed becoming independent of the white man. We went next, for some reason, to Lansing, Michigan. My father bought a house, and soon, as had been his pattern, he was doing freelance Christian preaching in local Negro Baptist churches and during the week he was roaming about spreading word of Marcus Garvey. He had begun to lay away savings for the store he had always wanted to own when, as always, some stupid local Uncle Tom Negroes began to funnel stories about his revolutionary beliefs to the local white people. This time, the get-out-of-town threats came from a local hate society called the Black Legion. They wore black robes instead of white. Soon, nearly everywhere my father went, Black Legionnaires were reviling him as an uppity nigger for wanting to own a store, for living outside the Lansing Negro District, for spreading unrest and dissension among the good niggers. As in Omaha, my mother was pregnant again, this time with my youngest sister. Shortly after Yvonne was born came the nightmare night in 1929, my earliest vivid memory. I remember being suddenly snatched awake into a frightening confusion of pistol shots and shouting and smoke and flames. My father had shouted and shot at the two white men who had set the fire and were running away. Our home was burning down around us. We were lunging and bumping and tumbling all over each other trying to escape. My mother, with the baby in her arms, just made it into the yard before the house crashed in, showering sparks. I remember we were outside in the night in our underwear, crying and yelling our heads off. The white police and firemen came and stood around watching as the house burned down to the ground. My father prevailed on some friends to clothe and houses temporarily. Then he moved us into another house on the outskirts of East Lansing. In those days, Negroes weren't allowed after dark in East Lansing proper. There's where Michigan State University is located, 
I related all of this to an audience of students when I spoke there in January 1963 and had the first reunion in a long while with my younger brother, Robert, who was there doing postgraduate studies in psychology. I told them how East Lansing harassed us so much that we had to move again, this time two miles out of town, into the country. This was where my father built for us with his own hands a four-room house. This is where I really begin to remember things, this home where I started to grow up. After the fire, I remember that my father was called in and questioned about a permit for the pistol with which he had shot at the white men who set the fire. I remember that the police were always dropping by our house, shoving things around, just checking or looking for a gun. The pistol they were looking for, which they never found and for which they wouldn't issue a permit, was sewed up inside a pillow. My father's 22 rifle and his shotgun, though, were right out in the open. Everyone had them for hunting birds and rabbits and other game. After that, my memories are of the friction between my father and mother. They seemed to be nearly always at odds. Sometimes my father would beat her. It might have had something to do with the fact that my mother had a pretty good education. Where she got it, I don't know. But an educated woman, I suppose, can't resist the temptation to correct an uneducated man. Every now and then, when she put those smooth words on him, he would grab her. My father was also belligerent toward all of the children, except me. The older ones he would beat almost savagely if they broke any of his rules. And he had so many rules, it was hard to know them all. Nearly all my whippings came from my mother. I've thought a lot about why. I actually believe that as anti-white as my father was, he was subconsciously so afflicted with the white man's brainwashing of Negroes that he inclined to favor the light ones, and I was his lightest child. Most Negro parents in those days would almost instinctively treat any lighter children better than they did the darker ones. It came directly from the slavery tradition that the mulatto, because he was visibly nearer to white, was therefore better. My two other images of my father are both outside the home. One was his role as a Baptist preacher. He never pastored in any regular church of his own. He was always a visiting preacher. I remember especially his favorite sermon, that little black train is a coming, and you better get all your business right. I guess this also fit his association with the Back to Africa movement, with Marcus Garvey's Black Train Homeward. My brother Filbert, the one just older than me, loved church, but it confused and amazed me. I would sit goggle-eyed at my father, jumping and shouting as he preached, with the congregation jumping and shouting behind him, their souls and bodies devoted to singing and praying. Even at that young age, I just couldn't believe in the Christian concept of Jesus as someone divine, and no religious person, until I was a man in my 20s and then in prison, could tell me anything. I had very little respect for most people who represented religion. It was in his role as a preacher that my father had most contact with the Negroes of Lansing. Believe me when I tell you that those Negroes were in bad shape then. They are still in bad shape, though in a different way. By that I mean that I don't know a town with a higher percentage of complacent and misguided so-called middle-class Negroes, the typical status symbol-oriented, integration-seeking type of Negroes. Just recently, I was standing in a lobby at the United Nations talking with an African ambassador and his wife when a Negro came up to me and said, You know me? I was a little embarrassed because I thought he was someone I should remember. It turned out that he was one of those bragging, self-satisfied, middle-class Lansing Negroes. I wasn't ingratiated. He was the type who would never have been associated with Africa until the fad of having African friends became a status symbol for middle-class Negroes. Back when I was growing up, the successful Lansing Negroes were such as waiters and boot blacks. To be a janitor at some downtown store was to be highly respected. The real elite, the big shots, the voices of the race, were the waiters at the Lansing Country Club and the shoeshine boys at the state capitol. The only Negroes who really had any money were the ones in the numbers racket or who ran the gambling houses or who in some other way lived parasitically off the poorest ones who were the masses. No Negroes were hired then by Lansing's big Oldsmobile plant or the Rio plant. Do you remember the Rio? It was manufactured in Lansing and R.E. Olds, the man after whom it was named, also lived in Lansing. When the war came along, they hired some Negro janitors. The bulk of the Negroes were either on welfare or WPA, or they starved. The day was to come when our family was so poor that we would eat the whole out of a donut. 
but at that time we were much better off than most town Negroes. The reason was that we raised much of our own food out there in the country where we were. We were much better off than the town Negroes who would shout, as my father preached, for the pie in the sky and their heaven in the hereafter, while the white man had his here on earth. I knew that the collections my father got for his preaching were mainly what fed and clothed us, and he also did other odd jobs, but still the image of him that made me proudest was his crusading and militant campaigning with the words of Marcus Garvey. As young as I was then, I knew from what I overheard that my father was saying something that made him a tough man. I remember an old lady grinning and saying to my father, you're scaring these white folks to death. One of the reasons I've always felt that my father favored me was that to the best of my remembrance, it was only me that he sometimes took with him to the Garvey Unia meetings, which he held quietly in different people's homes. There were never more than a few people at any one time, 20 at most. But that was a lot packed into someone's living room. I noticed how differently they all acted, although sometimes they were the same people who jumped and shouted in church. But in these meetings, both they and my father were more intense, more intelligent, and down to earth. It made me feel the same way. I can remember hearing of Adam driven out of the garden into the caves of Europe, Africa for the Africans, Ethiopians awake, and my father would talk about how it would not be much longer before Africa would be completely run by Negroes, by black men, was the phrase he always used. No one knows when the hour of Africa's redemption cometh. It is in the wind. It is coming. One day, like a storm, it will be here. I remember seeing the big, shiny photographs of Marcus Garvey that were passed from hand to hand. My father had a big envelope of them that he always took to these meetings. The pictures showed what seemed to me millions of Negroes thronged in parade behind Garvey riding in a fine car, a big black man dressed in a dazzling uniform with gold braid on it, and he was wearing a thrilling hat with tall plumes. I remember hearing that he had black followers not only in the United States but all around the world, and I remember how the meetings always closed with my father saying several times and the people chanting after him, Up, you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. I have never understood why, after hearing as much as I did of these kinds of things, I somehow never thought, then, of the black people in Africa. My image of Africa, at that time, was of naked savages, cannibals, monkeys, and tigers, and steaming jungles. My father would drive in his old black touring car, sometimes taking me to meeting places all around the Lansing area. I remember one daytime meeting, most were at night, in the town of Owasso, 40 miles from Lansing, which the Negroes called White City. Owasso's greatest claim to fame is that it is the hometown of Thomas E. Dewey. As in East Lansing, no Negroes were allowed on the streets there after dark, hence the daytime meeting. In point of fact, in those days, lots of Michigan towns were like that. Every town had a few home Negroes who lived there. Sometimes it would be just one family, as in the nearby county seat, Mason, which had a single Negro family named Lyons. Mr. Lyons had been a famous football star at Mason High School, was highly thought of in Mason, and consequently, he now worked around that town in menial jobs. My mother at this time seemed to be always working, cooking, washing, ironing, cleaning, and fussing over us eight children, and she was usually either arguing with or not speaking to my father. One cause of friction was that she had strong ideas about what she wouldn't eat and didn't want us to eat, including pork and rabbit both of which my father loved dearly. He was a real Georgia Negro, and he believed in eating plenty of what we in Harlem today call soul food. I've said that my mother was the one who whipped me. At least she did whenever she wasn't ashamed to let the neighbors think she was killing me. For if she even acted as though she was about to raise her hand to me, I would open my mouth and let the world know about it. If anybody was passing by out on the road, she would either change her mind or just give me a few licks. Thinking about it now, I feel definitely that just as my father favored me for being lighter than the other children, my mother gave me more hell for the same reason. She was very light herself, but she favored the ones who were darker. Wilfred, I know, was particularly her angel. I remember that she would tell me to get out of the house and let the sun shine on you so you can get some color. She went out of her way never to let me become afflicted with a sense of color superiority. I am sure that she treated me this way partly because of how she came to be light herself. I learned early that crying out in protest could accomplish things. 
My older brothers and sister had started to school when sometimes they would come in and ask for a buttered biscuit or something, and my mother impatiently would tell them no. But I would cry out and make a fuss until I got what I wanted. I remember well how my mother asked me why I couldn't be a nice boy like Wilfred, but I would think to myself that Wilfred, for being so nice and quiet, often stayed hungry. So early in life, I had learned that if you want something, you had better make some noise. Not only did we have our big garden, but we raised chickens. My father would buy some baby chicks and my mother would raise them. We all loved chicken. That was one dish there was no argument with my father about. One thing in particular that I remember made me feel grateful toward my mother was that one day I went and asked her for my own garden and she did let me have my own little plot. I loved it and took care of it well. I loved especially to grow peas. I was proud when we had them on our table. I would pull out the grass in my garden by hand when the first little blades came up. I would patrol the rows on my hands and knees for any worms and bugs, and I would kill and bury them. And sometimes when I had everything straight and clean for my things to grow, I would lie down on my back between two rows, and I would gaze up in the blue sky at the clouds moving and think all kinds of things. At five, I too began to go to school, leaving home in the morning, along with Wilfred, Hilda, and Filbert. It was the Pleasant Grove School that went from kindergarten through the eighth grade. It was two miles outside the city limits, and I guess there was no problem about our attending because we were the only Negroes in the area. In those days, white people in the North usually would adopt just a few Negroes. They didn't see them as any threat. The white kids didn't make any great thing about us either. They called us nigger and darky and rastus so much that we thought those were our natural names but they didn't think of it as an insult. It was just the way they thought about us. One afternoon in 1931, when Wilfred, Hilda, Filbert, and I came home, my mother and father were having one of their arguments. There had lately been a lot of tension around the house because of Black Legion threats. Anyway, my father had taken one of the rabbits which we were raising and ordered my mother to cook it. We raised rabbits but sold them to whites. My father had taken a rabbit from the rabbit pen. He had pulled off the rabbit's head. He was so strong, he needed no knife to behead chickens or rabbits. With one twist of his big black hands, he simply twisted off the head and threw the bleeding neck thing back at my mother's feet. My mother was crying. She started to skin the rabbit, preparatory to cooking it. But my father was so angry, he slammed on out of the front door and started walking up the road toward town. It was then that my mother had this vision. She had always been a strange woman in this sense and had always had a strong intuition of things about to happen. And most of her children are the same way, I think. When something is about to happen, I can feel something, sense something. I never have known something to happen that has caught me completely off guard, except once. And that was when, years later, I discovered facts I couldn't believe about a man who, up until that discovery, I would gladly have given my life for. My father was well up the road when my mother ran screaming out onto the porch. Early, early, she screamed his name. She clutched up her apron in one hand and ran down across the yard and into the road. My father turned around. He saw her. For some reason, considering how angry he had been when he left, he waved at her, but he kept on going. She told me later, my mother did, that she had a vision of my father's end. All the rest of the afternoon, she was not herself, crying and nervous and upset. She finished cooking the rabbit and put the whole thing in the warmer part of the black stove. When my father was not back home by our bedtime, my mother hugged and clutched us, and we felt strange, not knowing what to do, because she had never acted like that. I remember waking up to the sound of my mother screaming again. When I scrambled out, I saw the police in the living room. They were trying to calm her down. She had snatched on her clothes to go with them. And all of us children who were staring knew without anyone having to say it that something terrible had happened to our father. My mother was taken by the police to the hospital and to a room where a sheet was over my father in a bed, and she wouldn't look. She was afraid to look. Probably it was wise that she didn't. My father's skull on one side was crushed in, I was told later. Negroes in Lansing have always whispered that he was attacked and then laid across some tracks for a streetcar to run over him. His body was cut almost in half. He lived two and a half hours in that condition. Negroes then were stronger than they are now especially Georgia Negroes. Negroes born in Georgia had to be strong simply to survive. It was morning when we children at home got the word that he was dead. I was six. I can remember a vague commotion, 
the house filled up with people crying, saying bitterly that the white black legion had finally gotten him. My mother was hysterical. In the bedroom, women were holding smelling salts under her nose. She was still hysterical at the funeral. I don't have a very clear memory of the funeral either. Oddly, the main thing I remember is that it wasn't in a church, and that surprised me, since my father was a preacher, and I had been where he preached people's funerals in churches. But his was in a funeral home, and I remember that during the service, a big black fly came down and landed on my father's face, and Wilfred sprang up from his chair, and he shooed the fly away, and he came groping back to his chair. There were folding chairs for us to sit on, and the tears were streaming down his face. When we went by the casket, I remember that I thought that it looked as if my father's strong black face had been dusted with flour, and I wish they hadn't put on such a lot of it. Back in the big four-room house, there were many visitors for another week or so. They were good friends of the family, such as the Lions from Mason, 12 miles away, and the Walkers, Maguires, Liscos, the Greens, Randolphs, and the Turners, and others from Lansing, and a lot of people from other towns whom I had seen at the Garvey meetings. We children adjusted more easily than our mother did. We couldn't see, as clearly as she did, the trials that lay ahead. As the visitors tapered off, she became very concerned about collecting the two insurance policies that my father had always been proud he carried. He had always said that families should be protected in case of death. One policy apparently paid off without any problem, the smaller one. I don't know the amount of it. I would imagine it was not more than $1,000, and maybe half of that. But after that money came, and my mother had paid out a lot of it for the funeral and expenses, she began going into town and returning very upset. The company that had issued the bigger policy was balking at paying off. They were claiming that my father had committed suicide. Visitors came again, and there was bitter talk about white people. How could my father bash himself in the head, then get down across the streetcar tracks to be run over? So there we were. My mother was 34 years old now with no husband, no provider or protector to take care of her eight children. But some kind of a family routine got going again, and for as long as the first insurance money lasted, we did all right. Wilfred, who was a pretty stable fellow, began to act older than his age. I think he had the sense to see, when the rest of us didn't, what was in the wind for us. He quietly quit school and went to town in search of work. He took any kind of job he could find, and he would come home, dog-tired in the evenings, and give whatever he had made to my mother. Hilda, who always had been quiet too, attended to the babies. Filbert and I didn't contribute anything. We just fought all the time, each other at home, and then at school we would team up and fight white kids. Sometimes the fights would be racial in nature, but they might be about anything. Reginald came under my wing. Since he had grown out of the toddling stage, he and I had become very close. I suppose I enjoyed the fact that he was the little one, under me, who looked up to me. My mother began to buy on credit. My father had always been very strongly against credit. Credit is the first step into debt and back into slavery, he had always said. And then she went to work herself. She would go into Lansing and find different jobs, in housework or sewing, for white people. They didn't realize usually that she was a Negro. A lot of white people around there didn't want Negroes in their houses. She would do fine until, in some way or other, it got to people who she was, whose widow she was, and then she would be let go. I remember how she used to come home crying, but trying to hide it because she had lost a job that she needed so much. Once when one of us, I cannot remember which, had to go for something to where she was working, and the people saw us and realized she was actually a Negro, she was fired on the pot, and she came home crying, this time not hiding it. When the state welfare people began coming to our house, we would come from school sometimes and find them talking with our mother, asking a thousand questions. They acted and looked at her and at us and around in our house in a way that had about it the feeling, at least for me, that we were not people. In their eyesight, we were just things, that was all. My mother began to receive two checks, a welfare check and I believe widow's pension. The checks helped, but they weren't enough, as many of us as there were. When they came, about the first of the month, one always was already owed in full, if not more, to the man at the grocery store. And after that, the other one didn't last long. We began to go swiftly downhill. The physical downhill wasn't as quick as the psychological. My mother was, above everything else, a proud woman. And it took its toll on her that she was accepting charity. 
and her feelings were communicated to us. She would speak sharply to the man at the grocery store for padding the bill, telling him that she wasn't ignorant and he didn't like that. She would talk back sharply to the state welfare people, telling them that she was a grown woman, able to raise her children, that it wasn't necessary for them to keep coming around so much, meddling in our lives, and they didn't like that. But the monthly welfare check was their pass. They acted as if they owned us, as if we were their private property. As much as my mother would have liked to, she couldn't keep them out. She would get particularly incensed when they began insisting upon drawing us older children aside, one at a time, out on the porch or somewhere, and asking us questions or telling us things against our mother and against each other. We couldn't understand why. If the state was willing to give us packages of meat, sacks of potatoes and fruit, and cans of all kinds of things, our mother obviously hated to accept. We really couldn't understand. What I later understood was that my mother was making a desperate effort to preserve her pride and ours. Pride was just about all we had to preserve, for by 1934, we really began to suffer. This was about the worst depression year, and no one we knew had enough to eat or live on. Some old family friends visited us now and then. At first, they brought food. Though it was charity, my mother took it. Wilford was working to help. My mother was working when she could find any kind of job. In Lansing, there was a bakery where, for a nickel, a couple of us children would buy a tall flour sack of day-old bread and cookies and then walk the two miles back out into the country to our house. Our mother knew, I guess, dozens of ways to cook things with bread and out of bread. Stewed tomatoes with bread, maybe that would be a meal. Something like French toast, if we had any eggs. Bread pudding, sometimes with raisins in it. If we got hold of some hamburger, it came to the table more bread than meat. The cookies that were always in the sack with the bread, we just gobbled down straight. But there were times when there wasn't even a nickel, and we would be so hungry we were dizzy. My mother would boil a big pot of dandelion greens, and we would eat that. I remember that some small-minded neighbor put it out, and children would tease us that we ate fried grass. Sometimes, if we were lucky, we would have oatmeal or cornmeal mush three times a day or mush in the morning and cornbread at night. Filbert and I were grown up enough to quit fighting long enough to take the point .22 caliber rifle that had been our father's and shoot rabbits that some white neighbors up or down the road would buy. I know now that they just did it to help us because they, like everyone, shot their own rabbits. Sometimes I remember Filbert and I would take little Reginald along with us. He wasn't very strong, but he was always so proud to be along. We would trap muskrats out in the little creek in back of our house, and we would lie quiet until unsuspecting bullfrogs appeared, and we would spear them, cut off their legs, and sell them for a nickel, a pair to people who lived up and down the road. The whites seemed less restricted in their dietary tastes. Then, about in late 1934, I would guess, something began to happen. Some kind of psychological deterioration hit our family circle and began to eat away our pride. Perhaps it was the constant, tangible evidence that we were destitute. We had known other families who had gone on relief. We had known without anyone in our home ever expressing it that we had felt prouder not to be at the depot where the free food was passed out. And now we were among them. At school, the on relief finger suddenly was pointed at us too, and sometimes it was said aloud. It seemed that everything to eat in our house was stamped not to be sold. All welfare food bore this stamp to keep the recipients from selling it. It's a wonder we didn't come to think of not to be sold as a brand name. Sometimes, instead of going home from school, I walked the two miles up the road into Lansing. I began drifting from store to store, hanging around outside where things like apples were displayed in boxes and barrels and baskets, and I would watch my chance and steal me a treat. You know what a treat was to me? Anything. Or I began to drop in about dinner time at the home of some family that we knew. I knew that they knew exactly why I was there, but they never embarrassed me by letting on. They would invite me to stay for supper, and I would stuff myself. Especially, I liked to drop in and visit at the Gohanas' home. They were nice, older people, and great churchgoers. I had watched them lead the jumping and shouting when my father preached. They had, living with them, they were raising him, a nephew whom everyone called Big Boy, and he and I got along fine. Also living with the Gohanases was old Mrs. Adcock, who went with them to church. She was always trying to help anybody she could, visiting anyone she heard was sick, carrying them something. She was the one who, years later, would tell me something that I remembered a long time. Malcolm, there's one thing I like about you. 
You're no good, but you don't try to hide it. You are not a hypocrite. The more I began to stay away from home and visit people and steal from the stores, the more aggressive I became in my inclinations. I never wanted to wait for anything. I was growing up fast, physically more so than mentally. As I began to be recognized more around the town, I started to become aware of the peculiar attitude of white people toward me. I sensed that it had to do with my father. It was an adult version of what several white children had said at school, in hints, or sometimes in the open, which really expressed what their parents had said, that the Black Legion or the Klan had killed my father, and the insurance company had pulled a fast one in refusing to pay my mother the policy money. When I began to get caught stealing now and then, the state welfare people began to focus on me when they came to our house. I can't remember how I first became aware that they were talking of taking me away. What I first remember along that line was my mother raising a storm about being able to bring up her own children. She would whip me for stealing, and I would try to alarm the neighborhood with my yelling. One thing I have always been proud of is that I never raised my hand against my mother. In the summertime, at night, in addition to all the other things we did, some of us boys would slip out down the road or across the pastures and go cooning watermelons. White people always associated watermelons with Negroes, and they sometimes called Negroes coons among all the other names, and so stealing watermelons became cooning them. If white boys were doing it, it implied that they were only acting like Negroes. Whites have always hidden or justified all of the guilts they could by ridiculing or blaming Negroes. One Halloween night, I remember that a bunch of us were out tipping over those old country outhouses, and one old farmer, I guess he had tipped over enough in his day, had set a trap for us. Always. You sneak up from behind the outhouse, then you gang together and push it to tip it over. This farmer had taken his outhouse off the hole and set it just in front of the hole. Well, we came sneaking up in single file in the darkness, and the two white boys in the lead fell down into the outhouse hole neck deep. They smelled so bad it was all we could stand to get them out, and that finished us all for that Halloween. I had just missed falling in myself. The whites were so used to taking the lead. This time, it had really gotten them in the hole. Thus, in various ways, I learned various things. I picked strawberries, and though I can't recall what I got per crate for picking, I remember that after working hard all one day, I wound up with about a dollar, which was a whole lot of money in those times. I was so hungry, I didn't know what to do. I was walking away toward town with visions of buying something good to eat, and this older white boy I knew, Richard Dixon, came up and asked me if I wanted to match nickels. He had plenty of change for my dollar. In about a half hour, he had all the change back, including my dollar. And instead of going to town to buy something, I went home with nothing, and I was bitter. But that was nothing compared to what I felt when I found out later that he had cheated. There is a way that you can catch and hold the nickel and make it come up the way you want. This was my first lesson about gambling. If you see somebody winning all the time, he isn't gambling, he's cheating. Later on in life, if I were continuously losing in any gambling situation, I would watch very closely. It's like the Negro in America seeing the white man win all the time. He's a professional gambler. He has all the cards and the odds stacked on his side, and he has always dealt to our people from the bottom of the deck. About this time, my mother began to be visited by some Seventh-day Adventists who had moved into a house not too far down the road from us. They would talk to her for hours at a time and leave booklets and leaflets and magazines for her to read. She read them, and Wilfred, who had started back to school after we had begun to get the relief food supplies, also read a lot. His head was forever in some book. Before long, my mother spent much time with the Adventists. It's my belief that what mostly influenced her was that they had even more diet restrictions than she always had taught and practiced with us. Like us, they were against eating rabbit and pork. They followed the Mosaic dietary laws. They ate nothing of the flesh without a split hoof or that didn't chew a cud. We began to go with my mother to the Adventist meetings that were held further out in the country. For us children, I know that the major attraction was the good food they served, but we listened too. There were a handful of Negroes from small towns in the area, but I would say that it was 99% white people. The Adventists felt that we were living at the end of time, that the world soon was coming to an end, but they were the friendliest white people I had ever seen. In some ways, though, we children noticed. And, when we were back at home, discussed that they were different from us, such as the lack of enough seasoning in their food and the different way that white people smelled. Meanwhile, the state welfare people kept after my mother. By now, she didn't make it any secret that she hated them 
and didn't want them in her house, but they exerted their right to come, and I have many, many times reflected upon how, talking to us children, they began to plant the seeds of division in our minds. They would ask such things as, who was smarter than the other? And they would ask me why I was so different. I think they felt that getting children into foster homes was a legitimate part of their function, and the result would be less troublesome, however they went about it. And when my mother fought them, they went after her, first through me. I was the first target. I stole. That implied that I wasn't being taken care of by my mother. All of us were mischievous at some time or another, I more so than any of the rest. Philbert and I kept a battle going, and this was just one of a dozen things that kept building up the pressure on my mother. I'm not sure just how or when the idea was first dropped by the welfare workers that our mother was losing her mind. But I can distinctly remember hearing crazy applied to her by them when they learned that the Negro farmer who was in the next house down the road from us had offered to give us some butchered pork, a whole pig, maybe even two of them, and she had refused. We all heard them call my mother crazy to her face for refusing good meat. It meant nothing to them, even when she explained that we had never eaten pork that it was against her religion as a Seventh-day Adventist. They were as vicious as vultures. They had no feelings, understanding, compassion, or respect for my mother. They told us, she's crazy for refusing food. Right then was when our home, our unity, began to disintegrate. We were having a hard time, and I wasn't helping. But we could have made it. We could have stayed together. As bad as I was, as much trouble and worry as I caused my mother, I loved her. The state people we found out had interviewed the Gohanas family, and the Gohanases had said that they would take me into their home. My mother threw a fit, though, when she heard that, and the home wreckers took cover for a while. It was about this time that the large, dark man from Lansing began visiting. I don't remember how or where he and my mother met. It may have been through some mutual friends. I don't remember what the man's profession was. In 1935, in Lansing, Negroes didn't have anything you could call a profession. But the man, big and black, looked something like my father. I can remember his name, but there's no need to mention it. He was a single man, and my mother was a widow only 36 years old. The man was independent. Naturally, she admired that. She was having a hard time disciplining us, and a big man's presence alone would help. And if she had a man to provide, it would send the state people away forever. We all understood without ever saying much about it, or at least we had no objection. We took it in stride, even with some amusement among us, that when the man came, our mother would be all dressed up in the best that she had. She still was a good-looking woman, and she would act differently, light-hearted and laughing, as we hadn't seen her act in years. It went on for about a year, I guess, and then, about 1936 or 1937, the man from Lansing jilted my mother suddenly. He just stopped coming to see her. From what I later understood, he finally backed away from taking on the responsibility of those eight mouths to feed. He was afraid of so many of us. To this day, I can see the trap that mother was in, saddled with all of us. And I can also understand why he would shun taking on such a tremendous responsibility. But it was a terrible shock to her. It was the beginning of the end of reality for my mother. When she began to sit around and walk around talking to herself, almost as though she was unaware that we were there, it became increasingly terrifying. The state people saw her weakening. That was when they began the definite steps to take me away from home. They began to tell me how nice it was going to be at the Gohannes home, where the Gohannises and Big Boy and Mrs. Adcock had all said how much they liked me and would like to have me live with them. I liked all of them too, but I didn't want to leave Wilfred. I looked up to and admired my big brother. I didn't want to leave Hilda who was like my second mother, or Filbert. Even in our fighting, there was a feeling of brotherly union, or Reginald especially, who was weak with his hernia condition and who looked up to me as his big brother who looked out for him as I looked up to Wilfred. And I had nothing either against the babies, Yvonne, Wesley, and Robert. As my mother talked to herself more and more, she gradually became less responsive to us and less responsible. The house became less tidy, we began to be more unkempt, and usually now, Hilda cooked. We children watched our anchor giving way. It was something terrible that you couldn't get your hands on, yet you couldn't get away from. It was a sensing that something bad was going to happen. We younger ones leaned more and more heavily on the relative strength of Wilfred and Hilda, who were the oldest. 
When finally I was sent to the Gohana's home, at least in a surface way, I was glad. I remember that when I left home with the state man, my mother said one thing, don't let them feed him any pig. It was better, in a lot of ways, at the Gohana's. Big Boy and I shared his room together, and we hit it off nicely. He just wasn't the same as my blood brothers. The Gohanneses were very religious people. Big Boy and I attended church with them. They were sanctified holy rollers now. The preachers and congregations jumped even higher and shouted even louder than the Baptists I had known. They sang at the top of their lungs and swayed back and forth and cried and moaned and beat on tambourines and chanted. It was spooky, with ghosts and spirituals and haunts seeming to be in the very atmosphere when finally we all came out of the church, going back home. The Gohanneses and Mrs. Adcock loved to go fishing, and some Saturdays Big Boy and I would go along. I had changed schools now to Lansing's West Junior High School. It was right in the heart of the Negro community, and a few white kids were there. But Big Boy didn't mix much with any of our schoolmates, and I didn't either. And when we went fishing, neither he nor I liked the idea of just sitting and waiting for the fish to jerk the cork under the water or make the tight line quiver when we fished that way. I figured there should be some smarter way to get the fish, though we never discovered what it might be. Mr. Gohannis was close cronies with some other men who, some Saturdays, would take me and Big Boy with them hunting rabbits. I had my father's point two two caliber rifle. My mother had said it was all right for me to take it with me. The old men had a set rabbit hunting strategy that they had always used. Usually when a dog jumps a rabbit and the rabbit gets away, that rabbit will always somehow instinctively run in a circle and return sooner or later past the very spot where he originally was jumped. Well, the old men would just sit and wait in hiding somewhere for the rabbit to come back, then get their shots at him. I got to thinking about it, and finally I thought of a plan. I would separate from them and Big Boy, and I would go to a point where I figured that the rabbit returning would have to pass me first. It worked like magic. I began to get three and four rabbits before they got one. The astonishing thing was that none of the old men ever figured out why. They outdid themselves exclaiming what a sure shot I was. I was about 12 then. All I had done was to improve on their strategy, and it was the beginning of a very important lesson in life, that any time you find someone more successful than you are, especially when you're both engaged in the same business, you know they're doing something that you aren't. I would return home to visit fairly often. Sometimes Big Boy and one or another, or both, of the Gohannises would go with me. Sometimes not. I would be glad when some of them did go, because it made the ordeal easier. Soon the state people were making plans to take over all of my mother's children. She talked to herself nearly all of the time now, and there was a crowd of new white people entering the picture, always asking questions. They would even visit me at the Gohanas. They would ask me questions out on the porch or sitting out in their cars. Eventually my mother suffered a complete breakdown, and the court orders were finally signed. They took her to the state mental hospital at Kalamazoo. It was 70-some miles from Lansing, about an hour and a half on the bus. A Judge McClellan in Lansing had authority over me and all of my brothers and sisters. We were state children, court wards. He had the full say-so over us. A white man in charge of a black man's children. Nothing but legal, modern slavery, however kindly intentioned. My mother remained in the same hospital at Kalamazoo for about 26 years. Later, when I was still growing up in Michigan, I would go to visit her every so often. Nothing that I can imagine could have moved me as deeply as seeing her pitiful state. In 1963, we got my mother out of the hospital, and she now lives there in Lansing with Philbert and his family. It was so much worse than if it had been a physical sickness, for which a cause might be known, medicine given, a cure effected. Every time I visited her, when finally they led her, a case, a number, back inside from where we had been sitting together, I felt worse. My last visit, when I knew I would never come to see her again, there, was in 1952. I was 27. My brother Philbert had told me that on his last visit, she had recognized him somewhat. In spots, he said. But she didn't recognize me at all. She stared at me. She didn't know who I was. Her mind, when I tried to talk to reach her, was somewhere else. I asked, Mama, do you know what day it is? She said, staring. All the people have gone. I can't describe how I felt. The woman who had brought me into the world and nursed me and advised me and chastised me and loved me didn't know me. It was as if I was trying to walk up the side of a hill of feathers. I looked at her. I listened to her talk, but there was nothing I could do. Nothing I 
I truly believe that if ever a state social agency destroyed a family, it destroyed ours. We wanted and tried to stay together. Our home didn't have to be destroyed, but the welfare, the courts, and their doctor gave us the one, two, three punch. And ours was not the only case of this kind. I knew I wouldn't be back to see my mother again because it could make me a very vicious and dangerous person, knowing how they had looked at us as numbers and as a case in their book, not as human beings. And knowing that my mother in there was a statistic that didn't have to be, that existed because of a society's failure, hypocrisy, greed, and lack of mercy and compassion. Hence, I have no mercy or compassion in me for a society that will crush people and then penalize them for not being able to stand up under the weight. I have rarely talked to anyone about my mother, for I believe that I am capable of killing a person without hesitation who happened to make the wrong kind of remark about my mother. So I purposely don't make any opening for some fool to step into. Back then, when our family was destroyed in 1937, Wilfred and Hilda were old enough so that the state let them stay on their own in the big four-room house that my father had built. Philbert was placed with another family in Lansing, a Mrs. Hackett, while Reginald and Wesley went to live with a family called Williams, who were friends of my mother's. And Yvonne and Robert went to live with a West Indian family named McGuire. Separated though we were, all of us maintained fairly close touch around Lansing, in school and out, whenever we could get together. Despite the artificially created separation and distance between us, we still remained very close in our feelings toward each other. Chapter 2 Mascot On June 27th of that year, 1937, Joe Louis knocked out James J. Braddock to become the heavyweight champion of the world. And all the Negroes in Lansing, like Negroes everywhere, went wildly happy with the greatest celebration of race pride our generation had ever known. Every Negro boy old enough to walk wanted to be the next Brown Bomber. My brother Filbert, who had already become a pretty good boxer in school, was no exception. I was trying to play basketball. I was gangling and tall, but I wasn't very good at it. Too awkward. In the fall of that year, Filbert entered the amateur bouts that were held in Lansing's Pruden Auditorium. He did well, surviving the increasingly tough eliminations. I would go down to the gym and watch him train. It was very exciting. Perhaps without realizing it, I became secretly envious. For one thing, I know I could not help seeing some of my younger broth Reginald's lifelong admiration for me getting siphoned off to Filbert. People praised Filbert as a natural boxer. I figured that since we belonged to the same family, maybe I would become one too. So I put myself in the ring. I think I was 13 when I signed up for my first bout, but my height and raw bone frame let me get away with claiming that I was 16, the minimum age, and my weight of about 128 pounds got me classified as a bantamweight. They matched me with a white boy, a novice like myself, named Bill Peterson. I'll never forget him. When our turn and the next amateur bouts came up, all of my brothers and sisters were there watching, along with just about everyone else I knew in town. They were there not so much because of me, but because of Filbert, who had begun to build up a pretty good following, and they wanted to see how his brother would do. I walked down the aisle between the people thronging the rows of seats and climbed in the ring. Bill Peterson and I were introduced, and then the referee called us together and mumbled all of that stuff about fighting fair and breaking clean. Then the bell rang, and we came out of our corners. I knew I was scared, but I didn't know, as Bill Peterson told me later on, that he was scared of me too. He was so scared I was going to hurt him that he knocked me down 50 times if he did once. He did such a job on my reputation in the Negro neighborhood that I practically went into hiding. A Negro just can't be whipped by somebody white and return with his head up to the neighborhood, especially in those days when sports and, to a lesser extent, show business were the only fields open to Negroes, and when the ring was the only place a Negro could whip a white man and not be lynched. When I did show my face again, the Negroes I knew rode me so badly I knew I had to do something. But the worst of my humiliations was my younger brother Reginald's attitude. He simply never mentioned the fight. It was the way he looked at me and avoided looking at me. So I went back to the gym and I trained hard. I beat bags and skipped rope and grunted and sweated all over the place. And finally, I signed up to fight Bill Peterson again. This time, the bouts were held in his hometown of Alma, Michigan. The only thing better about the rematch was that hardly anyone I knew was there to see it. 
I was particularly grateful for Reginald's absence. The moment the bell rang, I saw a fist, then the canvas coming up, and 10 seconds later, the referee was saying, 10 over me. It was probably the shortest fight in history. I lay there listening to the full count, but I couldn't move. To tell the truth, I'm not sure I wanted to move. That white boy was the beginning and the end of my fight career. A lot of times in these later years since I became a Muslim, I've thought back to that fight and reflected that it was Allah's work to stop me. I might have wound up punchy. Not long after this, I came into a classroom with my hat on. I did it deliberately. The teacher, who was white, ordered me to keep the hat on and to walk around and around the room until he told me to stop. That way, he said, everyone can see you. Meanwhile, we'll go on with class for those who are here to learn something. I was still walking around when he got up from his desk and turned to the blackboard to write something on it. Everyone in the classroom was looking when, at this moment, I passed behind his desk, snatched up a thumbtack, and deposited it in his chair. When he turned to sit back down, I was far from the scene of the crime, circling around the rear of the room. Then he hit the tack, and I heard him holler and caught a glimpse of him spraddling up as I disappeared through the door. With my deportment record, I wasn't really shocked when the decision came that I had been expelled. I guess I must have had some vague idea that if I didn't have to go to school, I'd be allowed to stay on with the Gohannises and wander around town or maybe get a job if I wanted one for pocket money. But I got rocked on my heels when a state man whom I hadn't seen before came and got me at the Gohannises and took me down to court. They told me I was going to go to a reform school. I was still 13 years old, but first I was going to the detention home. It was in Mason, Michigan, about 12 miles from Lansing. The detention home was where all the bad boys and girls from Ingham County were held on their way to reform school, waiting for their hearings. The white state man was a Mr. Maynard Allen. He was nicer to me than most of the state welfare people had been. He even had consoling words for the Gohannises and Mrs. Adcock and Big Boy. All of them were crying, but I wasn't. With the few clothes I owned stuffed into a box, we rode in his car to Mason. He talked as he drove along, saying that my school marks showed that if I would just straighten up, I could make something of myself. He said that reform school had the wrong reputation. He talked about what the word reform meant, to change and become better. He said the school was really a place where boys like me could have time to see their mistakes and start a new life and become somebody everyone would be proud of. And he told me that the lady in charge of the detention home, a Mrs. Swirlin, and her husband were very good people. They were good people. Mrs. Swirlin was bigger than her husband, I remember, a big, buxom, robust, laughing woman. And Mr. Swirlin was thin, with black hair and a black mustache and a red face, quiet and polite, even to me. They liked me right away, too. Mrs. Swirlin showed me to my room, my own room, the first in my life. It was in one of those huge dormitory-like buildings where kids in detention were kept in those days and still are in most places. I discovered next with surprise, that I was allowed to eat with the Swirlins. It was the first time I'd eaten with white people, at least with grown white people, since the Seventh-day Adventist country meetings. It wasn't my own exclusive privilege, of course, except for the very troublesome boys and girls at the detention home who were kept locked up, those who had run away and been caught and brought back, or something like that. All of us ate with the Swirlins sitting at the head of the long tables. They had a white cook helper, I recall, Lucille Lathrop. It amazes me how these names come back from a time I haven't thought about for more than 20 years. Lucille treated me well, too. Her husband's name was Dwayne Lathrop. He worked somewhere else, but he stayed there at the detention home on the weekends with Lucille. I noticed again how white people smelled different from us and how their food tasted different, not seasoned like Negro cooking. I began to sweep and mop and dust around in the Swirlin's house, as I had done with Big Boy at the Gohannises. They all liked my attitude and it was out of their liking for me that I soon became accepted by them, as a mascot I know now. They would talk about anything and everything with me standing right there hearing them, the same way people would talk freely in front of a pet canary. They would even talk about me or about niggers, as though I wasn't there, as if I wouldn't understand what the word meant. A hundred times a day, they used the word nigger. I suppose that in their own minds, they meant no harm. In fact, they probably meant well. It was the same with the cook, Lucille, and her husband, Dwayne. I remember one day when Mr. Swirlin, as nice as he was, came in from Lansing, where he had been through the Negro section, and said to Mrs. Swirlin right in front of me, 
I just can't see how those niggers can be so happy and be so poor. He talked about how they lived in shacks, but had those big shining cars out front. And Mrs. Swirlin said, me standing right there, niggers are just that way. That scene always stayed with me. It was the same with the other white people, most of them local politicians, when they would come visiting the Swirlins. One of their favorite parlor topics was niggers. One of them was the judge who was in charge of me in Lansing. He was a close friend of the Swirlins. He would ask about me when he came, and they would call me in, and he would look me up and down, his expression approving, like he was examining a fine colt or a pedigreed pup. I knew they must have told him how I acted and how I worked. What I'm trying to say is that it just never dawned upon them that I could understand that I wasn't a pet, but a human being. They didn't give me credit for having the same sensitivity, intellect, and understanding that they would have been ready and willing to recognize in a white boy in my position. But it has historically been the case with white people in their regard for black people that even though we might be with them, we weren't considered of them. Even though they appeared to have opened the door, it was still closed. Thus, they never did really see me. This is the sort of kindly condescension which I try to clarify today to these integration-hungry Negroes about their liberal white friends, these so-called good white people, most of them anyway. I don't care how nice one is to you. The thing you must always remember is that almost never does he really see you as he sees himself, as he sees his own kind. He may stand with you through thin, but not thick. When the chips are down, you'll find that as fixed in him as his bone structure is his sometimes subconscious conviction that he's better than anybody black. But I was no more than vaguely aware of anything like that in my detention home years. I did my little chores around the house, and everything was fine. And each weekend, they didn't mind my catching a ride over to Lansing for the afternoon or evening. If I wasn't old enough, I sure was big enough by then, and nobody ever questioned my hanging out, even at night, in the streets of the Negro section. I was growing up to be even bigger than Wilfred and Filbert, who had begun to meet girls at the school dances and other places and introduced me to a few. But the ones who seemed to like me, I didn't go for, and vice versa. I couldn't dance a lick anyway, and I couldn't see squandering my few dimes on girls. So mostly I pleasured myself these Saturday nights by gawking around the Negro bars and restaurants. The jukeboxes were wailing Erskine Hawkins Tuxedo Junction, Slim and Slam's Flatfoot Fluggy, things like that. Sometimes big bands from New York, out touring the one-night stands in the sticks, would play for big dances in Lansing. Everybody with legs would come out to see any performer who bore the magic name New York which is how I first heard Lucky Thompson and Milt Jackson, both of whom I later got to know well in Harlem. Many youngsters from the detention home, when their dates came up, went off to the reform school. But when mine came up, two or three times, it was always ignored. I saw new youngsters arrive and leave. I was glad and grateful. I knew it was Mrs. Swirlin's doing. I didn't want to leave. She finally told me one day that I was going to be entered in Mason Junior High School. It was the only school in town. No ward of the detention home had ever gone to school there, at least while still a ward. So I entered their seventh grade. The only other Negroes there were some of the Lions' children, younger than I was, in the lower grades. The Lionses and I, as it happened, were the town's only Negroes. They were, as Negroes, very much respected. Mr. Lyons was a smart, hardworking man, and Mrs. Lyons was a very good woman. She and my mother, I had heard my mother say, were two of the four West Indians in that whole section of Michigan. Some of the white kids at school, I found, were even friendlier than some of those in Lansing had been. Though some, including the teachers, called me nigger, it was easy to see that they didn't mean any more harm by it than the Swirlins. As the nigger of my class, I was in fact extremely popular, I suppose partly because I was kind of a novelty. I was in demand. I had top priority but I also benefited from the special prestige of having the seal of approval from that very important woman about the town of Mason, Mrs. Swirlin. Nobody in Mason would have dreamed of getting on the wrong side of her. It became hard for me to get through a school day without someone after me to join this or head up that, the debating society, the junior high basketball team, or some other extracurricular activity. I never turned them down. And I hadn't been in the school long when Mrs. Swirlin knowing I could use spending money of my own, got me a job after school washing the dishes in a local restaurant. My boss there was the father of a white classmate whom I spent a lot of time with. His family lived over the restaurant, 
It was fine working there. Every Friday night when I got paid, I'd feel at least 10 feet tall. I forget how much I made, but it seemed like a lot. It was the first time I'd ever had any money to speak of, all my own, in my whole life. As soon as I could afford it, I bought a green suit and some shoes, and at school I'd buy treats for the others in my class, at least as much as any of them did for me. English and history were the subjects I liked most. My English teacher, I recall, a Mr. Ostrowski, was always giving advice about how to become something in life. The one thing I didn't like about history class was that the teacher, Mr. Williams, was a great one for nigger jokes. One day during my first week at school, I walked into the room and he started singing to the class. As a joke, way down yonder in the cotton field, some folks say that a nigger won't steal. Very funny. I liked history, but I never thereafter had much liking for Mr. Williams. Later, I remember, we came to the textbook section on Negro history. It was exactly one paragraph long. Mr. Williams laughed through it practically in a single breath reading aloud how the Negroes had been slaves and then were freed, and how they were usually lazy and dumb and shiftless. He added, I remember, an anthropological footnote on his own, telling us between laughs how Negroes' feet were so big that when they walk, they don't leave tracks, they leave a hole in the ground. I'm sorry to say that the subject I most disliked was mathematics. I have thought about it. I think the reason was that mathematics leaves no room for argument. If you made a mistake, that was all there was to it. Basketball was a big thing in my life, though. I was on the team. We traveled to neighboring towns such as Howell and Charlotte. And wherever I showed my face, the audiences in the gymnasiums niggered and cooned me to death. Or called me Rastus. It didn't bother my teammates or my coach at all. And to tell the truth, it bothered me only vaguely. Mine was the same psychology that makes Negroes even today. Though it bothers them down inside, keep letting the white man tell them how much progress they are making. They've heard it so much, they've almost gotten brainwashed into believing it, or at least accepting it. After the basketball games, there would usually be a school dance. Whenever our team walked into another school's gym for the dance, with me among them, I could feel the freeze. It would start to ease as they saw that I didn't try to mix, but stuck close to someone on our team or kept to myself. I think I developed ways to do it without making it obvious. Even at our own school, I could sense it almost as a physical barrier that despite all the beaming and smiling, the mascot wasn't supposed to dance with any of the white girls. It was some kind of psychic message, not just from them, but also from within myself. I am proud to be able to say that much for myself, at least. I would just stand around and smile and talk and drink punch and eat sandwiches, and then I would make some excuse and get away early. They were typical small-town school dances. Sometimes a little white band from Lansing would be brought in to play. But most often, the music was a phonograph set up on a table with the volume turned up high and the record scratchy, blaring things like Glenn Miller's Moonlight Serenade, his band was riding high then, or the Ink Spots, who were also very popular, singing If I Didn't Care. I used to spend a lot of time thinking about a peculiar thing. Many of these Mason white boys, like the ones at the Lansing School, especially if they knew me well, and if we hung out a lot together, would get me off in a corner somewhere and push me to proposition certain white girls, sometimes their own sisters. They would tell me that Nate already had the girls themselves, including their sisters, or that they were trying to and couldn't. Later on, I came to understand what was going on. If they could get the girls into the position of having broken the terrible taboo by slipping off with me somewhere, they would have that hammer over the girls' heads to make them give in to them. It seemed that the white boys felt that I, being a Negro, just naturally knew more about romance or sex than they did, that I instinctively knew more about what to do and say with their own girls. I never did tell anybody that I really went for some of the white girls, and some of them went for me too. They let me know in many ways, but anytime we found ourselves in any close conversations or potentially intimate situations, always there would come up between us some kind of a wall. The girls I really wanted to have were a couple of Negro girls whom Wilfred or Filbert had introduced me to in Lansing, but with these girls somehow, I lacked the nerve. From what I heard and saw on the Saturday nights, I spent hanging around in the Negro district I knew that race mixing went on in Lansing, but strangely enough, this didn't have any kind of effect on me. Every Negro in Lansing, I guess, knew how white men would drive along certain streets in the black neighborhoods and pick up Negro streetwalkers who patrolled the area. And on the other hand, 
There was a bridge that separated the Negro and Polish neighborhoods where white women would drive or walk across and pick up Negro men who would hang around in certain places close to the bridge, waiting for them. Lansing's white women, even in those days, were famous for chasing Negro men. I didn't yet appreciate how most whites accord to the Negro this reputation for prodigious sexual prowess. There in Lansing, I never heard of any trouble about this mixing from either side. I imagine that everyone simply took it for granted, as I did. Anyway, from my experience as a little boy at the Lansing School, I had become fairly adept at avoiding the white girl issue, at least for a couple of years yet. Then, in the second semester of the seventh grade, I was elected class president. It surprised me even more than other people. But I can see now why the class might have done it. My grades were among the highest in the school. I was unique in my class, like a pink poodle, and I was proud. I'm not going to say I wasn't. In fact, by then, I didn't really have much feeling about being a Negro because I was trying so hard in every way I could to be white, which is why I am spending much of my life today telling the American black man that he's wasting his time straining to integrate. I know from personal experience, I tried hard enough. Malcolm, we're just so proud of you, Mrs. Swirlin exclaimed when she heard about my election. It was all over the restaurant where I worked. Even the state man, Maynard Allen, who still dropped by to see me once in a while, had a word of praise. He said he never saw anybody prove better exactly what reform meant. I really liked him, except for one thing. He now and then would drop something that hinted my mother had let us down somehow. Fairly often I would go and visit the Lionses, and they acted as happy as though I was one of their children. And it was the same warm feeling when I went into Lansing to visit my brothers and sisters and the Gohanneses. I remember one thing that marred this time for me, the movie Gone with the Wind. When it played in Mason, I was the only Negro in the theater, and when Butterfly McQueen went into her act, I felt like crawling under the rug. Every Saturday, just about, I would go into Lansing. I was going on 14 now. Wilfred and Hilda still lived out by themselves at the old family home. Hilda kept the house very clean. It was easier than my mother's plight, with eight of us always underfoot or running around. Wilfred worked wherever he could, and he still read every book he could get his hands on. Filbert was getting a reputation as one of the better amateur fighters in this part of the state. Everyone really expected that he was going to become a professional. Reginald and I, after my fighting fiasco, had finally gotten back on good terms. It made me feel great to visit him and Wesley over at Mrs. Williams. I'd offhandedly give them each a couple of dollars to just stick in their pockets, to have something to spend. And little Yvonne and Robert were doing okay, too, over at the home of the West Indian lady, Mrs. McGuire. I'd give them about a quarter apiece. It made me feel good to see how they were coming along. None of us talked much about our mother, and we never mentioned our father. I guess none of us knew what to say. We didn't want anybody else to mention our mother either, I think. From time to time, though, we would all go over to Kalamazoo to visit her. Most often, we older ones went singly, for it was something you didn't want to have to experience with anyone else present, even your brother or sister. During this period, the visit to my mother that I most remember was toward the end of that seventh grade year, when our father's grown daughter by his first marriage, Ella, came from Boston to visit us. Wilfred and Hilda had exchanged some letters with Ella, and I, at Hilda's suggestion, had written to her from the Swirlins. We were all excited and happy when her letter told us that she was coming to Lansing. I think the major impact of Ella's arrival, at least upon me, was that she was the first really proud black woman I had ever seen in my life. She was plainly proud of her very dark skin. This was unheard of among Negroes in those days, especially in Lansing. I hadn't been sure just what day she would come. And then one afternoon I got home from school, and there she was. She hugged me, stood me away, looked me up and down. A commanding woman, maybe even bigger than Mrs. Swirlin. Ella wasn't just black, but like our father, she was jet black. The way she sat, moved, talked, did everything, bespoke somebody who did, and got exactly what she wanted. This was the woman my father had boasted of so often for having brought so many of their family out of Georgia to Boston. She owned some property, he would say, and she was in society. She had come north with nothing, and she had worked and saved and had invested in property that she built up in value, and then she started sending money to Georgia for another sister, brother, cousin, niece, or nephew to come north to Boston. All that I had heard was reflected in Ella's appearance and bearing. I had never been so impressed with anybody. She was in her second marriage, 
Her first husband had been a doctor. Ella asked all kinds of questions about how I was doing. She had already heard from Wilfred and Hilda about my election as class president. She asked especially about my grades, and I ran and got my report cards. I was then one of the three highest in the class. Ella praised me. I asked her about her brother, Earl, and her sister, Mary. She had the exciting news that Earl was a singer with a band in Boston. He was singing under the name of Jimmy Carlton. Mary was also doing well. Ella told me about other relatives from that branch of the family, a number of them I'd never heard of. She had helped them up from Georgia. They, in their turn, had helped up others. We littles have to stick together, Ella said. It thrilled me to hear her say that, and even more, the way she said it. I had become a mascot. Our branch of the family was split to pieces. I had just about forgotten about being a little in any family sense. She said that different members of the family were working in good jobs, and some even had small businesses going. Most of them were homeowners. When Ella suggested that all of us littles in Lansing accompany her on a visit to our mother, we all were grateful. We all felt that if anyone could do anything that could help our mother, that might help her get well and come back, it would be Ella. Anyway, all of us for the first time together went with Ella to Kalamazoo. Our mother was smiling when they brought her out. She was extremely surprised when she saw Ella. They made a striking contrast, the thin near white woman and the big black one hugging each other. I don't remember much about the rest of the visit, except that there was a lot of talking and Ella had everything in hand and we left with all of us feeling better than we ever had about the circumstances. I know that for the first time, I felt as though I had visited with someone who had some kind of physical illness that had just lingered on. A few days later, after visiting the homes where each of us were staying, Ella left Lansing and returned to Boston. But before leaving, she told me to write to her regularly, and she had suggested that I might like to spend my summer holiday visiting her in Boston. I jumped at that chance. That summer of 1940, in Lansing, I caught the Greyhound bus for Boston with my cardboard suitcase and wearing my green suit. If someone had hung a sign, Hick, around my neck, I couldn't have looked much more obvious. They didn't have the turnpikes then. The bus stopped at what seemed every corner and cow patch. From my seat in, you guessed it, the back of the bus, I gawked out of the window at White Man's America, rolling past for what seemed a month, but must have been only a day and a half. When we finally arrived, Ella met me at the terminal and took me home. The house was on Wombeck Street in the Sugar Hill section of Roxbury, the Harlem of Boston. I met Ella's second husband, Frank, who was now a soldier, and her brother, Earl, the singer who called himself Jimmy Carlton, and Mary, who was very different from her older sister. It's funny how I seem to think of Mary as Ella's sister, instead of her being, just as Ella is, my own half-sister. It's probably because Ella and I always were much closer as basic types. We're dominant people, and Mary has always been mild and quiet almost shy. Ella was busily involved in dozens of things. She belonged to I don't know how many different clubs. She was a leading light of local so-called black society. I saw and met a hundred black people there whose big city talk and ways left my mouth hanging open. I couldn't have feigned indifference if I had tried to. People talked casually about Chicago, Detroit, New York. I didn't know the world contained as many Negroes as I saw thronging downtown Roxbury at night, especially on Saturdays. Neon lights, nightclubs, pool halls, bars, the cars they drove. Restaurants made the streets smell rich, greasy, down home black cooking. Jukeboxes blared Erskine Hawkins, Duke Ellington, Cootie Williams, dozens of others. If somebody had told me then that someday I'd know them all personally, I'd have found it hard to believe. The biggest bands like these played at the Roseland State Ballroom on Boston's Massachusetts Avenue, one night for Negroes the next night for whites. I saw for the first time occasional black-white couples strolling around arm in arm. And on Sundays, when Ella, Mary, or somebody took me to church, I saw churches for black people such as I had never seen. They were many times finer than the white church I had attended back in Mason, Michigan. There, the white people just sat and worshipped with words. But the Boston Negroes, like all other Negroes I had ever seen at church, threw their souls and bodies wholly into worship. Two or three times I wrote letters to Wilfred intended for everybody back in Lansing. I said I'd try to describe it when I got back, but I found I couldn't. My restlessness with Mason, and for the first time in my life, a restlessness with being around white people, began as soon as I got back home and entered eighth grade. 
I continued to think constantly about all that I had seen in Boston and about the way I had felt there. I know now that it was the sense of being a real part of a mass of my own kind for the first time. The white people, classmates, the swirlins, the people at the restaurant where I worked, noticed the change. They said, you're acting so strange. You don't seem like yourself, Malcolm. What's the matter? I kept close to the top of the class, though. The topmost scholastic standing, I remember, kept shifting between me, a girl named Audrey Slaw and a boy named Jimmy Cotton. It went on that way as I became increasingly restless and disturbed through the first semester. And then one day, just about when those of us who had passed were about to move up to 8A, from which we would enter high school the next year, something happened which was to become the first major turning point of my life. Somehow, I happened to be alone in the classroom with Mr. Ostrowski, my English teacher. He was a tall, rather reddish-white man, and he had a thick mustache. I had gotten some of my best marks under him, and he had always made me feel that he liked me. He was, as I have mentioned, a natural-born advisor about what you ought to read, to do, or think about any and everything. We used to make unkind jokes about him. Why was he teaching in Mason instead of somewhere else, getting for himself some of the success in life that he kept telling us how to get? I know that he probably meant well in what he happened to advise me that day. I doubt that he meant any harm. It was just in his nature as an American white man. I was one of his top students, one of the school's top students, but all he could see for me was the kind of future in your place that almost all white people see for black people. He told me, Malcolm, you ought to be thinking about a career. Have you been giving it thought? The truth is I hadn't. I never have figured out why I told him, well, yes, sir. I've been thinking I'd like to be a lawyer. Lansing certainly had no Negro lawyers or doctors either in those days to hold up an image I might have aspired to. All I really knew for certain was that a lawyer didn't wash dishes as I was doing. Mr. Ostrowski looked surprised, I remember, and leaned back in his chair and clasped his hands behind his head. He kind of half smiled and said, Malcolm, one of life's first needs is for us to be realistic. Don't misunderstand me now. We all here like you, you know that. But you've got to be realistic about being a nigger, a lawyer. That's no realistic goal for a nigger. You need to think about something you can be. You're good with your hands, making things. Everybody admires your carpentry shop work. Why don't you plan on carpentry? People like you as a person, you'd get all kinds of work. The more I thought afterwards about what he said, the more uneasy it made me. It just kept treading around in my mind. What made it really begin to disturb me was Mr. Ostrowski's advice to others in my class, all of them white. Most of them had told him they were planning to become farmers. But those who wanted to strike out on their own to try something new, he had encouraged. Some, mostly girls, wanted to be teachers. A few wanted other professions, such as one boy who wanted to become a county agent, another a veterinarian, and one girl wanted to be a nurse. They all reported that Mr. Ostrowski had encouraged what they had wanted, yet nearly none of them had earned marks equal to mine. It was a surprising thing that I had never thought of it that way before, but I realized that whatever I wasn't, I was smarter than nearly all of those white kids, but apparently I was still not intelligent enough in their eyes, to become whatever I wanted to be. It was then that I began to change inside. I drew away from white people. I came to class and I answered when called upon. It became a physical strain simply to sit in Mr. Ostrowski's class. Where nigger had slipped off my back before, wherever I heard it now, I stopped and looked at whoever said it. And they looked surprised that I did. I quit hearing so much nigger and what's wrong, which was the way I wanted it. Nobody, including the teachers, could decide what had come over me. I knew I was being discussed. In a few more weeks, it was that way, too, at the restaurant where I worked washing dishes and at the Swirlins. One day soon after, Mrs. Swirlin called me into the living room, and there was the state man, Maynard Allen. I knew from their faces that something was about to happen. She told me that none of them could understand why, after I had done so well in school and on my job and living with them and after everyone in Mason had come to like me, I had lately begun to make them all feel that I wasn't happy there anymore. She said she felt there was no need for me to stay at the detention home any longer, and that arrangements had been made for me to go and live with the Lyons family, who liked me so much. She stood up and put out her hand. I guess I've asked you a hundred times, Malcolm. Do you want to tell me what's wrong? I shook her hand and said, Nothing, Mrs. Swirlin. Then I went and got my things and came back down. At the living room door, I saw her wiping her eyes. I felt very bad. 
I thanked her and went out in front to Mr. Allen, who took me over to the Lyons. Mr. and Mrs. Lyons and their children during the two months I lived with them while finishing eighth grade also tried to get me to tell them what was wrong, but somehow I couldn't tell them either. I went every Saturday to see my brothers and sisters in Lansing, and almost every other day I wrote to Ella in Boston. Not saying why, I told Ella that I wanted to come there and live. I don't know how she did it, but she arranged for official custody of me to be transferred from Michigan to Massachusetts. And the very week I finished the eighth grade, I again boarded the Greyhound bus for Boston. I've thought about that time a lot since then. No physical move in my life has been more pivotal or profound in its repercussions. If I had stayed on in Michigan, I would probably have married one of those Negro girls I knew and liked in Lansing. I might have become one of those state capitol building shoeshine boys or a Lansing country club waiter or gotten one of the other menial jobs, which in those days among Lansing Negroes would have been considered successful or even become a carpenter. Whatever I've done since then, I have driven myself to become a success at it. I've often thought that if Mr. Ostrowski had encouraged me to become a lawyer, I would today probably be among some city's professional black bourgeoisie, sipping cocktails and palming myself off as a community spokesman for and leader of the suffering black masses, while my primary concern would be to grab a few more crumbs from the groaning board of the two-faced whites with whom they're begging to integrate. All praise is due to a law that I went to Boston when I did. If I hadn't, I'd probably still be a brainwashed black Christian. Chapter 3. Homeboy. I looked like Leal Abner. Mason, Michigan, was written all over me. My kinky reddish hair was cut hick style, and I didn't even use grease in it. My green suit's coat sleeve stopped above my wrists. The pants legs showed three inches of socks. Just a shade lighter green than the suit was my narrow-collared, three-quarter length Lansing department store top coat. My appearance was too much for even Ella. But she told me later, she had seen countrified members of the little family come up from Georgia in even worse shape than I was. Ella had fixed up a nice little upstairs room for me, and she was truly a Georgia Negro woman when she got into the kitchen with her pots and pans. She was the kind of cook who would heap up your plate with such as ham hock, greens, black-eyed peas, fried fish, cabbage, sweet potatoes, grits and gravy, and cornbread. And the more you put away, the better she felt. I worked out at Ella's kitchen table like there was no tomorrow. Ella still seemed to be as big, black, outspoken, and impressive a woman as she had been in Mason and Lansing. Only about two weeks before I arrived, she had split up with her second husband, the soldier Frank, whom I had met there the previous summer, but she was taking it right in stride. I could see, though I didn't say, how any average man would find it almost impossible to live for very long with a woman whose every instinct was to run everything and everybody she had anything to do with, including me. About my second day there in Roxbury, Ella told me that she didn't want me to start hunting for a job right away, like most newcomer Negroes did. She said that she had told all those she'd brought north to take their time, to walk around, to travel the buses and the subway, and get the feel of Boston before they tied themselves down working somewhere, because they would never again have the time to really see and get to know anything about the city they were living in. Ella said she'd help me find a job when it was time for me to go to work. So I went gawking around the neighborhood, the Wombeck and Humboldt Avenue Hill section of Roxbury, which is something like Harlem Sugar Hill, where I'd later live. I saw those Roxbury Negroes acting and living differently from any black people I'd ever dreamed of in my life. This was the snooty black neighborhood. They called themselves the 400 and looked down their noses at the Negroes of the black ghetto or so-called town section where Mary, my other half-sister, lived. What I thought I was seeing there in Roxbury were high-class, educated, important Negroes, living well, working in big jobs and positions. Their quiet homes sat back in their mowed yards. These Negroes walked along the sidewalks looking haughty and dignified, on their way to work, to shop, to visit, to church. I know now, of course, that what I was really seeing was only a big city version of those successful Negro boot blacks and janitors back in Lansing. The only difference was that the ones in Boston had been brainwashed even more thoroughly. They prided themselves on being incomparably more cultured, cultivated, dignified, and better off than their black brethren down in the ghetto, which was no further away than you could throw a rock. Under the pitiful misapprehension that it would make them better, these hill Negroes were breaking their backs trying to imitate white people. 
Any black family that had been around Boston long enough to own the home they lived in was considered among the Hill elite. It didn't make any difference that they had to rent out rooms to make ends meet. Then the native-born new engenders among them looked down upon recently migrated Southern homeowners who lived next door, like Ella. And a big percentage of the Hill dwellers were in Ella's category, Southern strivers and scramblers and West Indian Negroes, whom both the New Englanders and the Southerners called Black Jews. Usually it was the Southerners and the West Indians who not only managed to own the places where they lived, but also at least one other house which they rented as income property. The snooty New Englanders usually owned less than they. In those days on the Hill, any who could claim professional status, teachers, preachers, practical nurses, also considered themselves superior. Foreign diplomats could have modeled their conduct on the way the Negro postmen, Pullman porters, and dining car waiters of Roxbury acted, striding around as if they were wearing top hats and cutaways. I'd guess that eight out of ten of the Hill Negroes of Roxbury, despite the impressive-sounding job titles they affected, actually worked as menials and servants. He's in banking, or he's in securities. It sounded as though they were discussing a Rockefeller or a Mellon and not some gray-headed dignity-posturing bank janitor or bondhouse messenger. I'm with an old family was the euphemism used to dignify the professions of white folks' cooks and maids who talked so affectedly among their own kind in Roxbury that you couldn't even understand them. I don't know how many 40- and 50-year-old errand boys went down the hill dressed like ambassadors in black suits and white collars to downtown jobs in government, in finance, or in law. It has never ceased to amaze me how so many Negroes, then and now, could stand the indignity of that kind of self-delusion. Soon I ranged out of Roxbury and began to explore Boston proper. Historic buildings everywhere I turned, and plaques and markers and statues for famous events and men. One statue in the Boston Commons astonished me, a Negro named Crispus Attux, who had been the first man to fall in the Boston Massacre. I had never known anything like that. I roamed everywhere. In one direction, I walked as far as Boston University. Another day, I took my first subway ride. When most of the people got off, I followed. It was Cambridge, and I circled all around in the Harvard University campus. Somewhere, I had already heard of Harvard, though I didn't know much more about it. Nobody that day could have told me I would give an address before the Harvard Law School Forum some 20 years later. I also did a lot of exploring downtown, why a city would have two big railroad stations, North Station and South Station, I couldn't understand. At both of the stations, I stood around and watched people arrive and leave. And I did the same thing at the bus station where Ella had met me. My wanderings even led me down along the piers and docks where I read plaques, telling about the old sailing ships that used to put into port there. In a letter to Wilfred, Hilda, Filbert, and Reginald back in Lansing, I told them about all this and about the winding, narrow, cobblestone streets and the houses that jammed up against each other. Downtown Boston, I wrote them, had the biggest stores I'd ever seen and white people's restaurants and hotels. I made up my mind that I was going to see every movie that came to the fine air-conditioned theaters. On Massachusetts Avenue, next door to one of them, the Lowe's State Theater, was the huge, exciting Roseland State Ballroom. Big posters out in front advertised the nationally famous bands, white and Negro, that had played there. Coming next week, when I went by that first time, was Glenn Miller. I remember thinking how nearly the whole evening's music at Mason High School dances had been Glenn Miller's records. What wouldn't that crowd have given, I wondered, to be standing where Glenn Miller's band was actually going to play? I didn't know how familiar with Rosalind I was going to become. Ella began to grow concerned, because even when I had finally had enough sightseeing, I didn't stick around very much on the hill. She kept dropping hints that I ought to mingle with the nice young people my age who were to be seen in the towns in drugstore, two blocks from her house, and a couple of other places. But even before I came to Boston, I had always felt and acted toward anyone my age as if they were in the kid class, like my younger brother Reginald. They had always looked up to me as if I were considerably older. On weekends back in Lansing, where I'd go to get away from the white people in Mason, I'd hung around in the Negro part of town with Wilfred's and Filbert's set. Though all of them were several years older than me, I was bigger, and I actually looked older than most of them. I didn't want to disappoint or upset Ella, but despite her advice, I began going down into the town ghetto section. That world of grocery stores, walk-up flats, cheap restaurants, pool rooms, bars, storefront churches, and pawn shops seemed to hold a natural lure for me. 
Not only was this part of Roxbury much more exciting, but I felt more relaxed among Negroes who were being their natural selves and not putting on airs. Even though I did live on the hill, my instincts were never, and still aren't, to feel myself better than any other Negro. I spent the first month in town with my mouth hanging open. The sharp-dressed young cats, who hung on the corners and in the pool rooms, bars and restaurants, and who obviously didn't work anywhere, completely entranced me. I couldn't get over marveling at how their hair was straight and shiny, like white men's hair. Ella told me this was called a conch. I had never tasted a sip of liquor, never even smoked a cigarette, and here I saw little black children, 10 and 12 years old, shooting craps, playing cards, fighting, getting grown-ups to put a penny or a nickel on their number for them, things like that, and these children threw around swear words I'd never heard before, even, and slang expressions that were just as new to me, such as stud and cat and chick and cool and hip. Every night as I lay in bed, I turned these new words over in my mind. It was shocking to me that in town, especially after dark, you'd occasionally see a white girl and a Negro man strolling arm in arm along the sidewalk and mixed couples drinking in the neon-lighted bars, not slipping off to some dark corner, as in Lansing. I wrote Wilford and Filbert about that, too. I wanted to find a job myself to surprise Ella. One afternoon, something told me to go inside a pool room whose window I was looking through. I had looked through that window many times. I wasn't yearning to play pool. In fact, I had never held a cue stick. But I was drawn by the sight of the cool-looking cats standing around inside, bending over the big green felt-top tables, making bets and shooting the bright-colored balls into the holes. As I stared through the window this particular afternoon, something made me decide to venture inside and talk to a dark, stubby, conch-headed fellow who racked up balls for the pool players, whom I'd heard called Shorty. One day, he had come outside and seen me standing there and said, Hi, Red, so that made me figure he was friendly. As inconspicuously as I could, I slipped inside the door and around the side of the pool room, avoiding people, and onto the back, where Shorty was filling an aluminum can with the powder that pool players dust on their hands. He looked up at me. Later on, Shorty would enjoy teasing me about how, with that first glance, he knew my whole story. Man, that cat still smelled country, he'd say, laughing. Cat's legs was so long and his pants so short his knees showed, and his head looked like a briar patch. But that afternoon, Shorty didn't let it show in his face how country I appeared when I told him I'd appreciate it if he'd tell me how could somebody go about getting a job like his. If you mean racking up balls, said Shorty, I don't know of no pool joints around here needing anybody. You mean you just want any slave you can find? A slave meant work, a job. He asked what kind of work I had done. I told him that I'd washed restaurant dishes in Mason, Michigan. He nearly dropped the powder can. My homeboy, man, give me some skin. I'm from Lansing. I never told Shorty, and he never suspected, that he was about 10 years older than I. He took us to be about the same age. At first, I would have been embarrassed to tell him. Later, I just never bothered. Shorty had dropped out of first-year high school in Lansing, lived a while with an uncle and aunt in Detroit, and had spent the last six years living with his cousin in Roxbury. But when I mentioned the names of Lansing people and places, he remembered many, and pretty soon we sounded as if we had been raised in the same block. I could sense Shorty's genuine gladness, and I don't have to say how lucky I felt to find a friend as hip as he obviously was. Man, this is a swing in town if you dig it, Shorty said. You're my homeboy. I'm going to school you to the happenings. I stood there and grinned like a fool. You got to go anywhere now? Well, stick around until I get off. One thing I liked immediately about Shorty was his frankness. When I told him where I lived, he said what I already knew, that nobody in town could stand the Hill Negroes. But he thought a sister who gave me a pad, not charging me rent, not even running me out to find some slave, couldn't be all bad. Shorty's slave in the pool room, he said was just to keep ends together while he learned his horn. A couple of years before, he'd hit the numbers and bought a saxophone. Got it right in there in the closet now, for my lesson tonight. Shorty was taking lessons with some other studs, and he intended one day to organize his own small band. There's a lot of bread to be made gigging right around here in Roxbury, Shorty explained to me. I don't dig joining some big band, one-nighting all over just to say I played with Count or Duke or somebody. I thought that was smart. I wished I had studied a horn, but I never had been exposed to one. 
All afternoon between trips up front to rack balls, Shorty talked to me out of the corner of his mouth. Which hustlers, standing around or playing at this or that table, sold reefers or had just come out of prison or were second story men? Shorty told me that he played at least a dollar a day on the numbers. He said as soon as he hit a number, he would use the winnings to organize his band. I was ashamed to have to admit that I had never played the numbers. Well, you ain't never had nothing to play with, he said, excusing me. But you start when you get a slave, and if you hit, you got a stake for something. He pointed out some gamblers and some pimps. Some of them had white whores, he whispered. I ain't going to lie. I dig them $2 white chicks, Shorty said. There's a lot of that action around here, Knights. You'll see it. I said I already had seen some. You ever had one? He asked. My embarrassment at my inexperience showed. Hell, man, he said. Don't be ashamed. I had a few before I left Lansing, them Polak chicks that used to come over the bridge. Here, they're mostly Italians and Irish. But it don't matter what kind, there's something else. Ain't no different nowhere. There's nothing they love better than a black stud. Through the afternoon, Shorty introduced me to players and loungers. My homeboy, he'd say, he's looking for a slave if you hear anything. They all said they'd look out. At seven o'clock when the night ball racker came on, Shorty told me he had to hurry to his saxophone lesson. But before he left, he held out to me the six or seven dollars he had collected that day in nickel and dime tips. You got enough bread, homeboy? I was okay, I told him. I had two dollars. But Shorty made me take three more. Little fattening for your pocket, he said. Before we went out, he opened his saxophone case and showed me the horn. It was gleaming brass against the green velvet an alto sax. He said, keep cool, homeboy, and come back tomorrow. Some of the cats will turn you up a slave. When I got home, Ella said there had been a telephone call from somebody named Shorty. He had left a message that over at the Roseland State Ballroom, the shoeshine boy was quitting that night, and Shorty had told him to hold the job for me. Malcolm, you haven't had any experience shining shoes, Ella said. Her expression and tone of voice told me she wasn't happy about my taking that job. I didn't particularly care because I was already speechless thinking about being somewhere close to the greatest bands in the world. I didn't even wait to eat any dinner. The ballroom was all lighted when I got there. A man at the front door was letting in members of Benny Goodman's band. I told him I wanted to see the shoeshine boy, Freddie. You're going to be the new one? He asked. I said I thought I was, and he laughed. Well, maybe you'll hit the numbers and get a Cadillac too. He told me that I'd find Freddie upstairs in the men's room on the second floor. But downstairs before I went up, I stepped over and snatched a glimpse inside the ballroom. I just couldn't believe the size of that waxed floor. At the far end, under the soft, rose-colored lights, was the bandstand with the Benny Goodman musicians moving around, laughing and talking, arranging their horns and stands. A wiry, brown-skinned, conked fellow upstairs in the men's room greeted me. You Shorty's homeboy? I said I was, and he said he was Freddie. Good old boy, he said. He called me. He just heard I hit the big number, and he figured right I'd be quitting. I told Freddie what the man at the front door had said about a Cadillac. He laughed and said, burns them white cats up when you get yourself something. Yeah, I told them I was going to get me one, just to bug them. Freddie then said for me to pay close attention, that he was going to be busy, and for me to watch but not get in the way, and he'd try to get me ready to take over at the next dance a couple of nights later. As Freddie busied himself setting up the shoeshine stand, he told me, get here early. Your shoeshine rags and brushes by this footstand, your polished bottles, paste wax, suede brushes over here, everything in place. You get rushed. You never need to waste motion. While you shine shoes, I learned you also kept watch on customers inside, leaving the urinals. You darted over and offered a small white hand towel. A lot of cats who ain't planning to wash their hands, sometimes you can run up with a towel and shame them. Your towels are really your best hustle in here. Cost you a penny apiece to launder you always get at least a nickel tip. The shoeshine customers and any from the inside restroom who took a towel, you whisk broomed a couple of licks. A nickel or a dime tip, just give them that, Freddie said. But for two bits, Uncle Tom a little, white cats especially like that. I've had them to come back two, three times a dance. From down below, the sound of the music had begun floating up. I guess I stood transfixed. You never seen a big dance? Asked Freddie. Run on a while and watch. There were a few couples already dancing under the rose-colored lights. But even more exciting to me was the crowd thronging in. The most glamorous-looking white women I'd ever seen. Young ones, old ones, 
white cats buying tickets at the window, sticking big wads of green bills back into their pockets, checking the women's coats, and taking their arms and squiring them inside. Freddie had some early customers when I got back upstairs. Between the shoe shine stand and thrusting towels to me, just as they approached the wash basin, Freddie seemed to be doing four things at once. Here, you can take over the whisk broom, he said. Just two or three licks, but let him feel it. Feel. When things slowed a little, he said, You ain't seen nothing tonight. You wait until you see a spooks dance. Man, our people carry on. Whenever he had a moment, he kept schooling me. Shoelaces, this drawer here. You just starting out, I'm going to make these to you as a present. Buy them for a nickel a pair, tell cats they need laces if they do, and charge two bits. Every Benny Goodman record I'd ever heard in my life, it seemed, was filtering faintly into where we were. During another customer lull, Freddie let me slip back outside again to listen. Peggy Lee was at the mic singing. Beautiful. She had just joined the band and she was from North Dakota and had been singing with a group in Chicago when Mrs. Benny Goodman discovered her we had heard some customers say. She finished the song, and the crowd burst into applause. She was a big hit. It knocked me out, too, when I first broke in here, Freddie said, grinning, when I went back in there. But look, you ever shined any shoes? He laughed when I said I hadn't, excepting my own. Well, let's get to work. I never had neither. Freddie got on the stand and went to work on his own shoes. Brush, liquid polish, brush, Paste wax, shine rag, lacquer sole dressing, step by step, Freddie showed me what to do. But you got to get a whole lot faster. You can't waste time. Freddie showed me how fast on my own shoes. Then, because business was tapering off, he had time to give me a demonstration of how to make the shine rag pop like a firecracker. Dig the action? He asked. He did it in slow motion. I got down and tried it on his shoes. I had the principle of it. Just got to do it faster, Freddie said. It's a jive noise, that's all. Cats tip better. They figure you're knocking yourself out. By the end of the dance, Freddie had let me shine the shoes of three or four stray drunks he talked into having shines, and I had practiced picking up my speed on Freddie's shoes until they looked like mirrors. After we had helped the janitors to clean up the ballroom after the dance, throwing out all the paper and cigarette butts and empty liquor bottles, Freddie was nice enough to drive me all the way home to Ella's on the hill in the second-hand maroon Buick he said he was going to trade in on his Cadillac. He talked to me all the way. I guess it's all right if I tell you pick up a couple of dozen packs of rubbers, two bits apiece. You notice some of those cats that came up to me around the end of the dance? Well, when some have new chicks going right, they'll come asking you for rubbers. Charge a dollar, generally you'll get an extra tip. He looked across at me. Some hustles you're too new for. Cats will ask you for liquor. Some will want reefers. But you don't need to have nothing except rubbers until you can dig who's a cop. You can make $10, $12 a dance for yourself if you work everything right, Freddie said, before I got out of the car in front of Ella's. The main thing you got to remember is that everything in the world is a hustle. So long, Red. The next time I ran into Freddie, I was downtown one night a few weeks later. He was parked in his pearl gray Cadillac, sharp as a tack, cooling it. Man, you sure schooled me, I said, and he laughed. He knew what I meant. It hadn't taken me long on the job to find out that Freddie had done less shoe shining and towel hustling than selling liquor and reefers and putting white johns in touch with Negro whores. I also learned that white girls always flock to the Negro dances some of them whores whose pimps brought them to mix business and pleasure, others who came with their black boyfriends, and some who came in alone for a little freelance lusting among a plentiful availability of enthusiastic Negro men. At the white dances, of course, nothing black was allowed, and that's where the black tour's pimps soon showed a new shoeshine boy what he could pick up on the side by slipping a phone number or address to the white Johns who came around the end of the dance looking for black chicks. Most of Rosalind's dances were for whites only, and they had white bands only. But the only white band ever to play there at a Negro dance, to my recollection, was Charlie Barnett's. The fact is that very few white bands could have satisfied the Negro dancers. But I know that Charlie Barnett's Cherokee and his Redskin Rumba drove those Negroes wild. They jam-packed that ballroom, the black girls in way-out silk, and satin dresses and shoes, their hair done in all kinds of styles the men sharp in their zoot suits and crazy conks, and everybody grinning and greased and gassed. Some of the bandsmen would come up to the men's room at about 8 o'clock and get shoe shines before they went to work. Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Lionel Hampton, 
Cootie Williams, Jimmy Lunsford were just a few of those who sat in my chair. I would really make my shine rag sound like someone had set off Chinese firecrackers. Duke's great alto sax man, Johnny Hodges, he was Shorty's idol, still owes me for a shoe shine I gave him. He was in the chair one night, having a friendly argument with the drummer, Sonny Greer, who was standing there, when I tapped the bottom of his shoes to signal that I was finished. Hodges stepped down, reaching his hand in his pocket to pay me, but then snatched his hand out to gesture and just forgot me and walked away. I wouldn't have dared to bother the man who could do what he did with Daydream by asking him for 15 cents. I remember that I struck up a little shoeshine stand conversation with Count Basie's great blues singer, Jimmy Rushing. He's the one famous for sent for you yesterday, here you come today, and things like that. Rushing's feet, I remember, were big and funny shaped. Not long like most big feet, but they were round and roly-poly like Rushing. Anyhow, he even introduced me to some of the other Basie cats, like Lester Young, Harry Edison, Buddy Tate, Don Bias, Dickie Wells, and Buck Clayton. They'd walk in the restroom later, by themselves. Hi, Red. They'd be up there in my chair, and my shine rag was popping to the beat of all of their records, spinning in my head. Musicians never have had, anywhere, a greater shoeshine boy fan than I was. I would write to Wilfred and Hilda and Filbert and Reginald back in Lansing, trying to describe it. I never got any decent tips until the middle of the Negro dances, which is when the dancers started feeling good and getting generous. After the white dances, when I helped to clean out the ballroom, we would throw out perhaps a dozen empty liquor bottles. But after the Negro dances, we would have to throw out cartons full of empty fifth bottles. Not rot gut either, but the best brands, and especially scotch. During lulls up there in the men's room, sometimes I'd get in five minutes of watching the dancing. The white people danced as though somebody had trained them. Left, one, two, right, three, four. The same steps and patterns over and over as though somebody had wound them up. But those Negroes, nobody in the world could have choreographed the way they did whatever they felt. Just grabbing partners, even the white chicks who came to the Negro dances. And my black brethren today may hate me for saying it, but a lot of black girls nearly got run over by some of those Negro males scrambling to get at those white women. You would have thought God had lowered some of his angels. Times have sure changed. If it happened today, those same black girls would go after those Negro men and the white women too. Anyway, some couples were so abandoned, flinging high and wide, improvising steps and movements that you couldn't believe it. I could feel the beat in my bones, even though I had never danced. Showtime! People would start hollering about the last hour of the dance. Then a couple of dozen really wild couples would stay on the floor, the girls changing to low white sneakers. The band now would really be blasting, and all the other dancers would form a clapping, shouting circle to watch that wild competition as it began, covering only a quarter or so of the ballroom floor. The band, the spectators, and the dancers would be making the Roseland Ballroom feel like a big, rocking ship. The spotlight would be turning, pink yellow, green, and blue, picking up the couple's lindy hopping as if they had gone mad. Whale, man, whale! People would be shouting at the band, and it would be wailing, until first one, and then another couple just ran out of strength and stumbled off toward the crowd, exhausted and soaked with sweat. Sometimes I would be down there standing inside the door, jumping up and down in my gray jacket with a whisk broom in the pocket, and the manager would have to come and shout at me that I had customers upstairs. The first liquor I drank, my first cigarettes, even my first reefers, I can't specifically remember. But I know they were all mixed together with my first shooting craps, playing cards, and betting my dollar a day on the numbers as I started hanging out at night with Shorty and his friends. His, Shorty's jokes about how country I had been made us all laugh. I still was country, I know now, but it all felt so great because I was accepted. All of us would be in somebody's place, usually one of the girls, and we'd be turning on the reefers making everybody's head light, or the whiskey a glow in our middles. Everybody understood that my head had to stay kinky a while longer, to grow long enough for Shorty to conk it for me. One of these nights, I remarked that I had saved about half enough to get a zoot. Save? Shorty couldn't believe it. Homeboy, you never heard of credit? He told me he'd call a neighborhood clothing store the first thing in the morning, and that I should be there early. A salesman, a young Jew, met me when I came in. You're Shorty's friend? I said I was. It amazed me. All of Shorty's contacts. 
The salesman wrote my name on a form, and the Roseland is where I worked, and Ella's address is where I lived. Shorty's name was put down as recommending me. The salesman said, Shorty's one of our best customers. I was measured, and the young salesman picked off a rack a zoot suit that was just wild. Sky blue pants 30 inches in the knee, an angle narrowed down to 12 inches at the bottom, and a long coat that pinched my waist and flared out below my knees. As a gift, the salesman said, the store would give me a narrow leather belt with my initial L on it. Then he said, I ought to also buy a hat, and I did, blue, with a feather in the four-inch brim. Then the store gave me another present, a long, thick-linked, gold-plated chain that swung down lower than my coat hem. I was sold forever on credit. When I modeled the zoot for Ella, she took a long look and said, well, I guess it had to happen. I took three of those 25 cent sepia toned while you wait pictures of myself, pose the way hipsters wearing their zoots would cool it. Hat dangled, knees drawn close together, feet wide apart, both index fingers jabbed toward the floor. The long coat and swinging chain and the Punjab pants were much more dramatic if you stood that way. One picture, I autographed and airmailed to my brothers and sisters in Lansing to let them see how well I was doing. I gave another one to Ella and the third to Shorty, who was really moved. I could tell by the way he said, thanks, homeboy. It was part of our hip code not to show that kind of affection. Shorty soon decided that my hair was finally long enough to be conked. He had promised to school me in how to beat the barbershop's three and four dollar price by making up congoline and then conking ourselves. I took the little list of ingredients he had printed out for me and went to a grocery store where I got a can of Red Devil Lye, two eggs, and two medium-sized white potatoes. Then at a drugstore near the pool room, I asked for a large jar of Vaseline, a large bar of soap, a large tooth comb, and a fine tooth comb, one of those rubber hoses with a metal spray head, a rubber apron, and a pair of gloves. Going to lay on that first conch? The drugstore man asked me. I proudly told him, grinning, right. Shorty paid $6 a week for a room in his cousin's shabby apartment. His cousin wasn't at home. It's like the pad's mine. He spends so much time with his woman, Shorty said. Now you watch me. He peeled the potatoes and thin sliced them into a quart-sized mason fruit jar, then started stirring them with a wooden spoon as he gradually poured in a little over half the can of lye. Never use a metal spoon. The lye will turn it black, he told me. A jelly-like, starchy-looking glop resulted from the lye and potatoes, and Shorty broke in the two eggs, stirring real fast. His own conch and dark face bent down close. The congoline turned pale yellowish. Feel the jar, Shorty said. I cut my hand against the outside and snatched it away. Damn right, it's hot. That's the lie, he said. So you know it's going to burn when I comb it in. It burns bad. But the longer you can stand it, the straighter the hair. He made me sit down, and he tied the string of the new rubber apron tightly around my neck and combed up my bush of hair. Then, from the big Vaseline jar, he took a handful and massaged it hard all through my hair and into the scalp. He also thickly Vaseline my neck, ears, and forehead. When I get to washing out your head, be sure to tell me anywhere you feel any little stinging, Shorty warned me, washing his hands, then pulling on the rubber gloves and tying on his own rubber apron. You always got to remember that any congoline left in burns a sore into your head. The congoline just felt warm when Shorty started combing it in, but then my head caught fire. I gritted my teeth and tried to pull the sides of the kitchen table together. The comb felt as if it was raking my skin off. My eyes watered. My nose was running. I couldn't stand it any longer. I bolted to the wash basin. I was cursing Shorty with every name I could think of when he got the spray going and started soap lathering my head. He lathered and spray rinsed, lathered and spray rinsed, maybe 10 or 12 times, each time gradually closing the hot water faucet until the rinse was cold, and that helped some. You feel any stinging spots? No, I managed to say. My knees were trembling. Sit back down then. I think we got it all out okay. The flame came back as Shorty, with a thick towel, started drying my head, rubbing hard. Easy, man, easy, I kept shouting. The first time's always worst. You get used to it better before long. You took it real good, homeboy. You got a good conk. When Shorty let me stand up and see in the mirror, my hair hung down in limp, damp strings. My scalp still flamed, but not as badly. I could bear it. He draped the towel around my shoulders, over my rubber apron, and began again vaselining my hair. I could feel him combing, straight back, first the big comb, then the fine-tooth one. Then, he was using a razor, 
very delicately on the back of my neck. Then finally shaping the sideburns. My first view in the mirror blotted out the hurting. I'd seen some pretty conks, but when it's the first time on your own head, the transformation after the lifetime of kinks is staggering. The mirror reflected Shorty behind me. We both were grinning and sweating. And on top of my head was this thick, smooth sheen of shining red hair, real red, as straight as any white man's. How ridiculous I was. Stupid enough to stand there simply lost in admiration of my hair now looking white, reflected in the mirror in Shorty's room. I vowed that I'd never again be without a conch, and I never was for many years. This was my first really big step toward self-degradation. When I endured all of that pain, literally burning my flesh to have it look like a white man's hair, I had joined that multitude of Negro men and women in America who are brainwashed into believing that the black people are inferior and white people superior, that they will even violate and mutilate their God-created bodies to try to look pretty by white standards. Look around today in every small town and big city, from two-bit catfish and soda pop joints into the integrated lobby of the Waldorf Astoria, and you'll see conks on black men. And you'll see black women wearing these green and pink and purple and red and platinum blonde wigs. They're all more ridiculous than a slapstick comedy. It makes you wonder if the Negro has completely lost his sense of identity, lost touch with himself. You'll see the conch worn by many, many so-called upper-class Negroes. And, as much as I hate to say it about them, on all too many Negro entertainers. One of the reasons that I've especially admired some of them, like Lionel Hampton and Sidney Poitier, among others, is that they have kept their natural hair and fought to the top. I admire any Negro man who has never had himself conked or who has had the sense to get rid of it, as I finally did. I don't know which kind of self-defacing conch is the greater shame, the one you'll see on the heads of the black so-called middle class and upper class who ought to know better, or the one you'll see on the heads of the poorest, most downtrodden, ignorant black men. I mean the legal minimum wage ghetto-dwelling kind of Negro, as I was when I got my first one. It's generally among these poor fools that you'll see a black kerchief over the man's head, like Aunt Jemima. He's trying to make his conch last longer between trips to the barber shop. Only for special occasions is this kerchief-protected conch exposed to show off how sharp and hip its owner is. The ironic thing is that I have never heard any woman, white or black, express any admiration for a conch. Of course, any white woman with a black man isn't thinking about his hair but I don't see how on earth a black woman with any race pride could walk down the street with any black man wearing a conch, the emblem of his shame that he is black. To my own shame, when I say all of this, I'm talking first of all about myself, because you can't show me any Negro who ever conked more faithfully than I did. I'm speaking from personal experience when I say of any black man who conks today or any white-wigged black woman that if they gave the brains in their heads just half as much attention as they do their hair, they would be a thousand times better off. Chapter 4. Laura. Shorty would take me to Groovy, frantic scenes in different chicks and cats' pads, where with the lights and juke down mellow, everybody blew gauge and juiced back and jumped. I met chicks who were fine as May wine, and cats who were hip to all happenings. That paragraph is deliberate, of course. It's just to display a bit more of the slang that was used by everyone I respected as hip in those days. And in no time at all, I was talking the slang like a lifelong hipster. Like hundreds of thousands of country-bred Negroes who had come to the northern black ghetto before me and have come since, I'd also acquired all the other fashionable ghetto adornments, the zoot suits and conch that I have described, liquor, cigarettes, then reefers, all to erase my embarrassing background but I still harbored one secret humiliation. I couldn't dance. I can't remember when it was that I actually learned how. That is to say, I can't recall the specific night or nights. But dancing was the chief action at those pad parties. So I've no doubt about how and why my initiation into Lindy hopping came about. With alcohol or marijuana lightening my head and that wild music wailing away on those portable record players, it didn't take long to loosen up the dancing instincts in my African heritage. All I remember is that during some party around this time, when nearly everyone but me was up dancing, some girl grabbed me. They often would take the initiative and grab a partner, for no girl at those parties ever would dream that anyone present couldn't dance. And there I was, out on the floor. I was up in the jostling crowd, and suddenly, unexpectedly, I got the idea. It was as though somebody had clicked on a light. My long-suppressed African instincts broke through and loose. 
Having spent so much time in Mason's white environment, I had always believed and feared that dancing involved a certain order or pattern of specific steps, as dancing is done by whites. But here among my own less inhibited people, I discovered it was simply letting your feet, hands, and body spontaneously act out whatever impulses were stirred by the music. From then on, hardly a party took place without me turning up, inviting myself if I had to, and Lindy hopping my head off. I'd always been fast at picking up new things. I made up for lost time now so fast that soon girls were asking me to dance with them. I work my partners hard. That's why they like me so much. When I was at work, up in the Roseland men's room, I just couldn't keep still. My shine rag popped with the rhythm of those great bands rocking the ballroom. White customers on the shine stand, especially, would laugh to see my feet suddenly break loose on their own and cut a few steps. Whites are correct in thinking that black people are natural dancers. Even little kids are, except for those Negroes today who are so integrated as I had been that their instincts are inhibited. You know those dancing jibagoo toys that you wind up? Well, I was like a live one. Music just wound me up. By the next dance for the Boston black folk, I remember that Lionel Hampton was coming into play. I had given my notice to the Roseland's manager. When I told Ella why I had quit, she laughed aloud. I told her I couldn't find time to shine shoes and dance, too. She was glad because she had never liked the idea of my working at that no-prestige job. When I told Shorty, he said he'd known I'd soon outgrow it anyway. Shorty could dance all right himself, but, for his own reasons, he never cared about going to the big dances. He loved just the music-making end of it. He practiced his saxophone and listened to records. It astonished me that Shorty didn't care to go and hear the big bands play. He had his alto sax idol, Johnny Hodges, with Duke Ellington's band, but he said he thought too many young musicians were only carbon copying the big band names on the same instrument. Anyway, Shorty was really serious about nothing except his music and about working for the day when he could start his own little group to gig around Boston. The morning after I quit Roseland, I was down at the men's clothing store bright and early. The salesman checked and found that I'd missed only one weekly payment. I had A1 credit. I told him I'd just quit my job, but he said that didn't make any difference. I could miss paying them for a couple of weeks if I had to. He knew I'd get straight. This time, I studied carefully everything in my size on the racks. And finally, I picked out my second zoot. It was a sharkskin gray with a big, long coat and pants ballooning out at the knees and then tapering down to cuffs so narrow that I had to take off my shoes to get them on and off. With the salesman urging me on, I got another shirt and a hat and new shoes. The kind that were just coming into hipster style, dark orange colored with paper thin soles and knob style toes. It all added up to 70 or $80. It was such a red letter day that I even went and got my first barbershop conch. This time it didn't hurt so much just as Shorty had predicted. That night, I timed myself to hit Roseland as the thick of the crowd was coming in. In the thronging lobby, I saw some of the real Roxbury hipsters eyeing my zoot, and some fine women were giving me that look. I sauntered up to the men's room for a short drink from the pint in my inside coat pocket. My replacement was there, a scared, narrow-faced, hungry-looking little brown-skinned fellow just in town from Kansas City. And when he recognized me, he couldn't keep down his admiration and wonder. I told him to keep cool, that he'd soon catch on to the happenings. Everything felt right when I went into the ballroom. Hamp's band was working, and that big wax floor was packed with people Lindy hopping like crazy. I grabbed some girl I'd never seen, and the next thing I knew we were out there Lindying away and grinning at each other. It couldn't have been finer. I'd been Lindying previously only in cramped little apartment living rooms, and now I had room to maneuver. Once I really got myself warmed and loosened up, I was snatching partners from among the hundreds of unattached freelancing girls along the sidelines. Almost every one of them could really dance, and I just about went wild. Hamp's band wailing. I was whirling girls so fast their skirts were snapping. Black girls, brown skins, high yellows, even a couple of the white girls there, boosting them over my hips, my shoulders, into the air. Though I wasn't quite 16 then, I was tall and raw-boned and looked like 21. I was also pretty strong for my age. Circling, tap dancing, I was underneath them when they landed, doing the flapping eagle, the kangaroo, and the split. After that, I never missed a Roseland Lindy hop as long as I stayed in Boston. The greatest Lindy dancing partner I had, everything considered, was a girl named Laura. I met her at my next job. When I quit shoe shining, 
Ella was so happy that she went around asking about a job for me, one she would approve. Just two blocks from her house, the Townsend Drugstore was about to replace its soda fountain clerk, a fellow who was leaving to go off to college. When Ella told me, I didn't like it. She knew I couldn't stand those Hill characters. But speaking my mind right then would have made Ella mad. I didn't want that to happen, so I put on the white jacket and started serving up sodas, sundaes, splits, shakes, and all the rest of that fountain stuff to those fancy acting Negroes. Every evening when I got off at eight and came home, Ella would keep saying, I hope you'll meet some of these nice young people your age here in Roxbury. But those penny ante squares who came in there putting on their millionaires' airs, the young ones and the old ones both, only annoyed me. People like the sleep-in maid for Beacon Hill white folks who used to come in with her ooh my damn manners and order corn plasters in the Jews' drugstore for black folks. Or the hospital cafeteria line serving woman sitting there on her day off with a cat fur around her neck telling the proprietor she was a dietitian, both of them knowing she was lying. Even the young ones my age, whom Ella was always talking about. The soda fountain was one of their hangouts. They soon had me ready to quit, with their accents so phonied up that if you just heard them and didn't see them, you wouldn't even know they were Negroes. I couldn't wait for 8 o'clock to get home to eat out of those soul food pots of Ella's, then get dressed in my zoot and head for some of my friends' places in town to Lindy Hop and get high or something for relief from those hill clowns. Before long, I didn't see how I was going to be able to stick it out there eight hours a day, and I nearly didn't. I remember one night I nearly quit because I had hit the numbers for 10 cents the first time I had ever hit on one of the sideline bets that I'd made in the drugstore. Yes, there were several runners on the hill, even dignified Negroes played the numbers. I won $60, and Shorty and I had a ball with it. I wished I had hit for the daily dollar that I played with my town man, paying him by the week. I would surely have quit the drugstore. I could have bought a car. Anyway, Laura lived in a house that was catter corner across the street from the drugstore. After a while, as soon as I saw her coming in, I'd start making up a banana split. She was a real bug for them, and she came in late every afternoon after school. I imagine I'd been shoving that ice cream dish under her nose for five or six weeks before somehow it began to sink in that she wasn't like the rest. She was certainly the only hill girl that came in there and acted in any way friendly and natural. She always had some book with her, and pouring over it, she would make a 30-minute job of that daily dish of banana split. I began to notice the books she read. They were pretty heavy school stuff, Latin, algebra, things like that. Watching her made me reflect that I hadn't read even a newspaper since leaving Mason. Laura. I heard her name called by a few of the others who came in when she was there but I could see they didn't know her too well. They said, hello. That was about the extent of it. She kept to herself, and she never said more than thank you to me. Nice voice, soft, quiet, never another word, but no airs like the others, no black Bostonese. She was just herself. I liked that. Before too long, I struck up a conversation. Just what subject I got off on, I don't remember, but she readily opened up and began talking, and she was very friendly. I found out that she was a high school junior, an honor student. Her parents had split up when she was a baby, and she had been raised by her grandmother, an old lady on a pension, who was very strict and old-fashioned and religious. Laura had just one close friend, a girl who lived over in Cambridge, whom she had gone to school with. They talked on the telephone every day. Her grandmother scarcely ever let her go to the movies, let alone on dates. But Laura really liked school. She said she wanted to go on to college. She was keen for algebra and she planned to major in science. Laura never would have dreamed that she was a year older than I was. I gauged that indirectly. She looked up to me as though she felt I had a world of experience more than she did, which really was the truth. But sometimes, when she had gone, I felt let down, thinking how I had turned away from the books I used to like when I was back in Michigan. I got to the point where I looked forward to her coming in every day after school. I stopped letting her pay and gave her extra ice cream. And she wasn't hiding the fact that she liked me. It wasn't long before she had stopped reading her books when she came in and would just sit and eat and talk with me. And soon she began trying to get me to talk about myself. I was immediately sorry when I dropped that I had once thought about becoming a lawyer. She didn't want to let me rest about that. Malcolm, there's no reason you can't pick up right where you are and become a lawyer. She had the idea that my sister Ella would help me as much as she could. 
And if Ella had ever thought that she could help any member of the little family put up any kind of professional shingle as a teacher, a foot doctor, anything, why, you would have had to tie her down to keep her from taking in washing. I never mentioned Laura to Shorty. I just knew she never would have understood him or that crowd. And they wouldn't have understood her. She had never been touched. I'm certain she hadn't or even had a drink. And she wouldn't even have known what a reefer was. It was a great surprise to me when one afternoon Laura happened to let drop that she just loved Lindy hopping. I asked her how had she been able to go out dancing. She said she'd been introduced to Lindy hopping at a party given by the parents of some Negro friend just accepted by Harvard. It was just about time to start closing down the soda fountain. And I said that Count Basie was playing the Roseland that weekend. And would she like to go? Laura's eyes got wide. I thought I'd have to catch her. She was so excited. She said she'd never been there. She'd heard so much about it. She'd imagined what it was like. She'd just give anything, but her grandma would have a fit. So I said maybe some other time. But the afternoon before the dance, Laura came in full of excitement. She whispered that she'd never lied to her grandma before, but she had told her she had to attend some school function that evening. If I'd get her home early, she'd meet me. If I'd still take her. I told her we'd have to go by for me to change clothes at the house. She hesitated but said okay. Before we left, I telephoned Ella to say I'd be bringing a girl by on the way to the dance. Though I'd never before done anything like it, Ella covered up her surprise. I laughed to myself a long time afterward about how Ella's mouth flew open when we showed up at the front door, me and a well-bred hill girl. Laura, when I introduced her, was warm and sincere. And Ella, you would have thought she was closing in on her third husband. While they sat and talked downstairs, I dressed upstairs in my room. I remember changing my mind about the wild sharkskin gray zoot I had planned to wear and deciding instead to put on the first one I'd gotten, the blue zoot. I knew I should wear the most conservative thing I had. They were like old friends when I came back down. Ella had even made tea. Ella's hawkeye just about raked my zoot right off my back. But I'm sure she was grateful that I'd at least put on the blue one. Knowing Ella, I knew that she had already extracted Laura's entire life story and all but had the wedding bells around my neck. I grinned all the way to the Roseland in the taxi because I had showed Ella I could hang out with hill girls if I wanted to. Laura's eyes were so big. She said almost none of her acquaintances knew her grandmother, who never went anywhere but to church, so there wasn't much danger of it getting back to her. The only person she had told was her girlfriend, who had shared her excitement. Then, suddenly we were in the Roseland's jostling lobby, and I was getting waves and smiles and greetings. They shouted, my man, and hey, Red, and I answered, daddy-o. She and I never before had danced together, but that certainly was no problem. Any two people who can lindy at all can lindy together. We just started out there on the floor among a lot of other couples. It was maybe halfway in the number before I became aware of how she danced. If you've ever Lindy hopped, you'll know what I'm talking about. With most girls, you kind of work opposite them, circling, sidestepping, leading. Whichever arm you lead with is half bent out there. Your hands are giving that little pull, that little push, touching her waist, her shoulders, her arms. She's in, out, turning, whirling, wherever you guide her. With poor partners, you feel their weight. They're slow and heavy. But with really good partners, all you need is just the push-pull suggestion. They guide nearly effortlessly, even off the floor and into the air, and your little solo maneuver is done on the floor before they land when they join you, whirling, right in step. I danced with plenty of good partners. But what I became suddenly aware of with Laura was that I'd never before felt so little weight. I'd nearly just think a maneuver, and she'd respond. Anyway, as she danced up, down, under my arm, flinging out, while I felt her out and examined her style, I glimpsed her footwork. I can close my eyes right now and see it, like some blurring ballet, beautiful, and her lightness, like a shadow. My perfect partner, if somebody had asked me, would have been one who handled as lightly as Laura and who would have had the strength to last through a long, tough showtime. But I knew that Laura wouldn't begin to be that strong. In Harlem, years later, a friend of mine called Sammy the Pimp taught me something I wish I had known then to look for in Laura's face. It was what Sammy declared was his infallible clue for determining the unconscious, true personality of women. Considering all the women he had picked out of crowds and turned into prostitutes, Sammy qualified as an expert. Anyway, he swore that if a woman, any woman, gets really carried away while dancing, what she truly is, at least potentially, will surface and show on her face. 
I'm not suggesting that a lady of easy virtue look danced to the surface in Laura, although life did deal her cruel blows, starting with her meeting me. All I am saying is that it may be that if I had been equipped with Sammy's ability, I might have spotted in Laura then some of the subsurface potential destined to become real that would have shocked her grandma. A third of the way or so through the evening, the main vocalizing and instrumental stylings would come, and then showtime, when only the greatest Lindy Hoppers would stay on the floor to try and eliminate each other. All the other dancers would form a big U with the band at the open end. The girls who intended to compete would slip over to the sidelines and change from high heels into low white sneakers. In competition, they never could survive in heels. And always among them were four or five unattached girls who would run around trying to hook up with some guy they knew could really Lindy. Now Count Basie turned on the showtime blast and the other dancers moved off the floor, shifting for good watching positions and began their hollering for their favorites. All right now, Red, they shouted to me. Go get them, Red. And then a freelancing Lindy girl I'd danced with before, Mamie Bevels, a waitress and a wild dancer ran up to me with Laura standing right there. I wasn't sure what to do. But Laura started backing away toward the crowd, still looking at me. The Count's band was wailing. I grabbed Mamie and we started to work. She was a big, rough, strong gal, and she lindied like a bucking horse. I remember the very night that she became known as one of the Showtime favorites there at the Roseland. A band was screaming when she kicked off her shoes and got barefooted and shouted and shook herself as if she were in some African jungle frenzy, and then she let loose with some dancing, shouting with every step, until the guy that was out there with her nearly had to fight to control her. The crowd loved any way out Lindying style that made a colorful show like that. It was how Mamie had become known. Anyway, I started driving her like a horse, the way she liked. When we came off the floor after the first number, we both were ringing wet with sweat, and people were shouting and pounding our backs. I remember leaving early with Laura to get her home in time. She was very quiet, and she didn't have much to say for the next week or so when she came into the drugstore. Even then, I had learned enough about women to know not to pressure them when they're thinking something out. They'll tell you when they're ready. Every time I saw Ella, even brushing my teeth in the morning, she turned on the third degree. When was I seeing Laura again? Was I going to bring her by again? What a nice girl she is. Ella had picked her out for me. But in that kind of way, I thought hardly anything about the girl. When it came to personal matters, my mind was strictly on getting sharp in my zoot as soon as I left work and racing downtown to hang out with Shorty and the other guys and with the girls they knew a million miles away from the stuck-up hill. I wasn't even thinking about Laura when she came up to me in the drugstore and asked me to take her to the next Negro dance at the Roseland. Duke Ellington was going to play, and she was beside herself with excitement. I had no way to know what was going to happen. She asked me to pick her up at her house this time. I didn't want any contact with the old grandma she had described, but I went. Grandma answered the door an old-fashioned, wrinkled black woman with fuzzy gray hair. She just opened the door enough for me to get in, not even saying as much as, come in, dog. I have faced armed detectives and gangsters less hostile than she was. I remember the musty living room, full of those old Christ pictures, prayers woven into tapestries, statuettes of the crucifixion, other religious objects on the mantel, shelves, tabletops, walls, everywhere. Since the old lady wasn't speaking to me, I didn't speak to her either. I completely sympathize with her now, of course. What could she have thought of me in my zoot and conch and orange shoes? She'd have done us all a favor if she had run screaming for the police. If something looking as I did then ever came knocking at my door today, asking to see one of my four daughters, I know I would explode. When Laura rushed into the room, jerking on her coat, I could see that she was upset and angry and embarrassed. And in the taxi, she started crying. She had hated herself for lying before. She had decided to tell the truth about where she was going, and there had been a screaming battle with Grandma. Laura had told the old lady that she was going to start going out when and where she wanted to, or she would quit school and get a job and move out on her own, and her grandma had pitched a fit. Laura just walked out. When we got to the Roseland, we danced the early part of the evening with each other and with different partners, and finally the Duke kicked off Showtime. I knew, and Laura knew, that she couldn't match the veteran Showtime girls but she told me that she wanted to compete. And the next thing I knew, she was among those girls over on the sidelines changing into sneakers. I shook my head when a couple of the freelancing girls ran up to me. 
As always, the crowd clapped and shouted in time with the blasting band. Go, Red, go. Partly it was my reputation, and partly Laura's ballet style of dancing that helped to turn the spotlight and the crowd's attention to us. They never had seen the feather lightness that she gave to Lindying, a completely fresh style, and they were connoisseurs of styles. I turned up the steam. Laura's feet were flying. I had her in the air, down, sideways, around, backwards, up again, down, whirling. The spotlight was working mostly just us. I caught glimpses of the four or five other couples, the girls jungle strong, animal-like, bucking, and charging. But little Laura inspired me to drive to new heights. Her hair was all over her face. It was running sweat, and I couldn't believe her strength. The crowd was shouting and stomping. A new favorite was being discovered. There was a wall of noise around us. I felt her weakening. She was lindying like a fighter out on her feet, and we stumbled off to the sidelines. The band was still blasting. I had to half carry her. She was gasping for air. Some of the men in the band applauded, and even Duke Ellington half raised up from his piano stool and bowed. If a Showtime crowd liked your performance, when you came off, you were mobbed, mauled, grasped, and pummeled like the team that's just taken the series. One bunch of the crowd swarmed Laura. They had her clear up off her feet, and I was being pounded on the back when I caught this fine blonde's eyes. This one I'd never seen among the white girls who came to the Roseland Black Dances. She was eyeing me levelly. Now at that time in Roxbury, in any black ghetto in America, to have a white woman who wasn't a known common whore was, for the average black man at least, a status symbol of the first order. And this one, standing there, eyeing me, was almost too fine to believe. Shoulder-length hair, well-built, and her clothes had cost somebody plenty. It's shameful to admit, but I had just about forgotten Laura when she got loose from the mob and rushed up, big-eyed, and stopped. I guess she saw what there was to see in that girl's face, and mine, as we moved out to dance. I'm going to call her Sophia. She didn't dance well, at least not by Negro standards. But who cared? I could feel the staring eyes of other couples around us. We talked. I told her she was a good dancer and asked her where she'd learned. I was trying to find out why she was there. Most white women came to the black dances for reasons I knew, but you seldom saw her kind around there. She had vague answers for everything. But in the space of that dance, we agreed that I would get Laura home early and rush back in a taxi cab. And then she asked if I'd like to go for a drive later. I felt very lucky. Laura was home and I was back at the Roseland in an hour flat. Sophia was waiting outside. About five blocks down, she had a low convertible. She knew where she was going. Beyond Boston, she pulled off into a side road and then off that into a deserted lane and turned off everything but the radio. For the next several months, Sophia would pick me up downtown and I'd take her to dances and to the bars around Roxbury. We drove all over. Sometimes it would be nearly daylight when she let me out in front of Ella's. I paraded her. The Negro men loved her and she just seemed to love all Negroes. Two or three nights a week, we would go out together. Sophia admitted that she also had dates with white fellows. Just for the looks of things, she said. She swore that a white man couldn't interest her. I wondered for a long time, but I never did find out why she approached me so boldly that very first night. I always thought it was because of some earlier experience with another Negro, but I never asked, and she never said. Never ask a woman about other men. Either she'll tell you a lie, and you still won't know, or if she tells you the truth, you might not have wanted to hear it in the first place. Anyway, she seemed entranced with me. I began to see less of Shorty. When I did see him and the gang, he would jibe, man, I had to comb the burrs out of my homeboy's head and now he's got a Beacon Hill chick. But truly, because it was known that Shorty had schooled me, my having Sophia gave Shorty status. When I introduced her to him, she hugged him like a sister and it just about finished Shorty off. His best had been white prostitutes and a few of those poor specimens that worked around in the mills and had discovered Negroes. It was when I began to be seen around town with Sophia that I really began to mature into some real status in black downtown Roxbury. Up to then, I had been just another among all of the conked and zooted youngsters. But now, with the best-looking white woman who ever walked in those bars and clubs, and with her giving me the money I spent too, even the big, important black hustlers and smart boys, the club managers, name gamblers, numbers bankers, and others were clapping me on the back, setting us up to drinks at special tables, and calling me Red. Of course I knew their reason like I knew my own name. They wanted to steal my fine white woman away from me. In the ghetto, as in suburbia, 
It's the same status struggle to stand out in some envied way from the rest. At 16, I didn't have the money to buy a Cadillac, but she had her own fine rubber, as we called a car in those days. And I had her, which was even better. Laura never again came to the drugstore as long as I continued to work there. The next time I saw her, she was a wreck of a woman, notorious around Black Roxbury, in and out of jail. She had finished high school, but by then, she was already going the wrong way. Defying her grandmother, she had started going out late and drinking liquor. This led to dope, and that to selling herself to men. Learning to hate the men who bought her, she also became a lesbian. One of the shames I have carried for years is that I blame myself for all of this. To have treated her as I did for a white woman made the blow doubly heavy. The only excuse I can offer is that, like so many of my black brothers today, I was just deaf, dumb, and blind. In any case, it wasn't long after I met Sophia that Ella found out about it, and watching from the windows one early morning saw me getting out of Sophia's car. Not surprisingly, Ella began treating me like a viper. About then, Shorty's cousin finally moved in with the woman he was so crazy about, and Sophia financed me to take over half of the apartment with Shorty, and I quit the drugstore and soon found a new job. I became a busboy at the Parker House in Boston. I wore a starched white jacket out in the dining room where the waiters would put the customers' dirty plates and silver on big aluminum trays, which I would take back to the kitchen's dishwashers. A few weeks later, one Sunday morning, I ran into work expecting to get fired. I was so late. But the whole kitchen crew was too excited and upset to notice. Japanese planes had just bombed a place called Pearl Harbor. Chapter 5. Harlemite. Get your good ham and cheese, sandwiches, coffee, candy, cake, ice cream. Rocking along the tracks every other day for four hours between Boston and New York in the coach aisles of the New York New Haven and Hartford's Yankee Clipper. Old Man Roundtree, an elderly Pullman porter and a friend of Ella's, had recommended the railroad job for me. He had told her the war was snatching away railroad men so fast that if I could pass for 21, he could get me on. Ella wanted to get me out of Boston and away from Sophia. She would have loved nothing better than to have seen me like one of those Negroes who were already thronging Roxbury in the Army's khaki and thick shoes, home on leave from boot camp. But my age of 16 stopped that. I went along with the railroad job for my own reasons. For a long time, I'd wanted to visit New York City. Since I had been in Roxbury, I had heard a lot about the Big Apple, as it was called by the well-traveled musicians, merchant mariners, salesmen, chauffeurs for white families, and various kinds of hustlers I ran into. Even as far back as Lansing, I had been hearing about how fabulous New York was, and especially Harlem. In fact, my father had described Harlem with pride and showed us pictures of the huge parades by the Harlem followers of Marcus Garvey. And every time Joe Louis won a fight against a white opponent, big front page pictures in the Negro newspapers, such as the Chicago Defender, the Pittsburgh Courier, and the Afro-American, showed a sea of Harlem Negroes cheering and waving and the brown bomber waving back at them from the balcony of Harlem's Teresa Hotel. Everything I'd ever heard about New York City was exciting. Things like Broadway's bright lights in the Savoy Ballroom and Apollo Theater in Harlem, where great bands played and famous songs and dance steps and Negro stars originated. But you couldn't just pick up and go to visit New York from Lansing or Boston or anywhere else, not without money. So I'd never really given too much thought to getting to New York until the freeway to travel there came in the form of Ella's talk with old man Roundtree, who was a member of Ella's church. What Ella didn't know, of course, was that I would continue to see Sophia. Sophia could get away only a few nights a week. She said, when I told her about the train job, that she'd get away every night I got back into Boston, and this would mean every other night if I got the run I wanted. Sophia didn't want me to leave at all, but she believed I was draft age already and thought the train job would keep me out of the army. Shorty thought it would be a great chance for me. He was worried sick himself about the draft call that he knew was soon to come. Like hundreds of the black ghetto's young men, he was taking some stuff that, it was said, would make your heart sound defective to the draft board's doctors. Shorty felt about the war the same way I and most ghetto Negroes did. Whitey owns everything. He wants us to go and bleed for him? Let him fight. Anyway, at the railroad personnel hiring office down on Dover Street, a tired acting old white clerk got down to the crucial point when I came to sign up. Age little? When I told him 21, he never lifted his eyes from his pencil. I knew I had the job. 
I was promised the first available Boston to New York fourth cook job, but for a while, I worked there in the Dover Street yard, helping to load food requisitions onto the trains. Fourth cook, I knew, was just a glorified name for dishwasher, but it wouldn't be my first time, and just as long as I traveled where I wanted, it didn't make any difference to me. Temporarily, though, they put me on the Colonial that ran to Washington, D.C. The kitchen crew, headed by a West Indian chef named Duke Vaughn, worked with almost unbelievable efficiency in the cramped quarters. Against the sound of the train clacking along, the waiters were jabbering the customers' orders. The cooks operated like machines, and 500 miles of dirty pots and dishes and silverware rattled back to me. Then, on the overnight layover, I naturally went sightseeing in downtown Washington. I was astounded to find in the nation's capital, just a few blocks from Capitol Hill, thousands of Negroes living worse than any I'd ever seen in the poorest sections of Roxbury, in dirt floor shacks, along unspeakably filthy lanes with names like Pig Alley and Goat Alley. I had seen a lot, but never such a dense concentration of stumble bums, pushers, hookers, public crapshooters, even little kids running around at midnight begging for pennies, half naked and barefooted. Some of the railroad cooks and waiters had told me to be very careful because muggings, knifings, and robberies went on every night among these Negroes, just a few blocks from the White House. But I saw other Negroes better off. They lived in blocks of run-down red brick houses. The old colonial railroaders had told me about Washington having a lot of middle-class Negroes with Howard University degrees who were working as laborers, janitors, porters, guards, taxi drivers, and the like. For the Negro in Washington, mail carrying was a prestige job. After a few of the Washington runs, I snatched the chance when one day personnel said I could temporarily replace a sandwich man on the Yankee Clipper to New York. I was into my zoot suit before the first passenger got off. The cooks took me up to Harlem in a cab. White New York passed by like a movie set. Then abruptly, when we left Central Park at the upper end, at 110th Street, the people's complexion began to change. Busy 7th Avenue ran along in front of a place called Small's Paradise. The crew had told me before we left Boston that it was their favorite night spot in Harlem and not to miss it. No Negro place of business had ever impressed me so much. Around the big, luxurious-looking circular bar were 30 or 40 Negroes, mostly men, drinking and talking. I was hit first, I think, by their conservative clothes and manners. Wherever I'd seen as many as 10 Boston Negroes, let alone Lansing Negroes, drinking, there had been a big noise. But with all of these Harlemites drinking and talking, there was just a low murmur of sound. Customers came and went. The bartenders knew what most of them drank and automatically fixed it. A bottle was set on the bar before some. Every Negro I'd ever known had made a point of flashing whatever money he had. But these Harlem Negroes quietly laid a bill on the bar. They drank. They nonchalantly nodded to the bartender to pour a drink for some friend, while the bartenders, smooth as any of the customers, kept making change from the money on the bar. Their manners seemed natural. They were not putting on any airs. I was awed. Within the first five minutes in Smalls, I had left Boston and Roxbury forever. I didn't yet know that these weren't what you might call everyday or average Harlem Negroes. Later on, even later that night, I would find out that Harlem contained hundreds of thousands of my people who were just as loud and gaudy as Negroes anywhere else. But these were the cream of the older, more mature operators in Harlem. The day's numbers business was done. The night's gambling and other forms of hustling hadn't yet begun. The usual nightlife crowd, who worked on regular jobs all day, were at home eating their dinners. The hustlers at this time were in the daily six o'clock congregation, having their favorite bars all over Harlem largely to themselves. From Smalls, I taxied over to the Apollo Theater. I remember so well that Jay McShann's band was playing because his vocalist was later my close friend, Walter Brown, the one who used to sing Hootie Hootie Blues. From there, on the other side of 125th Street at 7th Avenue, I saw the big, tall, gray Teresa Hotel. It was the finest in New York City where Negroes could then stay, years before the downtown hotels would accept the black man. The Teresa is now best known as the place where Fidel Castro went during his UN visit and achieved a psychological coup over the U.S. State Department when it confined him to Manhattan, never dreaming that he'd stay uptown in Harlem and make such an impression among the Negroes. The Braddock Hotel was just up 126th Street, near the Apollo's backstage entrance. I knew its bar was famous as a Negro celebrity hangout. 
I walked in and saw along that jam-packed bar such famous stars as Dizzy Gillespie, Billy Eckstein, Billy Holiday, Ella Fitzgerald, and Dinah Washington. As Dinah Washington was leaving with some friends, I overheard someone say she was on her way to the Savoy Ballroom where Lionel Hampton was appearing that night. She was then Hamp's vocalist. The ballroom made the Roseland in Boston look small and shabby by comparison, and the Lindy hopping there matched the size and elegance of the place. Hampton's hard-driving outfit kept a red-hot pace with his greats such as Arnett Cobb, Illinois Jacquet, Dexter Gordon, Alvin Hayes, Joe Newman, and George Jenkins. I went a couple of rounds on the floor with girls from the sidelines. Probably a third of the sideline booths were filled with white people, mostly just watching the Negroes dance. But some of them danced together, and as in Boston, a few white women were with Negroes. The people kept shouting for Hamp's flying home, and finally he did it. I could believe the story I'd heard in Boston about this number, that once in the Apollo, Hamp's flying home had made some reefer-smoking Negro in the second balcony believe he could fly, so he tried and jumped and broke his leg, an event later immortalized in song when Earl Hines wrote a hit tune called Second Balcony Jump. I had never seen such fever heat dancing. After a couple of slow numbers cooled the place off, they brought on Dinah Washington. When she did her Salty Papa Blues, those people just about tore the Savoy roof off. Poor Dinah's funeral was held not long ago in Chicago. I read that over 20,000 people viewed her body, and I should have been there myself. Poor Dinah. We became great friends back in those days. But this night of my first visit was Kitchen Mechanics Night at the Savoy, the traditional Thursday night off for domestics. I'd say there were twice as many women as men in there, not only kitchen workers and maids, but also war wives and defense worker women, lonely and looking. Out in the street, when I left the ballroom, I heard a prostitute cursing bitterly that the professionals couldn't do any business because of the amateurs. Up and down along and between Lenox and 7th and 8th Avenues, Harlem was like some technicolor bazaar. Hundreds of Negro soldiers and sailors, gawking and young like me, passed by. Harlem by now was officially off limits to white servicemen. There had already been some muggings and robberies, and several white servicemen had been found murdered. The police were also trying to discourage white civilians from coming uptown, but those who wanted to still did. Every man without a woman on his arm was being worked by the prostitutes. Baby, want to have some fun? The pimps would sidle up close, stage whispering, all kinds of women, Jack, want a white woman? And the hustlers were merchandising. Hundred dollar ring, man, diamond, ninety dollar watch, too. Look at them. Take them both for twenty five. In another two years, I could have given them all lessons. But that night, I was mesmerized. This world was where I belonged. On that night, I had started on my way to becoming a Harlemite. I was going to become one of the most depraved parasitical hustlers among New York's eight million people, four million of whom work, and the other four million of whom live off them. I couldn't quite believe all that I'd heard and seen that night as I lugged my shoulder strap sandwich box and that heavy five-gallon aluminum coffee pot up and down the aisles of the Yankee Clipper back to Boston. I wish that Ella and I had been on better terms so that I could try to describe to her how I felt. But I did talk to Shorty, urging him to at least go to see the Big Apple music world. Sophia listened to me, too. She told me that I'd never be satisfied anywhere but New York. She was so right. In one night, New York, Harlem, had just about narcotized me. That sandwich man I'd replaced had little chance of getting his job back. I went bellowing up and down those train aisles. I sold sandwiches, coffee, candy, cake, and ice cream as fast as the railroad's commissary department could supply them. It didn't take me a week to learn that all you had to do was give white people a show and they'd buy anything you offered them. It was like popping your shoeshine rag. The dining car waiters and Pullman porters knew it too, and they faked their Uncle Tomming to get bigger tips. We were in that world of Negroes who are both servants and psychologists, aware that white people are so obsessed with their own importance that they will pay liberally, even dearly, for the impression of being catered to and entertained. Every layover night in Harlem, I ran and explored new places. I first got a room at the Harlem YMCA because it was less than a block from Small's Paradise. Then I got a cheaper room at Mrs. Fisher's rooming house, which was close to the YMCA. Most of the railroad men stayed at Mrs. Fisher's. I combed not only the bright light areas, but Harlem's residential areas from best to worst, 
from Sugar Hill up near the polo grounds, where many famous celebrities lived, down to the slum blocks of old rat trap apartment houses, just crawling with everything you could mention that was illegal and immoral. Dirt, garbage cans overflowing or kicked over, drunks, dope addicts, beggars, sleazy bars, storefront churches with gospels being shouted inside, bargain stores, hawk shops, undertaking parlors, greasy home cooking restaurants, beauty shops smoky inside from Negro women's hair getting fried, barber shops advertising conch experts, Cadillacs, secondhand and new, conspicuous among the cars on the street. All of it was Lansing's West Side or Roxbury's South End magnified a thousand times. Little basement dance halls with for rent signs on them. People offering you little cards advertising rent raising parties. I went to one of these. 30 or 40 Negroes sweating, eating, drinking, dancing, and gambling in a jammed, beat-up apartment. The record player going full blast. The fried chicken or chitlins with potato salad and collard greens for a dollar a plate. And cans of beer or shots of liquor for 50 cents. Negro and white canvassers sidled up alongside you, talking fast as they tried to get you to buy a copy of The Daily Worker. This paper's trying to keep your rent controlled, make that greedy landlord kill them rats in your apartment. This paper represents the only political party that ever ran a black man for the vice presidency of the United States. Just want you to read. Won't take but a little of your time. Who do you think fought the hardest to help free those Scottsboro boys? Things I overheard among Negroes when the salesmen were around let me know that the paper somehow was tied in with the Russians. But to my sterile mind in those early days, it didn't mean much. The radio broadcasts and the newspapers were then full of our ally Russia, a strong, muscular people, peasants, with their backs to the wall helping America to fight Hitler and Mussolini. But New York was heaven to me, and Harlem was seventh heaven. I hung around in Smalls and the Braddock Bar so much that the bartenders began to pour a shot of bourbon, my favorite brand of it, when they saw me walk in the door, and the steady customers in both places, the hustlers in Smalls and the entertainers in the Braddock, began to call me Red, a natural enough nickname in view of my bright red conch. I now had my conch done in Boston at the shop of Abbott and Fogey. It was the best conch shop on the East Coast, according to the musical greats who had recommended it to me. My friends now included musicians like Duke Ellington's great drummer, Sonny Greer, and that great personality with the violin, Ray Nance. He's the one who used to sing in that wild scat style, blip blip de blop de blom blom, and people like Cootie Williams and Eddie Cleanhead Vinson, who'd kid me about his conch. He had nothing up there but skin. He was hitting the heights then with his song, Hey Pretty Mama, Chunk Me in Your Big Brass Bed. I also knew Cy Oliver. He was married to a red-complexioned girl, and they lived up on Sugar Hill. Cy did a lot of arranging for Tommy Dorsey in those days. His most famous tune, I believe, was Yes Indeed, the regular Yankee Clipper sandwich man when he came back was put on another train. He complained about seniority, but my sales record made them placate him some other way. The waiters and cooks had begun to call me Sandwich Red. By that time, they had a laughing bet going that I wasn't going to last. Sales or not, because I had so rapidly become such an uncouth, wild young Negro. Profanity had become my language. I'd even curse customers, especially servicemen. I couldn't stand them. I remember that once, when some passenger complaints had gotten me a warning and I wanted to be careful, I was working down the aisle and a big, beefy, red-faced cracker soldier got up in front of me, so drunk he was weaving, and announced loud enough that everybody in the car heard him. I'm going to fight you, nigger. I remember the tension. I laughed and told him, sure, I'll fight, but you've got too many clothes on. He had on a big army overcoat. He took that off and I kept laughing and said he still had on too many. I was able to keep that cracker stripping off clothes until he stood there drunk with nothing on from his pants up and the whole car was laughing at him and some other soldiers got him out of the way. I went on. I never would forget that, that I couldn't have whipped that white man as badly with a club as I had with my mind. Many of the New Haven Line's cooks and waiters still in railroad service today will remember old Pappy Cousins. He was the Yankee Clipper steward, a white man, of course, from Maine. Negroes had been in dining car service as much as 30 and 40 years, but in those days there were no Negro stewards on the New Haven line. Anyway, Pappy Cousins loved whiskey, and he liked everybody, even me. A lot of passenger complaints about me, Pappy had let slide. He'd asked some of the old Negroes working with me to try and calm me down. 
Man, you can't tell him nothing, they'd exclaim, and they couldn't. At home in Roxbury, they would see me parading with Sophia, dressed in my wild zoot suits. Then I'd come to work, loud and wild and half high on liquor or reefers, and I'd stay that way, jamming sandwiches at people until we got to New York. Off the train, I'd go through that Grand Central Station afternoon rush hour crowd, and many white people simply stopped in their tracks to watch me pass. The drape and the cut of a zoot suit showed to the best advantage if you were tall, and I was over six feet. My conch was fire red. I was really a clown, but my ignorance made me think I was sharp. My knob-toed, orange-colored kick-up shoes were nothing but floor shimes, the ghetto's Cadillac of shoes in those days. Some shoe companies made these ridiculous styles for sale only in the black ghettos where ignorant Negroes like me would pay the big-name price for something that we associated with being rich. And then, between Small's Paradise, the Braddock Hotel, and other places, as much as my $20 or $25 pay would allow, I drank liquor, smoked marijuana, painted the Big Apple red with increasing numbers of friends, and finally in Mrs. Fisher's rooming house, I got a few hours of sleep before the Yankee Clipper rolled again. It was inevitable that I was going to be fired sooner or later. What finally finished me was an angry letter from a passenger. The conductors added their bit, telling how many verbal complaints they'd had and how many warnings I'd been given. But I didn't care, because in those wartime days, such jobs as I could aspire to were going begging. When the New Haven line paid me off, I decided it would be nice to make a trip to visit my brothers and sisters in Lansing. I had accumulated some railroad-free travel privileges. None of them back in Michigan could believe it was me. Only my oldest brother, Wilfred, wasn't there. He was away at Wilberforce University in Ohio studying a trade, but Filbert and Hilda were working in Lansing. Reginald, the one who had always looked up to me, had gotten big enough to fake his age, and he was planning soon to enter the Merchant Marine. Yvonne, Wesley, and Robert were in school. My conch and whole costume were so wild that I might have been taken as a man from Mars. I caused a minor automobile collision. One driver stopped to gape at me, and the driver behind bumped into him. My appearance staggered the older boys I had once envied. I'd stick out my hand saying, Skin me, Daddy O. My stories about the Big Apple, my reefers keeping me sky high, wherever I went, I was the life of the party. My man, give me some skin. The only thing that brought me down to earth was the visit to the state hospital in Kalamazoo. My mother sort of half sensed who I was, and I looked up Shorty's mother. I knew he'd be touched by my doing that. She was an old lady, and she was glad to hear from Shorty through me. I told her that Shorty was doing fine and one day was going to be a great leader of his own band. She asked me to tell Shorty that she wished he'd write her and send her something. And I dropped over to Mason to see Mrs. Swirlin, the woman at the detention home who had kept me those couple of years. Her mouth flew open when she came to the door. My sharkskin gray Cab Calloway zoot suit, the long, narrow, knob-toed shoes, and the four-inch brimmed pearl gray hat over my conked fire red hair. It was just about too much for Mrs. Swirlin. She just managed to pull herself together enough to invite me in. Between the way I looked and my style of talk, I made her so nervous and uncomfortable that we were both glad when I left. The night before I left, a dance was given in the Lincoln School Gymnasium. I've since learned that in a strange city, to find the Negroes without asking where, you just check in the phone book for a Lincoln school. It's always located in the segregated black ghetto, at least it was in those days. I'd left Lansing unable to dance, but now I went around the gymnasium floor flinging little girls over my shoulders and hips, showing my most startling steps. Several times the little band nearly stopped, and nearly everybody left the floor, watching with their eyes like saucers. That night, I even signed autographs, Harlem Red, and I left Lansing shocked and rocked. Back in New York, stone broke, and without any means of support, I realized that the railroad was all that I actually knew anything about. So I went over to the Seaboard Lines hiring office. The railroads needed men so badly that all I had to do was tell them I had worked on the New Haven, and two days later, I was on the Silver Meteor to St. Petersburg in Miami. Renting pillows and keeping the coaches clean and the white passengers happy, I made about as much as I had with sandwiches. I soon ran afoul of the Florida cracker who was assistant conductor. Back in New York, they told me to find another job. But that afternoon, when I walked into Small's Paradise, one of the bartenders, knowing how much I love New York, called me aside and said that if I were willing to quit the railroad, I might be able to replace a day waiter who was about to go into the army. The owner of the bar was Ed Small. He and his brother Charlie were inseparable, 
and I guess Harlem didn't have two more popular and respected people. They knew I was a railroad man, which, for a waiter, was the best kind of recommendation. Charlie Small was the one I actually talked with in their office. I was afraid he'd want to wait to ask some of his old-timer railroad friends for their opinion. Charlie wouldn't have gone for anybody he heard was wild, but he decided on the basis of his own impression, having seen me in his place so many times, sitting quietly, almost in awe, observing the hustling set. I told him, when he asked, that I'd never been in trouble with the police, and up to then, that was the truth. Charlie told me their rules for employees. No lateness, no laziness, no stealing, no kind of hustling off any customers, especially men in uniform. And I was hired. This was in 1942. I had just turned 17. With Smalls practically in the center of everything, waiting tables there was seventh heaven seven times over. Charlie Small had no need to caution me against being late. I was so anxious to be there, I'd arrive an hour early. I relieved the morning waiter. As far as he was concerned, mine was the slowest, most no-tips time of day, and sometimes he'd stick around most of that hour teaching me things, for he didn't want to see me fired. Thanks to him, I learned very quickly dozens of little things that could really ingratiate a new waiter with the cooks and bartenders. Both of these, depending on how they liked the waiter, could make his job miserable or pleasant, and I meant to become indispensable. Inside of a week, I had succeeded with both and the customers who had seen me among them around the bar, recognizing me now in the waiter's jacket, were pleased and surprised, and they couldn't have been more friendly, and I couldn't have been more solicitous. Another drink? Right away, sir. Would you like dinner? It's very good. Could I get you a menu, sir? Well, maybe a sandwich? Not only the bartenders and cooks, who knew everything about everything, it seemed to me, but even the customers also began to school me in little conversations by the bar when I wasn't busy. Sometimes a customer would talk to me as he ate. Sometimes I'd have long talks, absorbing everything with the real old timers who had been around Harlem since Negroes first came there. That, in fact, was one of my biggest surprises, that Harlem hadn't always been a community of Negroes. It first had been a Dutch settlement, I learned. Then began the massive waves of poor and half-starved and ragged immigrants from Europe, arriving with everything they owned in the world in bags and sacks on their backs. The Germans came first. The Dutch edged away from them, and Harlem became all German. Then came the Irish, running from the potato famine. The Germans ran, looking down their noses at the Irish, who took over Harlem. Next, the Italians. Same thing, the Irish ran from them. The Italians had Harlem when the Jews came down the gangplanks, and then the Italians left. Today, all these same immigrants' descendants are running as hard as they can to escape the descendants of the Negroes who helped to unload the immigrant ships. I was staggered when old-timer Harlemites told me that while this immigrant musical chairs game had been going on, Negroes had been in New York City since 1683, before any of them came, and had been ghettoed all over the city. They had first been in the Wall Street area. Then they were pushed into Greenwich Village. The next shove was up to the Pennsylvania Station area. And then, the last stop before Harlem, the black ghetto was concentrated around 52nd Street, which is how 52nd Street got the Swing Street name and reputation that lasted long after the Negroes were gone. Then, in 1910, a Negro real estate man somehow got two or three Negro families into one Jewish Harlem apartment house. The Jews flew from that house, then from that block, and more Negroes came in to fill their apartments. Then whole blocks of Jews ran, and still more Negroes came uptown, until in a short time, Harlem was like it still is today virtually all black. Then, early in the 1920s, music and entertainment sprang up as an industry in Harlem, supported by downtown whites who poured uptown every night. It all started about the time a tough young New Orleans cornet man named Louis Satchmo Armstrong climbed off a train in New York wearing clodhopper policeman's shoes and started playing with Fletcher Henderson. In 1925, Small's Paradise had opened with crowds all across 7th Avenue. In 1926, the Great Cotton Club, where Duke Ellington's band would play for five years. Also in 1926, the Savoy Ballroom opened a whole block front on Lenox Avenue with a 200-foot dance floor under spotlights before two bandstands and a disappearing rear stage. Harlem's famous image spread until it swarmed nightly with white people from all over the world. The tourist buses came there, the Cotton Club catered to whites only, and hundreds of other clubs ranging on down to seller speakeasies catered to white people's money. 
Some of the best known were Connie's Inn, The Lennox Club, Barron's, The Nest Club, Jimmy's Chicken Shack, and Minton's. The Savoy, The Golden Gate, and the Renaissance Ballrooms battled for the crowds. The Savoy introduced such attractions as Thursday Kitchen Mechanics Nights, Bathing Beauty Contests, and a new car given away each Saturday night. They had bands from all across the country in the ballrooms and the Apollo and Lafayette theaters. They had colorful band leaders like Fess Williams in his diamond-studded suit and top hat and Cab Calloway in his white zoot suit to end all zoots and his wide-brimmed white hat and string tie setting Harlem afire with Tiger Rag and St. James Infirmary and Minnie the Moocher. Blacktown crawled with white people, with pimps, prostitutes, bootleggers, with hustlers of all kinds, with colorful characters, and with police and prohibition agents. Negroes danced like they never have anywhere before or since. I guess I must have heard 25 of the old timers in Smalls swear to me that they had been the first to dance in the Savoy, the Lindy Hop, which was born there in 1927, named for Lindbergh, who had just made his flight to Paris. Even the little cellar places with only piano space had fabulous keyboard artists such as James P. Johnson and Jelly Roll Morton and singers such as Ethel Waters. And at 4 a.m., when all the legitimate clubs had to close, from all over town, the white and Negro musicians would come to some prearranged Harlem after-hour spot and have 30- and 40-piece jam sessions that would last into the next day. When it all ended with the stock market crash in 1929, Harlem had a world reputation as America's CASBA. Smalls had been a part of all that. There, I heard the old-timers reminisce about all those great times. Every day, I listened raptly to customers who felt like talking, and it all added to my education. My ears soaked it up like sponges when one of them, in a rare burst of confidence, or a little beyond his usual number of drinks, would tell me inside things about the particular form of hustling that he pursued as a way of life. I was thus schooled well by experts in such hustles as the numbers, pimping, con games of many kinds, peddling dope, and thievery of all sorts, including armed robbery. Chapter 6. Detroit Red. Every day, I would gamble all of my tips, as high as $15 and $20, on the numbers and dream of what I would do when I hit. I saw people on their long, wild spending sprees after big hits. I don't mean just hustlers who always had some money. I mean ordinary working people, the kind that we otherwise almost never saw in a bar like Smalls, who, with a good enough hit, had quit their jobs working somewhere downtown for the white man. Often they had bought a Cadillac, and sometimes for three and four days, they were setting up drinks and buying steaks for all their friends. I would have to pull two tables together into one, and they would be throwing me two and three dollar tips each time I came with my tray. Hundreds of thousands of New York City Negroes every day but Sunday would play from a penny on up to large sums on three-digit numbers. A hit meant duplicating the last three figures of the stock exchange's printed daily total of U.S. domestic and foreign sales. With the odds at 600 to 1, a penny hit won $6, a dollar won $600, and so on. On $15, the hit would mean $9,000. Famous hits like that had bought controlling interests in lots of Harlem's bars and restaurants, or even bought some of them outright. The chances of hitting were a thousand to one. Many players practiced what was called combinating. For example, six cents would put one penny on each of the six possible combinations of three digits. The number 840 combinated would include 840, 804, 048, 084, 408, and 480. Practically everyone played every day in the poverty-ridden black ghetto of Harlem. Every day, someone you knew was likely to hit, and of course it was neighborhood news, if big enough a hit, neighborhood excitement. Hits generally were small, a nickel, dime, or a quarter. Most people tried to play a dollar a day, but split it up among different numbers and combinated. Harlem's numbers industry hummed every morning and into the early afternoon, with the runners jotting down people's bets on slips of paper in apartment house hallways, bars, barbershops, stores, on the sidewalks. The cops looked on. No runner lasted long who didn't, out of his pocket, put in a free figure for his working area's foot cops, and it was generally known that the numbers bankers paid off at higher levels of the police department. The daily small army of runners each got 10% of the money they turned in, along with the bet slips, to their controllers. And if you hit, you gave the runner a 10% tip. 
a controller might have as many as 50 runners working for him, and the controller got 5% of what he turned over to the banker, who paid off the hit, paid off the police, and got rich off the balance. Some people played one number all year. Many had lists of the daily hit numbers going back for years. They figured reappearance odds and used other systems. Others played their hunches, addresses, license numbers of passing cars, any numbers on letters, telegrams, laundry slips, numbers from anywhere. Dream books that cost a dollar would say what number nearly any dream suggested. Evangelists who on Sundays peddled Jesus and mystics would pray a lucky number for you for a fee. Recently, the last three numbers of the post office's new zip code for a postal district of Harlem hit, and one banker almost went broke. Let this very book circulate widely in the black ghettos of the country. And, although I'm no longer a gambling person, I'd lay a small wager for your favorite charity that millions of dollars would be bet by my poor, foolish black brothers and sisters upon, say, whatever happens to be the number of this page, or whatever is the total of the whole book's pages. Every day in Small's Paradise Bar was fascinating to me, and from a Harlem point of view, I couldn't have been in a more educational situation. Some of the ablest of New York's black hustlers took a liking to me, and knowing that I still was green by their terms, soon began in a paternal way to straighten red out. Their methods would be indirect. A dark, businessman-looking West Indian often would sit at one of my tables. One day when I brought his beer, he said, Red, hold still a minute. He went over me with one of those yellow tape measures and jotted figures in his notebook. When I came to work the next afternoon, one of the bartenders handed me a package. In it was an expensive, dark blue suit, conservatively cut. The gift was thoughtful and the message clear. The bartenders let me know that this customer was one of the top executives of the fabulous 40 Thieves gang. That was the gang of organized boosters who would deliver to order in one day COD, any kind of garment you desired. You would pay about one third of the store's price. I heard how they made mass halls. A well dressed member of the gang who wouldn't arouse suspicion by his manner would go into a selected store about closing time, hide somewhere, and get locked inside when the store closed. The police patrols would have been timed beforehand. After dark, he'd pack suits and bags, then turn off the burglar alarm and use the telephone to call a waiting truck and crew. When the truck came, timed with the police patrols, it would be loaded and gone within a few minutes. I later got to know several members of the 40 Thieves. Plainclothes detectives soon were quietly identified to me by a nod, a wink. Knowing the law people in the area was elementary for the hustlers, and like them, in time I would learn to sense the presence of any police types. In late 1942, each of the military services had their civilian dress eyes and ears, picking up anything of interest to them such as hustles being used to avoid the draft or who hadn't registered or hustles that were being worked on servicemen. Longshoremen, or fences for them, would come into the bars selling guns, cameras, perfumes, watches, and the like stolen from the shipping docks. These Negroes got what white longshoremen thievery left over. Merchant Marine sailors often brought in foreign items, bargains, and the best marijuana cigarettes to be had were made of the gunja and kiska that merchant sailors smuggled in from Africa and Persia. In the daytime, whites were given a guarded treatment. Whites who came at night got a better reception. The several Harlem nightclubs they patronized were geared to entertain and jive the night white crowd to get their money. I'd turn up in towns where my friends were playing. Red. I was an old friend from home. In the sticks, I was somebody from the Braddock Hotel. And with so many law agencies guarding the morals of servicemen, any of them that came in, and a lot did, were given what they asked for and were spoken to if they spoke. And that was all, unless someone knew them as natives of Harlem. I'd turn up in towns where my friends were playing. Red. I was an old friend from home. In the sticks, I was somebody from the Braddock Hotel. What I was learning was the hustling society's first rule, that you never trusted anyone outside of your own close mouth circle, and that you selected with time and care before you made any intimates even among these. The bartenders would let me know which among the regular customers were mostly fronts, and which really had something going which were really in the underworld with downtown police or political connections, which really handled some money and which were making it from day to day, which were the real gamblers and which had just hit a little luck and which ones never to run afoul of in any way. The latter were extremely well known about Harlem and they were feared and respected. It was known that if upset, they would break open your head and think nothing of it. These were old timers, 
not to be confused with the various hot-headed, wild young hustlers out trying to make a name for themselves for being crazy with a pistol trigger or a knife. The old heads that I'm talking about were such as Black Sammy, Bub Hewlett, King Padmore, and West Indian Archie. Most of these tough ones had worked as strong-arm men for Dutch Schultz back when he muscled into the Harlem numbers industry after white gangsters had awakened to the fortunes being made in what they had previously considered nigger pennies. And the numbers game was referred to by the white racketeers as nigger pool. Those tough Negroes' heyday had been before the big 1931 Seabury investigation that started Dutch Schultz on the way out until his career ended with his 1934 assassination. I heard stories of how they had persuaded people with lead pipes, wet cement, baseball bats, brass knuckles, fists, feet, and blackjacks. Nearly every one of them had done some time and had come back on the scene and since had worked as top runners for the biggest bankers who specialized in large betters. There seemed to be an understanding that these Negroes and the tough black cops never clashed. I guess both knew that someone would die. They had some bad black cops in Harlem, too. The four horsemen that worked Sugar Hill, I remember the worst one had freckles. There was a tough quartet. The biggest, blackest, worst cop of them all in Harlem was the West Indian, Brisbane. Negroes crossed the street to avoid him when he walked his 125th Street and 7th Avenue beat. When I was in prison, someone brought me a story that Brisbane had been shot to death by a scared, nervous young kid who hadn't been up from the South long enough to realize how bad Brisbane was. The world's mostly unlikely pimp was Cadillac Drake. He was shiny bald-headed, built like a football. He used to call his huge belly the Chippy's Playground. Cadillac had a string of about a dozen of the stringiest, scrawniest, black and white street prostitutes in Harlem. Afternoons around the bar, the old timers who knew Cadillac well enough would tease him about how women who looked like his made enough to feed themselves, let alone him. He'd roar with laughter right along with us. I can hear him now. Bad looking women work harder. Just about the complete opposite of Cadillac was the young, smooth, independent acting pimp, Sammy the Pimp. He could, as I have mentioned, pick out potential prostitutes by watching their expressions in dance halls. Sammy and I became, in time, each other's closest friend. Sammy, who was from Kentucky, was a cool, collected expert in his business, and his business was women. Like Cadillac, he too had both black and white women out making his living, but Sammy's women, who would come into smalls sometimes looking for him to give him money and have him buy them a drink were about as beautiful as any prostitutes who operated anywhere, I'd imagine. One of his white women, known as Alabama Peach, a blonde, could put everybody in stitches with her drawl. Even the several Negro women numbers controllers around Smalls really liked her. What made a lot of Negroes around the bar laugh the hardest was the way she would take three syllables to say nigger. But what she usually was saying was, I just lu uv ni ugus. Give her two drinks and she would tell her life story in a minute, how in whatever little Alabama town it was she came from, the first thing she remembered being conscious of was that she was supposed to hate niggers. And then she started hearing older girls in grade school whispering the hush-hush that niggers were such sexual giants and athletes, and she started growing up secretly wanting to try one. Finally, right in her own house, with her family away, she threatened a Negro man who worked for her father that if he didn't take her, she would swear he tried rape. He had no choice, except that he quit working for them. And from then, until she finished high school, she managed it several times with other Negroes, and she somehow came to New York and went straight to Harlem. Later on, Sammy told me how he had happened to spot her in the Savoy, not even dancing with anybody, just standing on the sidelines, watching, and he could tell. And once she really went for Negroes, the more the better. Sammy said, and wouldn't have a white man. I have wondered whatever became of her. There was a big fat pimp we called Dollar Bill. He loved to flash his Kansas City roll, probably $51 bills folded with a 20 on the inside and a $100 bill on the outside. We always wondered what Dollar Bill would do if someone ever stole his $100 cover. A man who, in his prime, could have stolen Dollar Bill's whole roll, blindfolded, was threadbare, comic old few clothes. Few clothes had been one of the best pickpockets in Harlem back when the white people swarmed up every night in the 1920s. But then during the Depression, he had contracted a bad case of arthritis in his hands. 
His finger joints were knotted and gnarled so that it made people uncomfortable to look at them. Rain, sleet, or snow, every afternoon, about six, few clothes would be at Smalls, telling tall tales about the old days, and it was one of the day's rituals for one or another regular customer to ask the bartender to give him drinks and me to feed him. My heart goes out to all of us who, in those afternoons at Smalls, enacted our scene with few clothes. I wish you could have seen him, pleasantly high with drinks, take his seat with dignity, no begging, not on anybody's welfare, and open his napkin and study the day's menu that I gave him and place his order. I'd tell the cooks it was few clothes, and he'd get the best in the house. I'd go back and serve it as though he were a millionaire. Many times since, I have thought about it and what it really meant. In one sense, we were huddled in there, bonded together and seeking security and warmth and comfort from each other, and we didn't know it. All of us, who might have probed space or cured cancer or built industries, were instead black victims of the white man's American social system. In another sense, the tragedy of the once master pickpocket made him, for those brother old-timer hustlers, a there but for the grace of God symbol. To wolves who still were able to catch some rabbits, it had meaning that an old wolf who had lost his fangs was still eating. Then there was the burglar, jump steady. In the ghettos the white man has built for us, he has forced us not to aspire to greater things, but to view everyday living as survival. And in that kind of a community, survival is what is respected. In any average white neighborhood bar, you couldn't imagine a known catman thief regularly exposing himself as one of the most popular people in there. But if Jumpsteady missed a few days running in Smalls, we would begin inquiring for him. Jumpsteady was called that because, it was said, when he worked in white residential areas downtown, he jumped from roof to roof and was so steady that he maneuvered along window ledges, leaning, balancing, edging with his toes. If he fell, he'd have been dead. He got into apartments through windows. It was said that he was so cool that he had stolen even with people in the next room. I later found out that Jumpsteady always keyed himself up high on dope when he worked. He taught me some things that I was to employ in later years when hard times would force me to have my own burglary ring. I should stress that Smalls wasn't any nest of criminals. I dwell upon the hustlers because it was their world that fascinated me. Actually, for the nightlife crowd, Smalls was one of Harlem's two or three most decorous night spots. In fact, the New York City Police Department recommended Smalls to white people who would ask for a safe place in Harlem. The first room I got after I left the railroad, half of Harlem roomed, was in the 800 block of St. Nicholas Avenue. You could walk into one or another room in this house and get a hot fur coat, a good camera, fine perfume, a gun, anything from hot women to hot cars, even hot ice. I was one of the very few males in this rooming house. This was during the war when you couldn't turn on the radio and not hear about Guadalcanal or North Africa. In several of the apartments, the women tenants were prostitutes. The minority were in some other racket or hustle, boosters, numbers runners, or dope peddlers. And I'd guess that everyone who lived in the house used dope of some kind. This shouldn't reflect too badly on that particular building because almost everyone in Harlem needed some kind of hustle to survive and needed to stay high in some way to forget what they had to do to survive. It was in this house that I learned more about women than I ever did in any other single place. It was these working prostitutes who schooled me to things that every wife and every husband should know. Later on, it was chiefly the women who weren't prostitutes who taught me to be very distrustful of most women. There seemed to be a higher code of ethics and sisterliness among those prostitutes than among numerous ladies of the church who have more men for kicks than the prostitutes have for pay. And I am talking about both black and white. Many of the black ones in those wartime days were right in step with the white ones in having husbands fighting overseas while they were laying up with other men, even giving them their husband's money. And many women just faked as mothers and wives while playing the field as hard as prostitutes with their husbands and children right there in New York. I got my first schooling about the cesspool morals of the white man from the best possible source, from his own women. And then as I got deeper into my own life of evil, I saw the white man's morals with my own eyes. I even made my living helping to guide him to the sick things he wanted. I was young, working in the bar, not bothering with these women. Probably I touched their kid brother instincts, something like that. Some would drop into my room when they weren't busy, and we would smoke reefers and talk. It generally would be after their morning rush. But let me tell you about that rush. 
Seeing the hallways and stairs busy any hour of the night with white and black men coming and going was no more than one would expect when one lived in a building out of which prostitutes were working. But what astonished me was the full house crowd that rushed in between, say, 6 and 7.30 in the morning, then rushed away, and by about 9, I would be the only man in the house. It was husbands who had left home in time to stop by this St. Nicholas Avenue house before they went on to work. Of course, not the same ones every day, but always enough of them to make up the rush. And it included white men who had come in cabs all the way up from downtown domineering, complaining, demanding wives who had just about psychologically castrated their husbands were responsible for the early rush. These wives were so disagreeable and had made their men so tense that they were robbed of the satisfaction of being men. To escape this tension and the chance of being ridiculed by his own wife, each of these men had gotten up early and come to a prostitute. The prostitutes had to make it their business to be students of men. They said that after most men passed their virile 20s, they went to bed mainly to satisfy their egos. And because a lot of women don't understand it that way, they damage and wreck a man's ego. No matter how little virility a man has to offer, prostitutes make him feel for a time that he is the greatest man in the world. That's why these prostitutes had that morning rush of business. More wives could keep their husbands if they realized their greatest urge is to be men. Those women would tell me anything. Funny little stories about the bedroom differences they saw between white and black men. The perversities. I thought I had heard the whole range of perversities until I later became a steerer, taking white men to what they wanted. Everyone in the house laughed about the little Italian fellow whom they called the $10 a minute man. He came without fail every noontime from his little basement restaurant up near the polo grounds. The joke was he never lasted more than two minutes, but he always left $20. Most men, the prostitutes felt, were too easy to push around. Every day, these prostitutes heard their customers complaining that they never heard anything but griping from women who were being taken care of and given everything. The prostitutes said that most men needed to know what the pimps knew. A woman should occasionally be babied enough to show her the man had affection, but beyond that, she should be treated firmly. These tough women said that it worked with them. All women, by their nature, are fragile and weak. They are attracted to the male in whom they see strength. From time to time, Sophia would come over to see me from Boston. Even among Harlem Negroes, her looks gave me status. They were just like the Negroes everywhere else. That was why the white prostitutes made so much money. It didn't make any difference if you were in Lansing, Boston, or New York. What the white racist said, and still says, was right in those days. All you had to do was put a white girl anywhere close to the average black man, and he would respond. The black woman also made the white man's eyes light up, but he was slick enough to hide it. Sophia would come in on a late afternoon train. She would come to Smalls, and I'd introduce her around until I got off from work. She was bothered about me living among the prostitutes until I introduced her to some of them, and they talked, and she thought they were great. They would tell her they were keeping me straight for her. We would go to the Braddock Hotel bar, where we would meet some of the musicians who now would greet me like an old friend. Hey, Red, who have we got here? They would make a big deal over her. I couldn't even think about buying a drink. No Negroes in the world were more white woman crazy in those days than most of those musicians. People in show business, of course, were less inhibited by social and racial taboos. The white racist won't tell you that it also works in reverse. When it got late, Sophia and I would go to some of the after-hours places and speakeasies. When the downtown nightclubs had closed, most of these Harlem places crawled with white people. These whites were just mad for Negro atmosphere, especially some of the places which had what you might call Negro soul. Sometimes Negroes would talk about how a lot of whites seemed unable to have enough of being close around us and among us in groups. Both white men and women, it seemed, would get almost mesmerized by Negroes. I remember one really peculiar case of this, a white girl who never missed a single night in the Savoy Ballroom. She fascinated my friend Sammy. He had watched her several times. Dancing only with Negroes, she seemed to go nearly into a trance. If a white man asked her to dance, she would refuse. Then when the place was ready to close, early in the morning, she would let a Negro take her as far as the subway entrance. And that was it. She never would tell anyone her name, let alone reveal where she lived. Now, I'll tell you another peculiar case that worked out differently and which taught me something I have since learned in a thousand other ways. 
This was my best early lesson in how most white men's hearts and guts will turn over inside of them, whatever they may have you otherwise believe, whenever they see a Negro man on close terms with a white woman. A few of the white men around Harlem, younger ones whom we called hippies, acted more Negro than Negroes. This particular one talked more hip talk than we did. He would have fought anyone who suggested he felt any race difference. Musicians around the Braddock could hardly move without falling over him. Every time I saw him, it was, Daddy, come on, let's get our heads tight. Sammy couldn't stand him. He was underfoot wherever you went. He even wore a wild zoot suit, used a heavy grease in his hair to make it look like a conch, and he wore the knob-toed shoes, the long swinging chain, everything. And he not only wouldn't be seen with any woman but a black one, but in fact, he lived with two of them in the same little apartment. I never was sure how they worked that one out, but I had my idea. About three or four o'clock one morning, we ran into this white boy in Creole Bill's speakeasy. He was high, in that marijuana glow where the world relaxes. I introduced Sophia. I went away to say hello to someone else. When I returned, Sophia looked peculiar, but she wouldn't tell me until we left. He had asked her, why is a white girl like you throwing yourself away with a spade? Creole Bill, naturally you know he was from New Orleans, became another good friend of mine. After Smalls closed, I'd bring fast-spending white people who still wanted some drinking action to Creel Bill's speakeasy. That was my earliest experience at steering. The speakeasy was only Creel Bill's apartment. I think a partition had been knocked out to make the living room larger. But the atmosphere, plus the food, made the place one of Harlem's soul spots. A record player maintained the right soft music there was any kind of drink, and Bill sold plates of his spicy, delicious Creole dishes, gumbo, jambalaya. Bill's girlfriend, a beautiful black girl, served the customers. Bill called her brown sugar, and finally everyone else did. If a good number of customers were to be served at one time, Creole Bill would bring out some pots, brown sugar would bring the plates, and Bill would serve everyone big platefuls, and he'd heap a plate for himself and eat with us. It was a treat to watch him eat, he loved his food so. It was good. Bill could cook rice like the Chinese. I mean, rice that stood every grain on its own. But I never knew the Chinese to do what Bill could with seafood and beans. Bill made money enough in that apartment speakeasy to open up a Creole restaurant famous in Harlem. He was a great baseball fan. All over the walls were framed, autographed photographs of major league stars and also some political and show business celebrities who would come there to eat, bringing friends. I wonder what's become of Creole Bill. His place is sold, and I haven't heard anything of him. I must remember to ask some of the 7th Avenue old-timers who would know. Once, when I called Sophia in Boston, she said she couldn't get away until the following weekend. She had just married some well-to-do Boston white fellow. He was in the service, he had been home on leave, and he had just gone back. She didn't mean it to change a thing between us. I told her it made no difference. I had, of course, introduced Sophia to my friend Sammy and we had gone out together some nights, and Sammy and I had thoroughly discussed the black man and white woman psychology. I had Sammy to thank that I was entirely prepared for Sophia's marriage. Sammy said that white women were very practical. He had heard so many of them express how they felt. They knew that the black man had all the strikes against him, that the white man kept the black man down under his heel, unable to get anywhere, really. The white woman wanted to be comfortable. She wanted to be looked upon with favor by her own kind, but also she wanted to have her pleasure. So some of them just married a white man for convenience and security and kept right on going with a Negro. It wasn't that they were necessarily in love with the Negro, but they were in love with lust, particularly taboo lust. A white man was not too unusual if he had a 10, 20, 30, 40, or $50,000 a year job. A Negro man who made even 5000 in the white man's world was unusual. The white woman with a Negro man would be with him for one of two reasons, either extremely insane love or to satisfy her lust. When I had been around Harlem long enough to show signs of permanence, inevitably I got a nickname that would identify me beyond any confusion with two other red-conked and well-known reds who were around. I had met them both. In fact, later on, I'd work with them both. One. St. Louis Red was a professional armed robber. When I was sent to prison, he was serving time for trying to stick up a dining car steward on a train between New York and Philadelphia. He was finally freed. Now, I hear, he is in prison for a New York City jewel robbery. The other was Chicago Red. We became good buddies in a speakeasy, 
where later on I was a waiter. Chicago Red was the funniest dishwasher on this earth. Now he's making his living being funny as a nationally known stage and nightclub comedian. I don't see any reason why old Chicago Red would mind me telling that he is Red Fox. Anyway, before long, my nickname happened. Just when, I don't know, but people knowing I was from Michigan would ask me what city. Since most New Yorkers had never heard of Lansing, I would name Detroit. Gradually, I began to be called Detroit Red, and it stuck. One afternoon in early 1943, before the regular six o'clock crowd had gathered, a black soldier sat drinking by himself at one of my tables. He must have been there an hour or more. He looked dumb and pitiful and just up from the deep south. The fourth or fifth drink I served the soldier, wiping the table I bent over close and asked him if he wanted a woman. I knew better. It wasn't only Small's Paradise Law, it was the law of every tavern that wanted to stay in business, never get involved with anything that could be interpreted as impairing the morals of servicemen or any kind of hustling off them. This had caused trouble for dozens of places. Some had been put off limits by the military. Some had lost their state or city licenses. I played right into the hands of a military spy. He sure would like a woman. He acted so grateful. He even put on an extreme Southern accent. And I gave him the phone number of one of my best friends among the prostitutes where I lived. But something felt wrong. I gave the fellow a half hour to get there, and then I telephoned. I expected the answer I got, that no soldier had been there. I didn't even bother to go back out to the bar. I just went straight to Charlie Small's office. I just did something, Charlie, I said. I don't know why I did it. And I told him. Charlie looked at me. I wish you hadn't done that, Red. We both knew what he meant. When the West Indian plainclothes detective Joe Baker came in, I was waiting. I didn't even ask him any questions. When we got to the 135th Street precinct, it was busy with police in uniform and MPs with soldiers in tow. I was recognized by some other detectives who, like Joe Baker, sometimes dropped in at Smalls. Two things were in my favor. I'd never given the police any trouble. And when that black spy soldier had tried to tip me, I had waved it away, telling him I was just doing him a favor. They must have agreed that Joe Baker should just scare me. I didn't know enough to be aware that I wasn't taken to the desk and booked. Joe Baker took me back inside of the precinct building into a small room. In the next room, we could hear somebody getting whipped. Whoop! Whoop! He'd cry out, please, please don't beat my face. That's how I make my living. I knew from that it was some pimp. Whoop! Whoop! Please, please. Not much later, I heard that Joe Baker had gotten trapped over in New Jersey, shaking down a Negro pimp and his white prostitute. He was discharged from the New York City Police Force. The state of New Jersey convicted him, and he went off to do some time. More bitter than getting fired, I was barred from Smalls. I could understand. Even if I wasn't actually what was called hot, I was now going to be under surveillance, and the Small brothers had to protect their business. Sammy proved to be my friend in need. He put the word on the wire for me to come over to his place. I had never been there. His place seemed to me a small palace. His women really kept him in style. While we talked about what kind of a hustle I should get into, Sammy gave me some of the best marijuana I'd ever used. Various numbers controllers, Smalls regulars, had offered me jobs as a runner, but that meant I would earn very little until I could build up a clientele. Pimping, as Sammy did, was out. I felt I had no abilities in that direction and that I'd certainly starve to death trying to recruit prostitutes. Peddling reefers, Sammy and I pretty soon agreed, was the best thing. It was a relatively uninvolved lone wolf type of operation and one in which I could make money immediately. For anyone with even a little brains, no experience was needed, especially if one had any knack at all with people. Both Sammy and I knew some merchant seamen and others who could supply me with loose marijuana and musicians, among whom I had so many good contacts, were the heaviest consistent market for reefers. And then, musicians also used the heavier narcotics if I later wanted to graduate to them. That would be more risky, but also more money. Handling heroin and cocaine could earn one hundreds of dollars a day, but it required a lot of experience with the narcotics squad for one to be able to last long enough to make anything. I had been around long enough either to know or to spot instinctively most regular detectives and cops, though not the narcotics people. And among the Smalls veteran hustler regulars, I had a variety of potentially helpful contacts. This was important because just as Sammy could get me supplied with marijuana, a large facet of any hustler's success was knowing where he could get help when he needed it. The help could involve police and detectives, as well as higher-ups, but I hadn't yet reached that stage. 
So Sammy staked me about $20, I think it was. Later that same night, I knocked at his door and gave him back his money and asked him if I could lend him some. I had gone straight from Sammy's to a supplier he had mentioned. I got just a small amount of marijuana, and I got some of the paper to roll up my own sticks. As they were only about the size of stick matches, I was able to make enough of them so that after selling them to musicians I knew at the Braddock Hotel, I could pay back Sammy and have enough profit to be in business. And those musicians, when they saw their buddy and their fan in business, my man, Crazy Red, in every band, at least half of the musicians smoked reefers. I'm not going to list names. I'd have to include some of those most prominent then in popular music, even a number of them around today. In one case, every man in one of the bands, which is still famous, was on marijuana. Or again, any number of musicians could tell you who I mean when I say that one of the most famous singers smoked his reefers through a chicken thigh bone. He had smoked so many through the bone that he could just light a match before the empty bone, draw the heat through, and get what he called a contact high. I kept turning over my profit, increasing my supplies, and I sold reefers like a wild man. I scarcely slept. I was wherever musicians congregated. A roll of money was in my pocket. Every day, I cleared at least 50 or $60. In those days, or for that matter these days, this was a fortune to a 17-year-old Negro. I felt for the first time in my life that great feeling of free. Suddenly now, I was the peer of the other young hustlers I had admired. It was at this time that I discovered the movies. Sometimes I made as many as five in one day, both downtown and in Harlem. I loved the tough guys, the action, Humphrey Bogart and Casablanca, and I loved all of that dancing and carrying on in such films as Stormy Weather and Cabin in the Sky. After leaving the movies, I'd make my connections for supplies, then roll my sticks, and about dark, I'd start my rounds. I'd give a couple of extra sticks when someone bought 10, which was $5 worth, and I didn't sell and run because my customers were my friends. Often I'd smoke along with them. None of them stayed any more high than I did. Free now to do what I pleased. Upon an impulse, I went to Boston. Of course, I saw Ella. I gave her some money. It was just a token of appreciation, I told her, for helping me when I had come from Lansing. She wasn't the same old Ella. She still hadn't forgiven me for Laura. She never mentioned her, nor did I. But even so, Ella acted better than she had when I had left for New York. We reviewed the family changes. Wilford had proved so good at his trade, they had asked him to stay on at Wilberforce as an instructor. And Ella had gotten a card from Reginald, who had managed to get into the Merchant Marine. From Shorty's apartment, I called Sophia. She met me at the apartment just about as Shorty went off to work. I would have liked to take her out to some of the Roxbury clubs, but Shorty had told us that, as in New York, the Boston cops used the war as an excuse to harass interracial couples, stopping them and grilling the Negro about his draft status. Of course, Sophia's now being married made us more cautious, too. When Sophia caught a cab home, I went to hear Shorty's band. Yes, he had a band now. He had succeeded in getting a 4F classification, and I was pleased for him and happy to go. His band was, well, fair. But Shorty was making out well in Boston, playing in small clubs. Back in the apartment, we talked into the next day. Homeboy, you're something else, Shorty kept saying. I told him some of the wild things I'd done in Harlem and about the friends I had. I told him the story of Sammy the Pimp. In Sammy's native Paducah, Kentucky, he had gotten a girl pregnant. Her parents made it so hot that Sammy had come to Harlem, where he got a job as a restaurant waiter. When a woman came in to eat alone, and he found she really was alone, not married, or living with somebody, it generally was not hard for smooth Sammy to get invited to her apartment. He'd insist on going out to a nearby restaurant to bring back some dinner, and while he was out, he would have her key duplicated. Then, when he knew she was away, Sammy would go in and clean out all her valuables. Sammy was then able to offer some little steak to help her back on her feet. This could be the beginning of an emotional and financial dependency, which Sammy knew how to develop until she was his virtual slave. Around Harlem, the narcotic squad detectives didn't take long to find out I was selling reefers, and occasionally one of them would follow me. Many a peddler was in jail because he had been caught with the evidence on his person. I figured a way to avoid that. The law specified that if the evidence wasn't actually in your possession, you couldn't be arrested. Hollowed out shoe heels, fake hat linings, these things were old stuff to the detectives. 
I carried about 50 sticks in a small package inside my coat, under my armpit, keeping my arm flat against my side. Moving about, I kept my eyes open. If anybody looked suspicious, I'd quickly cross the street or go through a door or turn a corner, loosening my arm enough to let the package drop. At night, when I usually did my selling, any suspicious person wouldn't be likely to see the trick. If I decided I had been mistaken, I'd go back and get my sticks. However, I lost many a stick this way. Sometimes I knew I had frustrated a detective and I kept out of the courts. One morning though, I came in and found signs that my room had been entered. I knew it had been detectives. I'd heard too many times how if they couldn't find any evidence, they would plant some where you would never find it. Then they'd come back in and find it. I didn't even have to think twice what to do. I packed my few belongings and never looked back. When I went to sleep again, it was in another room. It was then that I began carrying a little 25 automatic. I got it for some reefers from an addict who I knew had stolen it somewhere. I carried it pressed under my belt right down the center of my back. Someone had told me that the cops never hit there in any routine patting down. And unless I knew who I was with, I never allowed myself to get caught in any crush of people. The narcotics cops had been known to rush up and get their hands on you and plant evidence while searching. I felt that as long as I kept on the go and in the open, I had a good chance. I don't know now what my real thoughts were about carrying the pistol, but I imagine I felt that I wasn't going to get put away if somebody tried framing me in any situation that I could help. I sold less than before because having to be so careful consumed so much time. Every now and then, on a hunch, I'd move to another room. I told nobody but Sammy where I slept. Finally, it was on the wire that the Harlem Narcotics Squad had me on its special list. Now, every other day or so, usually in some public place, they would flash the badge to search me. But I'd tell them at once, loud enough for others standing about to hear me, that I had nothing on me and I didn't want to get anything planted on me. Then they wouldn't, because Harlem already thought little enough of the law. And they did have to be careful that some crowd of Negroes would not intervene roughly. Negroes were starting to get very tense in Harlem. One could almost smell trouble ready to break out, as it did very soon. But it was really tough on me then. I was having to hide my sticks in various places near where I was selling. I'd put five sticks in an empty cigarette pack and drop the empty looking pack by a lamp post or behind a garbage can or a box. And I'd first tell customers to pay me and then where to pick up. But my regular customers didn't go for that. You couldn't expect a well-known musician to go grubbing behind a garbage can. So I began to pick up some of the street trade. The people you could see looked high. I collected a number of empty Red Cross bandage boxes and used them for drops. That worked pretty good. But the Middle Harlem Narcotics Force found so many ways to harass me that I had to change my area. I moved down to Lower Harlem, around 110th Street. There were many more reefer smokers around there, but these were a cheaper type. This was the worst of the ghetto, the poorest people, the ones who in every ghetto keep themselves narcotized to keep from having to face their miserable existence. I didn't last long down there either. I lost too much of my product. After I sold to some of those reefer smokers who had the instincts of animals, they followed me and learned my pattern. They would dart out of a doorway, I'd drop my stuff, and they would be on it like a chicken on corn. When you become an animal, a vulture, in the ghetto, as I had become, you enter a world of animals and vultures. It becomes truly the survival of only the fittest. Soon I found myself borrowing little stakes from Sammy, from some of the musicians. Enough to buy supplies, enough to keep high myself, enough sometimes to just eat. Then Sammy gave me an idea. Red, you still got your old railroad identification? I did have it. They hadn't taken it back. Well, why don't you use it to make a few runs until the heat cools? He was right. I found that if you walked up and showed a railroad line's employee identification card, the conductor, even a real cracker, if you approached him right, not begging, would just wave you aboard. And when he came around, he would punch you one of those little coach seat slips to ride wherever the train went. Ever the, the idea came to me that this way, I could travel all over the East Coast selling reefers among my friends who were on tour with their bands. I had the New Haven identification. I worked a couple of weeks for other railroads to get their identification, and then I was set. In New York, I rolled and packed a great quantity of sticks and sealed them into jars. The identification card worked perfectly. If you persuaded the conductor you were a fellow employee who had to go home on some family business, 
He just did the favor for you without a second thought. Most whites don't give a Negro credit for having sense enough to fool them, or nerve enough. I'd turn up in towns where my friends were playing. Red! I was an old friend from home. In the sticks, I was somebody from the Braddock Hotel. My man! Daddy-o! And I had big apple reefers. Nobody had ever heard of a traveling reefer peddler. I followed no particular band. Each band's musicians knew the other band's one-nighter touring schedules. When I ran out of supplies, I'd return to New York and load up, then hit the road again. Auditoriums or gymnasiums all lighted up, the band's chartered bus outside, the dressed-up, excited local dancers pouring in. At the door, I'd announce that I was some bandman's brother. In most cases, they thought I was one of the musicians. Throughout the dance, I'd show the country folks some plain and fancy lindy hopping. Sometimes I'd stay overnight in a town. Sometimes I'd ride the band's bus to their next stop. Sometimes back in New York, I would stay a while. Things had cooled down. Word was around that I had left town, and the narcotics squad was satisfied with that. In some of the small towns, people thinking I was with the band even mobbed me for autographs. Once, in Buffalo, my suit was nearly torn off. My brother Reginald was waiting for me one day when I pulled into New York. The day before, his merchant ship had put into port over in New Jersey. Thinking I still worked at Smalls, Reginald had gone there, and the bartenders had directed him to Sammy, who put him up. It felt good to see my brother. It was hard to believe that he was once the little kid who tagged after me. Reginald now was almost six feet tall, but still a few inches shorter than me. His complexion was darker than mine, but he had greenish eyes and a white streak in his hair, which was otherwise dark reddish, something like mine. I took Reginald everywhere, introducing him. Studying my brother, I liked him. He was a lot more self-possessed than I had been at 16. I didn't have a room right at the time, but I had some money, so did Reginald, and we checked into the St. Nicholas Hotel on Sugar Hill. It has since been torn down. Reginald and I talked all night about the Lansing years, about our family. I told him things about our father and mother that he couldn't remember. Then Reginald filled me in on our brothers and sisters. Wilfred was still a trade instructor at Wilberforce University. Hilda, still in Lansing, was talking of getting married. So was Filbert. Reginald and I were the next two in line, and Yvonne, Wesley, and Robert were still in Lansing in school. Reginald and I laughed about Filbert, who, the last time I had seen him, had gotten deeply religious. He wore one of those round straw hats. Reginald's ship was in for about a week getting some kind of repairs on its engines. I was pleased to see that Reginald, though he said little about it, admired my living by my wits. Reginald dressed a little too loudly, I thought. I got a reefer customer of mine to get him a more conservative overcoat and suit. I told Reginald what I had learned, that in order to get something, you had to look as though you already had something. Before Reginald left, I urged him to leave the Merchant Marine, and I would help him get started in Harlem. I must have felt that having my kid brother around me would be a good thing. Then there would be two people I could trust. Sammy was the other. Reginald was cool. At his age, I would have been willing to run behind the train to get to New York and to Harlem. But Reginald, when he left, said, I'll think about it. Not long after Reginald left, I dragged out the wildest zoot suit in New York. This was 1943. The Boston Draft Board had written me at Ella's, and when they had no results there, had notified the New York Draft Board, and in care of Sammy, I received Uncle Sam's greetings. In those days, only three things in the world scared me. Jail, a job, and the army. I had about 10 days before I was to show up at the induction center. I went right to work. The army intelligence soldiers, those black spies in civilian clothes, hung around in Harlem with their ears open for the white man downtown. I knew exactly where to start dropping the word. I started noising around that I was frantic to join the Japanese army. When I sensed that I had the ears of the spies, I would talk and act high and crazy. A lot of Harlem hustlers actually had reached that state, as I would later. It was inevitable when one had gone long enough on heavier and heavier narcotics and under the steadily tightening vice of the hustling life. I'd snatch out and read my greetings aloud to make certain they heard who I was and when I'd report downtown. This was probably the only time my real name was ever heard in Harlem in those days. The day I went down there, I costumed like an actor. With my wild zoot suit, I wore the yellow knob toe shoes, and I frizzled my hair up into a reddish bush of conch. I went in, skipping and tipping, and I thrust my tattered greetings at that reception desk's white soldier. Crazy-o, daddy-o, get me moving. I can't wait to get in that brown. Very likely that soldier hasn't recovered from me yet. 
they had their wire on me from uptown all right but they still put me through the line in that big starting room were 40 or 50 other prospective inductees the room had fallen vacuum quiet with me running my mouth a mile a minute talking nothing but slang i was going to fight on all fronts i was going to be a general man before i got done such talk as that most of them were white of course the tender looking ones appeared ready to run from me some others had that vinegary worst kind of nigger look and a few were amused, seeing me as the Harlem Jigaboo archetype. Also amused were some of the room's 10 or 12 Negroes. But the stony-faced rest of them looked as if they were ready to sign up to go off killing somebody. They would have liked to start with me. The line moved along. Pretty soon, stripped to my shorts, I was making my eager-to-join comments in the medical examination rooms, and everybody in the white coats that I saw had 4F in his eyes. I stayed in the line longer than I expected, before they siphoned me off. One of the white coats accompanied me around a turning hallway. I knew we were on the way to a head shrinker, the army psychiatrist. The receptionist there was a Negro nurse. I remember she was in her early 20s and not bad to look at. She was one of those Negro firsts. Negroes know what I'm talking about. Back then, the white man during the war was so pressed for personnel that he began letting some Negroes put down their buckets and mops and dust rags and use a pencil or sit at some desk or hold some 25 cent title. You couldn't read the Negro press for the big pictures of smug black firsts. Somebody was inside with the psychiatrist. I didn't even have to put on any act for this black girl. She was already sick of me. When finally a buzz came at her desk, she didn't send me, she went in. I knew what she was doing. She was going to make clear in advance what she thought of me. This is still one of the black man's big troubles today. So many of those so-called upper-class Negroes are so busy trying to impress on the white man that they are different from those others that they can't see. They are only helping the white man to keep his low opinion of all Negroes. And then, with her prestige in the clear, she came out and nodded to me to go in. I must say this for that psychiatrist. He tried to be objective and professional in his manner. He sat there and doodled with his blue pencil on a tablet listening to me spiel to him for three or four minutes before he got a word in. His tack was quiet questions to get at why I was so anxious. I didn't rush him. I circled and hedged, watching him closely to let him think he was pulling what he wanted out of me. I kept jerking around, backward, as though somebody might be listening. I knew I was going to send him back to the books to figure what kind of a case I was. Suddenly, I sprang up and peeped under both doors, the one I'd entered and another that probably was a closet. And then I bent and whispered fast in his ear, Daddy-o, now you and me, we're from up north here, so don't you tell nobody. I want to get sent down south. Organize them nigger soldiers you dig. Steal us some guns and kill us crackers. That psychiatrist's blue pencil dropped, and his professional manner fell off in all directions. He stared at me as if I were a snake's egg hatching, fumbling for his red pencil. I knew I had him. I was going back out past Miss First when he said, that will be all. A 4F card came to me in the mail, and I never heard from the army anymore, and never bothered to ask why I was rejected. Chapter 7. Hustler. I can't remember all the hustles I had during the next two years in Harlem after the abrupt end of my riding the trains and peddling reefers to the touring bands. Negro railroad men waited for their trains in their big locker room on the lower level of Grand Central Station. Big blackjack and poker games went on in there around the clock. Sometimes $500 would be on the table. One day, in a blackjack game, an old cook who was dealing the cards tried to be slick, and I had to drop my pistol in his face. The next time I went into one of those games, intuition told me to stick my gun under my belt right down the middle of my back. Sure enough, someone had squealed. Two big, beefy-faced Irish cops came in. They frisked me, and they missed my gun where they hadn't expected one. The cops told me never again to be caught in Grand Central Station unless I had a ticket to ride somewhere. And I knew that by the next day, every railroad's personnel office would have a black ball on me. So I never tried to get another railroad job. There I was back in Harlem streets among all the rest of the hustlers. I couldn't sell reefers. The dope squad detectives were too familiar with me. I was a true hustler, uneducated, unskilled at anything honorable and I considered myself nervy and cunning enough to live by my wits, exploiting any prey that presented itself. I would risk just about anything. Right now, 
In every big city ghetto, tens of thousands of yesterday's and today's school dropouts are keeping body and soul together by some form of hustling in the same way I did. And they inevitably move into more and more, worse and worse, illegality and immorality. Full-time hustlers never can relax to appraise what they are doing and where they are bound. As is the case in any jungle, the hustler's every waking hour is lived with both the practical and the subconscious knowledge that if he ever relaxes, if he ever slows down, the other hungry, restless foxes, ferrets, wolves, and vultures out there with him won't hesitate to make him their prey. During the next six to eight months, I pulled my first robberies and stick-ups, only small ones, always in other nearby cities, and I got away. As the pros did, I too would key myself to pull these jobs by my first use of hard dope. I began with Sammy's recommendation, sniffing cocaine. Normally now, for streetwear I might call it, I carried a hardly noticeable little flat blue steel 25 automatic. But for working, I carried a 32, a 38, or a 45. I saw how when the eyes stared at the big black hole, the faces fell slack and the mouths sagged open. And when I spoke, the people seemed to hear as though they were far away and they would do whatever I asked. Between jobs, staying high on narcotics kept me from getting nervous. Still, upon sudden impulses, just to play safe, I would abruptly move from one to another $15 to $20 a week room, always in my favorite 147, the 150 the street area, just flanking Sugar Hill. Once on a job with Sammy, we had a pretty close call. Someone must have seen us. We were making our getaway, running, when we heard the sirens. Instantly, we slowed to walking. As a police car screeched to a stop, we stepped out into the street, meeting it, hailing it to ask for directions. They must have thought we were about to give them some information. They just cursed us and raced on. Again, it didn't cross the white men's minds that a trick like that might be pulled on them by Negroes. The suits that I wore, the finest, I bought hot for about 35 to $50. I made it my rule never to go after more than I needed to live on. Any experienced hustler will tell you that getting greedy is the quickest road to prison. I kept cased in my head vulnerable places and situations, and I would perform the next job only when my bankroll in my pocket began to get too low. Some weeks, I bet large amounts on the numbers. I still played with the same runner with whom I'd started in Small's Paradise. Playing my hunches, many a day I'd have up to $40 on two numbers, hoping for that fabulous 600 to 1 payoff. But I never did hit a big number full force. There's no telling what I would have done if ever I'd landed $10,000 or $12,000 at one time. Of course, once in a while, I'd hit a small combination figure. Sometimes, flush like that, I'd telephone Sophia to come over from Boston for a couple of days. I went to the movies a lot again, and I never missed my musician friends wherever they were playing, either in Harlem, downtown at the big theaters, or on 52nd Street. Reginald and I got very close the next time his ship came back into New York. We discussed our family and what a shame it was that our book-loving oldest brother, Wilfred, had never had the chance to go to some of those big universities where he would have gone far, and we exchanged thoughts we had never shared with anyone. Reginald, in his quiet way, was a mad fan of musicians and music. When his ship sailed one morning without him, a principal reason was that I had thoroughly exposed him to the exciting musical world. We had wild times backstage with the musicians when they were playing the Roxy or the Paramount. After selling reefers with the bands as they traveled, I was known to almost every popular Negro musician around New York in 1944 to 1945. Reginald and I went to the Savoy Ballroom, the Apollo Theater, the Braddock Hotel Bar, the nightclubs and speakeasies, wherever Negroes played music. The great Lady Day, Billie Holiday, hugged him and called him baby brother. Reginald shared tens of thousands of Negroes' feelings that the living end of the big bands was Lionel Hampton's. I was very close to many of the men in Hamp's band. I introduced Reginald to them, and also to Hamp himself, and Hamp's wife and business manager, Gladys Hampton. One of this world's sweetest people is Hamp. Anyone who knows him will tell you that he'd often do the most generous things for people he barely knew. As much money as Hamp has made, and still makes, he would be broke today if his money and his business weren't handled by Gladys, who is one of the brainiest women I ever met. The Apollo Theater's owner, Frank Schiffman, could tell you. He generally signed bands to play for a set weekly amount, but I know that once during those days, Gladys Hampton instead arranged a deal for Hamp's band to play for a cut of the gate. 
Then the usual number of shows was doubled up, if I'm not mistaken, eight shows a day instead of the usual four, and Hamp's pulling power cleaned up. Gladys Hampton used to talk to me a lot, and she tried to give me good advice. Calm down, Red. Gladys saw how wild I was. She saw me headed toward a bad end. One of the things I liked about Reginald was that when I left him to go away working, Reginald asked me no questions. After he came to Harlem, I went on more jobs than usual. I guess that what influenced me to get my first actual apartment was my not wanting Reginald to be knocking around Harlem without anywhere to call home. That first apartment was three rooms, for $100 a month, I think, in the front basement of a house on 147th Street between Convent and St. Nicholas Avenues. Living in the rear basement apartment, right behind Reginald and me, was one of Harlem's most successful narcotics dealers. With the apartment as our headquarters, I gradually got Reginald introduced around to Creole Bills and other Harlem after-hours spots. About two o'clock every morning, as the downtown white nightclubs closed, Reginald and I would stand around in front of this or that Harlem after-hours place, and I'd school him to what was happening. Especially after the nightclubs downtown closed, the taxis and black limousines would be driving uptown, bringing those white people who never could get enough of Negro soul. The places popular with these whites ranged all the way from the big, locally famous ones such as Jimmy's Chicken Shack and Dickie Wells to the little Here Tonight Gone Tomorrow Night private clubs, so-called, where a dollar was collected at the door for membership. Inside every after-hour spot, the smoke would hurt your eyes. Four white people to every Negro would be in there drinking whiskey from coffee cups and eating fried chicken. The generally flush-faced white men and their makeup masked Glittery-eyed women would be pounding each other's backs and uproariously laughing and applauding the music. A lot of the whites, drunk, would go staggering up to Negroes, the waiters, the owners, or Negroes at tables, wringing their hands, even trying to hug them. You're just as good as I am. I want you to know that. The most famous places drew both Negro and white celebrities who enjoyed each other. A jam-packed 4.30 a.m. crowd at Jimmy's Chicken Shack or Dickie Wells might have such jam session entertainment as Hazel Scott playing the piano for Billie Holiday singing the blues. Jimmy's Chicken Shack, incidentally, was where once, later on, I worked briefly as a waiter. That's where Red Fox was the dishwasher who kept the kitchen crew in stitches. After a while, my brother Reginald had to have a hustle, and I gave much thought to what would be, for him, a good, safe hustle. After he'd learned his own way around, it would be up to him to take risks for himself if he wanted to make more and quicker money. The hustle I got Reginald into really was very simple. It utilized the psychology of the ghetto jungle. Downtown, he paid the $2 or whatever it was for a regular city peddler's license. Then I took him to a manufacturer's outlet where we bought a supply of cheap imperfect seconds, shirts, underwear, cheap rings, watches, all kinds of quick sale items. Watching me work this hustle back in Harlem, Reginald quickly caught on to how to go into barber shops, beauty parlors, and bars acting very nervous as he let the customers peep into his small valise of loot. With so many thieves around anxious to get rid of stolen good quality merchandise cheaply, many Harlemites, purely because of this conditioning, jumped to pay hot prices for inferior goods whose sale was perfectly legitimate. It never took long to get rid of a valiseful for at least twice what it had cost. And if any cop stopped Reginald, he had in his pocket both the peddler's license and the manufacturer's outlet bills of sale. Reginald only had to be certain that none of the customers to whom he sold ever saw that he was legitimate. I assumed that Reginald, like most of the Negroes I knew, would go for a white woman. I'd point out Negro-happy white women to him and explain that a Negro with any brains could wrap these women around his fingers. But I have to say this for Reginald. He never liked white women. I remember the one time he met Sophia. He was so cool it upset Sophia, and it tickled me. Reginald got himself a black woman. I'd guess she was pushing 30, an old settler, as we called them back in those days. She was a waitress in an exclusive restaurant downtown. She lavished on Reginald everything she had. She was so happy to get a young man. I mean, she bought him clothes, cooked and washed for him and everything as though he were a baby. That was just another example of why my respect for my younger brother kept increasing. Reginald showed, in often surprising ways, more sense than a lot of working hustlers twice his age. Reginald then was only 16, but, a six-footer, he looked and acted much older than his years. All through the war, the Harlem racial picture never was too bright. Tension built to a pretty high pitch. 
Old timers told me that Harlem had never been the same since the 1935 riot, when millions of dollars worth of damage was done by thousands of Negroes, infuriated chiefly by the white merchants in Harlem refusing to hire a Negro, even as their stores raked in Harlem's money. During World War II, Mayor LaGuardia officially closed the Savoy Ballroom. Harlem said the real reason was to stop Negroes from dancing with white women. Harlem said that no one dragged the white women in there. Adam Clayton Powell made it a big fight. He had successfully fought Consolidated Edison and the New York Telephone Company until they had hired Negroes. Then he had helped to battle the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Army about their segregating of uniformed Negroes. But Powell couldn't win this battle. City Hall kept the Savoy closed for a long time. It was just another one of the liberal North actions that didn't help Harlem to love the white man any. Finally, rumor flashed that in the Braddock Hotel, white cops had shot a Negro soldier. I was walking down St. Nicholas Avenue. I saw all of these Negroes hollering and running north from 125th Street. Some of them were loaded down with armfuls of stuff. I remember it was the band leader Fletcher Henderson's nephew, Shorty Henderson, who told me what had happened. Negroes were smashing store windows and taking everything they could grab and carry. Furniture, food, jewelry, clothes, whiskey. Within an hour, every New York City cop seemed to be in Harlem. Mayor LaGuardia and the NAACP's then secretary, the famed late Walter White, were in a red fire car, riding around pleading over a loudspeaker to all of those shouting, milling, angry Negroes to please go home and stay inside. Just recently, I ran into Shorty Henderson on 7th Avenue. We were laughing about a fellow whom the riot had left with the nickname of Left Feet. In a scramble in a women's shoe store, somehow he'd grabbed five shoes, all of them for left feet. And we laughed about the scared little Chinese whose restaurant didn't have a hand laid on it because the rioters just about convulsed laughing when they saw the sign the Chinese had hastily stuck on his front door. Me colored too. After the riot, things got very tight in Harlem. It was terrible for the nightlife people and for those hustlers whose main income had been the white man's money. The 1935 riot had left only a relative trickle of the money which had poured into Harlem during the 1920s. And now, this new riot ended even that trickle. Today, the white people who visit Harlem, and this mostly on weekend nights, are hardly more than a few dozen who do the Twist, the Frug, the Watusi, and all the rest of the current dance crazes in Small's Paradise, owned now by the great basketball champion, Wilt the Stilt Chamberlain, who draws crowds with his big, clean, all-American athlete image. Most white people today are physically afraid to come to Harlem and it's for good reasons too. Even for Negroes, Harlem nightlife is about finished. Most of the Negroes who have money to spend are spending it downtown somewhere in this hypocritical integration, in places where previously the police would have been called to haul off any Negro insane enough to try and get in. The already Croesus-rich white man can't get another skyscraper hotel finished and opened before all these integration mad Negroes, who themselves don't own a tool shed, are booking the swanky new hotel for cotillions and conventions. Those rich whites could afford it when they used to throw away their money in Harlem. But Negroes can't afford to be taking their money downtown to the white man. Sammy and I on a robbery job got a bad scare, a very close call. Things had grown so tight in Harlem that some hustlers had been forced to go to work. Even some prostitutes had gotten jobs as domestics and cleaning office buildings at night. The pimping was so poor, Sammy had gone on the job with me. We had selected one of those situations considered impossible. But wherever people think that, the guards will unconsciously grow gradually more relaxed, until sometimes those can be the easiest jobs of all. But right in the middle of the act, we had some bad luck. A bullet grazed Sammy. We just barely escaped. Sammy fortunately wasn't really hurt. We split up, which was always wise to do. Just before daybreak, I went to Sammy's apartment. His newest woman, one of those beautiful but hot-headed Spanish Negroes, was in there crying and carrying on over Sammy. She went for me, screaming and clawing. She knew I'd been in on it with him. I fended her off. Not able to figure out why Sammy didn't shut her up, I did. And from the corner of my eye, I saw Sammy going for his gun. Sammy's reaction that way to my hitting his woman, close as he and I were, was the only weak spot I'd ever glimpsed. The woman screamed and dove for him. She knew as I did that when your best friend draws a gun on you, he usually has lost all control of his emotions, and he intends to shoot. She distracted Sammy long enough for me to bolt through the door. Sammy chased me, about a block. We soon made up on the surface, but
but things never are fully right again with anyone you have seen trying to kill you. Intuition told us that we had better lay low for a good while. The worst thing was that we'd been seen. The police in that nearby town had surely circulated our general descriptions. I just couldn't forget that incident over Sammy's woman. I came to rely more and more upon my brother Reginald as the only one in my world I could completely trust. Reginald was lazy. I discovered that. He had quit his hustle altogether. But I didn't mind that, really, because one could be as lazy as he wanted if he would only use his head, as Reginald was doing. He had left my apartment by now. He was living off his old settler woman when he was in town. I had also taught Reginald how he could work a little while for a railroad, then use his identification card to travel for nothing, and Reginald loved to travel. Several times he had gone visiting all around, among our brothers and sisters. They had now begun to scatter to different cities. In Boston, Reginald was closer to our sister Mary than to Ella, who had been my favorite. Both Reginald and Mary were quiet types, and Ella and I were extroverts, and Shorty in Boston had given my brother a royal time. Because of my reputation, it was easy for me to get into the numbers racket. That was probably Harlem's only hustle, which hadn't slumped in business. In return for a favor to some white mobster, my new boss and his wife had just been given a six-month's numbers banking privilege for the Bronx Railroad area called Mott Haven Yards. The white mobsters had the numbers racket split into specific areas. A designated area would be assigned to someone for a specified period of time. My boss's wife had been Dutch Schultz's secretary in the 1930s, during the time when Schultz had strong-armed his way into control of the Harlem numbers business. My job now was to ride a bus across the George Washington Bridge where a fellow was waiting for me to hand him a bag of numbers betting slips. We never spoke. I'd cross the street and catch the next bus back to Harlem. I never knew who that fellow was. I never knew who picked up the betting McNee for the slips that I handled. You didn't ask questions in the rackets. My boss's wife and Gladys Hampton were the only two women I ever met in Harlem whose business ability I really respected. My boss's wife, when she had the time and the inclination to talk, would tell me many interesting things. She would talk to me about the Dutch Schultz days, about deals that she had known, about graft paid to officials, rookie cops and shyster lawyers right on up into the top levels of police and politics. She knew from personal experience how crime existed only to the degree that the law cooperated with it. She showed me how, in the country's entire social, political, and economic structure, the criminal, the law, and the politicians were actually inseparable partners. It was at this time that I changed from my old numbers man, the one I'd used since I first worked in Small's Paradise. He hated to lose a heavy player, but he readily understood why I would now want to play with a runner of my own outfit. That was how I began placing my bets with West Indian Archie. I've mentioned him before, one of Harlem's really bad Negroes, one of those former Dutch Schultz strong-arm men around Harlem. West Indian Archie had finished time in Sing Sing not long before I came to Harlem, but my boss's wife had hired him not just because she knew him from the old days. West Indian Archie had the kind of photographic memory that put him among the elite of numbers runners. He never wrote down your number. Even in the case of combination plays, he would just nod. He was able to file all the numbers in his head and write them down for the banker only when he turned in his money. This made him the ideal runner because cops could never catch him with any betting slips. I've often reflected upon such black veteran numbers men as West Indian Archie. If they had lived in another kind of society, their exceptional mathematical talents might have been better used. But they were black. Anyway, it was status just to be known as a client of West Indian Archie's because he handled only sizable betters. He also required integrity and sound credit. It wasn't necessary that you pay as you played. You could pay West Indian Archie by the week. He always carried a couple of thousand dollars on him, his own money. If a client came up to him and said he'd hit for some moderate amount, say a 50 cent or $1 combination, West Indian Archie would peel off the three or $600 and later get his money back from the banker. Every weekend, I'd pay my bill anywhere from 50 to even $100 if I had really plunged on some hunch. And when, once or twice, I did hit, always just some combination, as I've described, West Indian Archie paid me off from his own role. The six months finally ended for my boss and his wife. They had done well. Their runners got nice tips and promptly were snatched up by other bankers. I continued working for my boss and his wife in a gambling house they opened. A Harlem madam I'd come to know, through having done a friend of hers a favor, introduced me to a special facet of the Harlem night world something which the riot had only interrupted. 
It was the world where, behind locked doors, Negroes catered to moneyed white people's weird sexual tastes. The whites I'd known loved to rub shoulders publicly with black folks in the after-hours clubs and speakeasies. These, on the other hand, were whites who did not want it known that they had been anywhere near Harlem. The riot had made these exclusive white customers nervous. Their slipping into and about Harlem hadn't been so noticeable when other whites were also around, but now they would be conspicuous. They also feared the recently aroused anger of Harlem Negroes. So the madam was safeguarding her growing operation by offering me a steerer's job. During the war, it was extremely difficult to get a telephone. One day, the madam told me to stay at my apartment the next morning. She talked to somebody. I don't know who it was, but before the next noon, I dialed the madam from my own telephone, unlisted. This madam was a specialist in her field. If her own girls could not, or would not, accommodate a customer, she would send me to another place, usually an apartment somewhere else in Harlem where the requested specialty was done. My post for picking up the customers was right outside the Astor Hotel, that always busy northwest corner of 45th Street and Broadway. Watching the moving traffic, I was soon able to spot the taxi, car, or limousine, even before it slowed down, with the anxious white faces peering out for the tall, reddish-brown complexioned Negro wearing a dark suit or raincoat with a white flower in his lapel. If they were in a private car, unless it was chauffeured, I would take the wheel and drive where we were going. But if they were in a taxi, I would always tell the cabbie, the Apollo Theater in Harlem, please, since among New York City taxis, a certain percentage are driven by cops. We would get another cab, driven by a black man, and I'd give him the right address. As soon as I got that party settled, I'd telephone the madam. She would generally have me rush by taxi right back downtown to be on the 45th Street and Broadway corner at a specified time. Appointments were strictly punctual. Rarely was I on the corner as much as five minutes, and I knew how to keep moving about so as not to attract the attention of any vice squad plainclothesmen or uniformed cops. With tips, which were often heavy, sometimes I would make over $100 a night steering up to 10 customers in a party to see anything, to do anything, to have anything done to them that they wanted. I hardly ever knew the identities of my customers, but the few I did recognize or whose names I happened to hear remind me now of the Profumo case in England. The English are not far ahead of rich and influential Americans when it comes to seeking rarities and oddities. Rich men, middle-aged and beyond, men well past their prime. These weren't college boys. These were their Ivy League fathers, even grandfathers, I guess. Society leaders, big politicians, tycoons, important friends from out of town, city government big shots, all kinds of professional people, star performing artists, theatrical and Hollywood celebrities, and of course, racketeers. Harlem was their sin den, their flesh pot. They stole off among taboo black people and took off whatever antiseptic, important, dignified masks they wore in their white world. These were men who could afford to spend large amounts of money for two, three, or four hours indulging their strange appetites. But in this black-white netherworld, nobody judged the customers. Anything they could name, anything they could imagine, anything they could describe, they could do or could have done to them just as long as they paid. In the Profumo case in England, Christine Keeler's friend testified that some of her customers wanted to be whipped. One of my main steers to one specialty address away from the madam's house was the apartment of a big coal black girl, strong as an ox, with muscles like a dock worker's. A funny thing, it generally was the oldest of these white men, in their 60s, I know, some maybe in their 70s. They couldn't seem to recover quickly enough from their last whipping so they could have me meet them again at 45th and Broadway to take them back to that apartment, to cringe on their knees and beg and cry out for mercy under that black girl's whip. Some of them would pay me extra to come and watch them being beaten. That girl greased her big Amazon body all over to look shinier and blacker. She used small plaited whips, she would draw blood, and she was making herself a small fortune off those old white men. I wouldn't tell all the things I've seen. I used to wonder later on, when I was in prison, what a psychiatrist would make of it all. And so many of these men held responsible positions. They exercised guidance, influence, and authority over others. In prison later, I'd think, too, about another thing. Just about all of those whites specifically expressed as their preference, black, black, the blacker the better. The madam, having long since learned this, had in her house nothing but the blackest accommodating women she could find. In all of my time in Harlem, 
I never saw a white prostitute touched by a white man. White girls were in some of the various Harlem specialty places. They would participate in customers' most frequent exhibition requests. A sleek black Negro male having a white woman. Was this the white man wanting to witness his deepest sexual fear? A few times I even had parties that included white women whom the men had brought with them to watch this. I never steered any white women other than in these instances brought by their own men or who had been put into contact with me by a white lesbian whom I knew who was another variety of specialty madam. This lesbian, a beautiful white woman, had a male Negro stable. Her vocabulary was all profanity. She supplied Negro males on order to -to well-to-do white women. I'd seen this lesbian and her blonde girlfriend around Harlem drinking and talking at bars, always with young Negroes. No one who didn't know would ever guess that the lesbian was recruiting. But one night I gave her and her girlfriend some reefers, which they said were the best they'd ever smoked. They lived in a hotel downtown, and after that now and then, they would call me, and I would bring them some reefers, and we'd talk. She told me how she had accidentally gotten started in her specialty. As a Harlem habitué, she had known Harlem Negroes who liked white women. Her role developed from a pattern of talk she often heard from bored, well-to-do white women where she worked, in an East Side beauty salon. Hearing the women complain about sexually inadequate mates, she would tell what she'd heard about Negro men. Observing how excited some of the women seemed to become, she finally arranged some dates with some of the Harlem Negroes she knew at her own apartment. Eventually, she rented three Midtown apartments where a woman customer could meet a Negro by appointment. Her customers recommended her service to their friends. She quit the beauty salon, set up a messenger service as an operating front, and ran all of her business by telephone. She had also noticed the color preference. I never could substitute in an emergency, she would tell me with a laugh, because I was too light. She told me that nearly every white woman in her clientele would specify a black one. Sometimes they would say a real one, meaning black, no brown Negroes, no red Negroes. The lesbian thought up her messenger service idea because some of her trade wanted the Negroes to come to their homes, at times carefully arranged by telephone. These women lived in neighborhoods of swank brownstones and exclusive apartment houses with doormen dressed like admirals. But white society never thinks about challenging any Negro in a servant role. Doormen would telephone up and hear, oh yes, send him right up, James. Service elevators would speed those neatly dressed Negro messenger boys right up so that they could deliver what had been ordered by some of the most privileged white women in Manhattan. The irony is that those white women had no more respect for those Negroes than white men have had for the Negro women they have been using since slavery times. And in turn, Negroes have no respect for the whites they get into bed with. I know the way I felt about Sophia, who still came to New York whenever I called her. The West Indian boyfriend of the Profumo scandals, Christine Keeler, Lucky Gordon, and his friends must have felt the same way. After England's leaders had been with those white girls, those girls, for their satisfaction, went to Negroes to smoke reefers and make fun of some of England's greatest peers as cuckolds and fools. I don't doubt that Lucky Gordon knows the identity of the man in the mask and much more. If Gordon told everything those white girls told him, he would give England a new scandal. It's no different from what happens in some of America's topmost white circles. Twenty years ago, I saw them nightly. With my own eyes, I heard them with my own ears. The hypocritical white man will talk about the Negro's low morals. But who has the world's lowest morals if not whites? And not only that, but the upper-class whites. Recently, details were published about a group of suburban New York City white housewives and mothers operating as a professional call-girl ring. In some cases, these wives were out prostituting with the agreement, even the cooperation, of husbands some of whom even waited at home attending the children. And the customers, to quote a major New York City morning newspaper, some 16 ledgers and books with names of 200 Johns, many important social, financial, and political figures were seized in the raid Friday night. I have also read recently about groups of young white couples who get together. The husbands throw their house keys into a hat. Then, blindfolded, the husbands draw out a key and spend the night with the wife that the house key matches. I have never heard of anything like that being done by Negroes, even Negroes who live in the worst ghettos and alleys and gutters. Early one morning in Harlem, a tall, light Negro wearing a hat and with a woman's stocking drawn down over his face held up a Negro bartender and manager who were counting up the night's receipts. 
Like most bars in Harlem, Negroes fronted and a Jew really owned the place. To get a license, one had to know somebody in the state liquor authority and Jews working with Jews seemed to have the best SLA contacts. The black manager hired some Negro hoodlums to go hunting for the holdup man and the man's description caused them to include me among their suspects. About daybreak that same morning, they kicked in the door of my apartment. I told them I didn't know a thing about it, that I hadn't had a thing to do with whatever they were talking about. I told them I had been out on my hustle, steering, until maybe four in the morning, and then I had come straight to my apartment and gone to bed. The strong-arm thugs were bluffing. They were trying to flush out the man who had done it. They still had other suspects to check out. That's all that saved me. I put on my clothes and took a taxi, and I woke up two people, the madam, then Sammy. I had some money, but the madam gave me some more, and I told Sammy I was going to see my brother Philbert in Michigan. I gave Sammy the address so that he could let me know when things got straightened out. This was the trip to Michigan in the wintertime when I put congoline on my head, then discovered that the bathroom sink's pipes were frozen. To keep the lie from burning up my scalp, I had to stick my head into the stool and flush and flush to rinse out the stuff. A week passed in frigid Michigan before Sammy's telegram came. Another red Negro had confessed, which enabled me to live in Harlem again. But I didn't go back into steering. I can't remember why I didn't. I imagine I must have felt like staying away from hustling for a while, going to some of the clubs at night, and narcotizing with my friends. Anyway, I just never went back to the madam's job. It was at about this time, too, I remember, that I began to be sick. I had colds all the time. It got to be a steady irritation, always sniffling and wiping my nose, all day, all night. I stayed so high that I was in a dream world. Now, sometimes, I smoked opium with some white friends, actors who lived downtown, and I smoked more reefers than ever before. I didn't smoke the usual wooden match-sized sticks of marijuana. I was so far gone by now that I smoked it almost by the ounce. After a while, I worked downtown for a Jew. He liked me because of something I had managed to do for him. He bought rundown restaurants and bars. Jaime was his name. He would remodel these places, then stage a big gala reopening with banners and a spotlight outside. The jam-packed busy place with the big under new management sign in the window would attract speculators, usually other Jews who were around looking for something to invest money in. Sometimes even in the week of the new opening, Jaime would resell at a good profit. Jaime really liked me, and I liked him. He loved to talk. I loved to listen. Half his talk was about Jews and Negroes. Jews who had anglicized their names were Jaime's favorite hate. Spitting and curling his mouth in scorn, he would reel off names of people he said had done this. Some of them were famous names who most people never thought of as Jews. Red, I'm a Jew and you're black, he would say. These Gentiles don't like either one of us. If the Jew wasn't smarter than the Gentile, he'd get treated worse than your people. Jaime paid me good money while I was with him, sometimes $200 and $300 a week. I would have done anything for Jaime. I did do all kinds of things. But my main job was transporting bootleg liquor that Jaime supplied, usually to those spruced up bars which he had sold to someone. Another fellow and I would drive out to Long Island where a big bootleg whiskey outfit operated. We take with us cartons of empty bonded whiskey bottles that were saved illegally by bars we supplied. We would buy five gallon containers of bootleg, funnel it into the bottles, then deliver, according to Jaime's instructions, this or that many crates back to the bars. Many people claiming they drank only such and such a brand couldn't tell their only brand from pure week old Long Island bootleg. Most ordinary whiskey drinkers are brand chumps like this. On the side, with Jaime's approval, I was myself at that time supplying some lesser quantities of bootleg to reputable Harlem bars, as well as to some of the few speakeasies still in Harlem. But one weekend on Long Island, something happened involving the State Liquor Authority. One of New York State's biggest recent scandals has been the exposure of wholesale SLA graft and corruption. In the bootleg racket I was involved in, someone high up must have been taken for a real pile. A rumor about some inside tipster spread among Jaime and the others. One day, Jaime didn't show up where he had told me to meet him. I never heard from him again, but I did hear that he was put in the ocean and I knew he couldn't swim. Up in the Bronx, a Negro held up some Italian racketeers in a floating crap game. I heard about it on the wire. Whoever did it, aside from being a fool, was said to be a tall, light-skinned Negro, masked with a woman's stocking. 
It has always made me wonder if that bar stick-up had really been solved or if the wrong man had confessed under beatings. But anyway, the past suspicion of me helped to revive suspicion of me again. Up in Fat Man's bar on the hill overlooking the polo grounds, I had just gone into a telephone booth. Everyone in the bar, all over Harlem in fact, was drinking up, excited about the news that Branch Rickey, the Brooklyn Dodgers owner, had just signed Jackie Robinson to play in Major League Baseball with the Dodgers farm team in Montreal, which would place the time in the fall of 1945. Earlier in the afternoon, I had collected from West Indian Archie for a 50-cent combination bet. He had paid me $300 right out of his pocket. I was telephoning Jean Parks. Jean was one of the most beautiful women who ever lived in Harlem. She once sang with Sarah Vaughan in the Blue Bonnets, a quartet that sang with Earl Hines. For a long time, Jean and I had enjoyed a standing, friendly deal that we'd go out and celebrate when either of us hit the numbers. Since my last hit, Jean had treated me twice and we laughed on the phone, glad that now I'd treat her to a night out. We arranged to go to a 52nd Street nightclub to hear Billie Holiday, who had been on the road and was just back in New York. As I hung up, I spotted the two lean, tough-looking paisanos gazing in at me cooped up in the booth. I didn't need any intuition, and I had no gun. A cigarette case was the only thing in my pocket. I started easing my hand down into my pocket to try bluffing, and one of them snatched open the door. They were dark, olive, swarthy featured Italians. I had my hand down into my pocket. Come on outside, we'll hold court, one said. At that moment, a cop walked through the front door. The two thugs slipped out. I never in my life have been so glad to see a cop. I was still shaking when I got to the apartment of my friend, Sammy the Pimp. He told me that not long before, West Indian Archie had been there looking for me. Sometimes, recalling all of this, I don't know to tell the truth, how I am alive to tell it today. They say God takes care of fools and babies. I've so often thought that Allah was watching over me. Through all of this time of my life, I really was dead, mentally dead. I just didn't know that I was. Anyway, to kill time, Sammy and I sniffed some of his cocaine until the time came to pick up Gene Parks to go down and hear Lady Day. Sammy's having told me about West Indian Archie looking for me didn't mean a thing. Not right then. Chapter 8. Trapped. There was the knocking at the door. Sammy lying on his bed in pajamas and a bathrobe called Who. When West Indian Archie answered, Sammy slid the round, two-sided shaving mirror under the bed with what little of the cocaine powder, or crystals, actually, was left, and I opened the door. Red, I want my money. A 32. 20 is a funny kind of gun. It's bigger than a 32, but it's not as big as a 38. I had faced down some dangerous Negroes but no one who wasn't ready to die messed with West Indian Archie. I couldn't believe it. He truly scared me. I was so incredulous at what was happening that it was hard to form words with my brain and my mouth. Man, what's the beef? West Indian Archie said he'd thought I was trying something when I'd told him I'd hit, but he'd paid me the $300 until he could double check his written betting slips. And as he'd thought, I hadn't combinated the number I'd claimed, but another. Man, you're crazy. I talked fast. I'd seen out of the corner of my eye Sammy's hand easing under his pillow where he kept his army 45. Archie, smart a man as you're supposed to be, you'd pay somebody who hadn't hit? The 32, 20 moved, and Sammy froze. West Indian Archie told him, I ought to shoot you through the ear. And he looked back at me. You don't have my money? I must have shaken my head. I'll give you until 12 o'clock tomorrow. And he put his hand behind him and pulled open the door. He backed out and slammed it. It was a classic hustler code impasse. The money wasn't the problem. I still had about $200 of it. Had money been the issue, Sammy could have made up the difference. If it wasn't in his pocket, his women could quickly have raised it. West Indian Archie himself, for that matter, would have loaned me $300 if I'd ever asked him, as many thousands of dollars of mine as he'd gotten 10% of. Once, in fact, when he'd heard I was broke, he had looked me up and handed me some money and grunted, Stick this in your pocket. The issue was the position which his action had put us both into. For a hustler in our sidewalk jungle world, face and honor were important. No hustler could have it known that he'd been hyped, meaning outsmarted or made a fool of. And worse, a hustler could never afford to have it demonstrated that he could be bluffed, that he could be frightened by a threat, that he lacked nerve. West Indian Archie knew that some young hustlers rose in stature in our world when they somehow hoodwinked older hustlers, then put it on the wire for everyone to hear. He believed I was trying that. 
In turn, I knew he would be protecting his stature by broadcasting all over the wire his threat to me. Because of this code, in my time in Harlem, I'd personally known a dozen hustlers who threatened, left town, disgraced. Once the wire had it, any retreat by either of us was unthinkable. The wire would be awaiting the report of the showdown. I'd also known of at least another dozen showdowns in which one took the dead on arrival ride to the morgue and the other went to prison for manslaughter or the electric chair for murder. Sammy let me hold his 32. My guns were at my apartment. I put the 32 in my pocket with my hand on it and walked out. I couldn't stay out of sight. I had to show up at all of my usual haunts. I was glad that Reginald was out of town. He might have tried protecting me, and I didn't want him shot in the head by West Indian Archie. I stood a while on the corner with my mind confused. The muddled thinking that's characteristic of the addict. Was West Indian Archie, I began to wonder, bluffing a hype on me? To make fun of me? Some old hustlers did love to hype younger ones. I knew he wouldn't do it as some would, just to pick up $300. But everyone was so slick. In this Harlem jungle, people would hype their brothers. Numbers runners often had hyped addicts who had hit, who were so drugged that, when challenged, they really couldn't be sure if they had played a certain number. I began to wonder whether West Indian Archie might not be right. Had I really gotten my combination confused? I certainly knew the two numbers I'd played. I knew I'd told him to combinate only one of them. Had I gotten mixed up about which number? Have you ever been so sure you did something that you never would have thought of it again, unless it was brought up again? Then you start trying to mentally confirm, and you're only about half sure? It was just about time for me to go and pick up Gene Parks, to go downtown to see Billy at the Onyx Club. So much was swirling in my head. I thought about telephoning her and calling it off, making some excuse. But I knew that running now was the worst thing I could do. So I went on and picked up Jean at her place. We took a taxi on down to 52nd Street. Billie Holiday and those big photo blow-ups of her were under the lights outside. Inside, the tables were jammed against the wall, tables about big enough to get two drinks and four elbows on. The Onyx was one of those very little places. Billie, at the microphone, had just finished a number when she saw Jean and me. Her white gown glittered under the spotlight. Her face had that coppery, Indianish look and her hair was in that trademark ponytail. For her next number, she did the one she knew I always liked so. You don't know what love is, until you face each dawn with sleepless eyes, until you've lost a love you hate to lose. When her set was done, Billy came over to our table. She and Jean, who hadn't seen each other in a long time, hugged each other. Billy sensed something wrong with me. She knew that I was always high, but she knew me well enough to see that something else was wrong and asked in her customary profane language what was the matter with me. And in my own foul vocabulary of those days, I pretended to be without a care, so she let it drop. We had a picture taken by the club photographer that night. The three of us were sitting close together. That was the last time I ever saw Lady Day. She's dead. Dope and heartbreak stopped that heart as big as a barn and that sound and style that no one successfully copies. Lady Day sang with the soul of Negroes from the centuries of sorrow and oppression. What a shame that proud, fine black woman never lived where the true greatness of the black race was appreciated. In the Onyx Club men's room, I sniffed the little packet of cocaine I had gotten from Sammy. Jean and I, riding back up to Harlem in a cab, decided to have another drink. She had no idea what was happening when she suggested one of my main hangouts, the bar of the Lamar Cherie on the corner of 147th Street and St. Nicholas Avenue. I had my gun and the cocaine courage, and I said okay. And by the time we'd had the drink, I was so high that I asked Jean to take a cab on home, and she did. I never have seen Jean again either. Like a fool, I didn't leave the bar. I stayed there, sitting, like a bigger fool, with my back to the door, thinking about West Indian Archie. Since that day, I have never sat with my back to a door and I never will again. But it's a good thing I was then. I'm positive if I'd seen West Indian Archie come in, I'd have shot to kill. The next thing I knew, West Indian Archie was standing before me, cursing me loud, his gun on me. He was really making his public point, floor showing for the people. He called me foul names, threatened me. Everyone, bartenders and customers, sat or stood as though carved drinks in midair. The jukebox in the rear was going. I had never seen West Indian Archie high before. Not a whiskey high, I could tell it was something else. I knew the hustler's characteristic of keying up on dope to do a job. I was thinking, I'm going to kill Archie. 
I'm just going to wait until he turns around to get the drop on him. I could feel my own 32 resting against my ribs where it was tucked under my belt beneath my coat. West Indian Archie, seeming to read my mind, quit cursing, and his words jarred me. You're thinking you're going to kill me first, Red, but I'm going to give you something to think about. I'm 60. I'm an old man. I've been to Sing Sing. My life is over. You're a young man. Kill me. You're lost anyway. All you can do is go to prison. I've since thought that West Indian Archie may have been trying to scare me into running to save both his face and his life. It may be that's why he was high. No one knew that I hadn't killed anyone, but no one who knew me, including myself, would doubt that I'd kill. I can't guess what might have happened. But under the code, if West Indian Archie had gone out of the door, after having humiliated me as he had, I'd have had to follow him out. We'd have shot it out in the street. But some friends of West Indian Archie moved up alongside him, quietly calling his name, Archie, Archie, and he let them put their hands on him, and they drew him aside. I watched them move him past where I was sitting, glaring at me. They were working him back toward the rear. Then, taking my time, I got down off the stool. I dropped a bill on the bar for the bartender. Without looking back, I went out. I stood outside, in full view of the bar, with my hand in my pocket, for perhaps five minutes. When West Indian Archie didn't come out, I left. It must have been five in the morning when, downtown, I woke up a white actor I knew who lived in the Howard Hotel on 45th Street, off 6th Avenue. I knew I had to stay high. The amount of dope I put into myself within the next several hours sounds inconceivable. I got some opium from that fellow. I took a cab back up to my apartment and I smoked it. My gun was ready if I heard a mosquito cough. My telephone rang. It was the white lesbian who lived downtown. She wanted me to bring her and her girlfriend $50 worth of reefers. I felt that if I had always done it, I had to do it now. Opium had me drowsy. I had a bottle of Benzedrine tablets in my bathroom. I swallowed some of them to perk up. The two drugs working in me had my head going in opposite directions at the same time. I knocked at the apartment right behind mine. The dealer let me have loose marijuana on credit. He saw I was so high that he even helped me roll it. A hundred sticks. And while we were rolling it, we both smoked some. Now opium, benzedrine, reefers. I stopped by Sammy's on the way downtown. His flashing-eyed Spanish Negro woman opened the door. Sammy had gotten weak for that woman. He had never let any other of his women hang around so much. Now she was even answering his doorbell. Sammy was by this time very badly addicted. He seemed hardly to recognize me. Lying in bed, he reached under and again brought out that inevitable shaving mirror on which, for some reason, he always kept his cocaine crystals. He motioned for me to sniff some. I didn't refuse. Going downtown to deliver the reefers, I felt sensations I cannot describe in all those different grooves at the same time. The only word to describe it was a timelessness. A day might have seemed to me five minutes, or a half hour might have seemed a week. I can't imagine how I looked when I got to the hotel. When the lesbian and her girlfriend saw me, they helped me to a bed. I fell across it and passed out. That night, when they woke me up, it was half a day beyond West Indian Archie's deadline. Late, I went back uptown. It was on the wire. I could see people who knew me finding business elsewhere. I knew nobody wanted to be caught in a crossfire. But nothing happened. The next day either, I just stayed high. Some raw kid hustler in a bar, I had to bust in his mouth. He came back pulling a blade. I would have shot him but somebody grabbed him. They put him out, cursing that he was going to kill me. Intuition told me to get rid of my gun. I gave a hustler the eye across the bar. I'd no more than slipped him the gun from my belt when a cop I'd seen about came in the other door. He had his hand on his gun butt. He knew what was all over the wire. He was certain I'd be armed. He came slowly over toward me, and I knew if I sneezed, he'd blast me down. He said, take your hand out of your pocket, Red, real carefully. I did. Once he saw me empty-handed, we both could relax a little. He motioned for me to walk outside, ahead of him, and I did. His partner was waiting on the sidewalk, opposite their patrol car, double-parked with its radio going. With people stopping, looking, they patted me down there on the sidewalk. What are you looking for? I asked them when they didn't find anything. Red, there's a report you're carrying a gun. I had one, I said, but I threw it in the river. The one who had come into the bar said, I think I'd leave town if I were you, Red. I went back into the bar, saying that I had thrown my gun away, had kept them from taking me to my apartment. Things I had there could have gotten me more time than 10 guns and could have gotten them a promotion. Everything was building up, closing in on me. 
I was trapped in so many cross turns. West Indian Archie gunning for me. The Italians who thought I'd stuck up their crap game after me. The scared kid hustler I'd hit. The cops. For four years, up to that point, I'd been lucky enough or slick enough to escape jail or even getting arrested or any serious trouble. But I knew that any minute now something had to give. Sammy had done something that I've often wished I could have thanked him for. When I heard the car's horn, I was walking on St. Nicholas Avenue, but my ears were hearing a gun. I didn't dream the horn could possibly be for me. Homeboy, I jerked around. I came close to shooting. Shorty from Boston. I'd scared him nearly to death. Daddy-o, I couldn't have been happier. Inside the car, he told me Sammy had telephoned about how I was jammed up tight and told him he'd better come and get me. And Shorty did his band's date, then borrowed his piano man's car and burned up the miles to New York. I didn't put up any objections to leaving. Shorty stood watch outside my apartment. I brought out and stuffed into the car's trunk what little stuff I cared to hang on to. Then we hit the highway. Shorty had been without sleep for about 36 hours. He told me afterward that through just about the whole ride back, I talked out of my head. Chapter 9. Caught. Ella couldn't believe how atheist, how uncouth I had become. I believed that a man should do anything that he was slick enough or bad and bold enough to do and that a woman was nothing but another commodity. Every word I spoke was hip or profane. I would bet that my working vocabulary wasn't 200 words. Even Shorty, whose apartment I now again shared, wasn't prepared for how I lived and thought like a predatory animal. Sometimes I would catch him watching me. At first, I slept a lot, even at night. I had slept mostly in the daytime during the preceding two years. When awake, I smoked reefers. Shorty had originally introduced me to marijuana, and my consumption of it now astounded him. I didn't want to talk much at first. When awake, I'd play records continuously. The reefers gave me a feeling of contentment. I would enjoy hours of floating, daydreaming, imaginary conversations with my New York musician friends. Within two weeks, I'd had more sleep than during any two months when I had been in Harlem hustling day and night. When I finally went out in the Roxbury streets, it took me only a little while to locate a peddler of snow, cocaine. It was when I got back into that familiar snow feeling that I began to want to talk. Cocaine produces, for those who sniff its powdery white crystals, an illusion of supreme well-being and a soaring overconfidence in both physical and mental ability. You think you could whip the heavyweight champion and that you are smarter than anybody. There was also that feeling of timelessness, and there were intervals of ability to recall and review things that had happened years back with an astonishing clarity. Shorty's band played at spots around Boston three or four nights a week. After he left for work, Sophia would come over and I'd talk about my plans. She would be gone back to her husband by the time Shorty returned from work, and I'd bend his ear until daybreak. Sophia's husband had gotten out of the military, and he was some sort of salesman. He was supposed to have a big deal going, which soon would require his traveling a lot to the West Coast. I didn't ask questions, but Sophia often indicated they weren't doing too well. I know I had nothing to do with that. He never dreamed I existed. A white woman might blow up at her husband and scream and yell and call him every name she can think of and say the most vicious things in an effort to hurt him and talk about his mother and his grandmother too. But one thing she never will tell him herself is that she is going with a black man. That's one automatic red murder flag to the white man, and his woman knows it. Sophia always had given me money. Even when I had hundreds of dollars in my pocket, when she came to Harlem, I would take everything she had, short of her train fare, back to Boston. It seems that some women love to be exploited. When they are not exploited, they exploit the man. Anyway, it was his money that she gave me, I guess, because she never had worked. But now my demands on her increased, and she came up with more. Again. I don't know where she got it. Always, every now and then, I had given her a hard time just to keep her in line. Every once in a while, a woman seems to need, in fact, wants this too. But now, I would feel evil and slap her around worse than ever. Some of the nights when Shorty was away, she would cry, curse me, and swear that she would never be back. But I knew she wasn't even thinking about not coming back. Sophia's being around was one of Shorty's greatest pleasures about my homecoming. I have said it before, I never in my life have seen a black man that desired white women as sincerely as Shorty did. Since I had known him, he had had several. He had never been able to keep a white woman any length of time, though, because he was too good to them. And, as I have said, any woman, white or black, seems to get bored with that. 
It happened that Shorty was between white women when one night Sophia brought to the house her 17-year-old sister. I never saw anything like the way that she and Shorty nearly jumped for each other. For him, she wasn't only a white girl, but a young white girl. For her, he wasn't only a Negro, but a Negro musician. In looks, she was a younger version of Sophia, who still turned heads. Sometimes I'd take the two girls to Negro places where Shorty played. Negroes showed 32 teeth apiece as soon as they saw the white girls. They would come over to your booth or your table. They would stand there and drool. And Shorty was no better. He'd stand up there playing and watching that young girl waiting for him and waving at him and winking. As soon as the set was over, he'd practically run over people getting down to our table. I didn't Lindy Hop anymore now. I wouldn't even have thought of it now, just as I wouldn't have been caught in a zoot suit now. All of my suits were conservative. A banker might have worn my shoes. I met Laura again. We were really glad to see each other. She was a lot more like me now, a good time girl. We talked and laughed. She looked a lot older than she really was. She had no one man. She freelanced around. She had long since moved away from her grandmother. Laura told me she had finished school, but then she gave up the college idea. Laura was high whenever I saw her now, too. We smoked some reefers together. After about a month of laying dead, as inactivity was called, I knew I had to get some kind of hustle going. A hustler broke, needs a stake. Some nights when Shorty was playing, I would take whatever Sophia had been able to get for me, and I'd try to run it up into something, playing stud poker at John Hughes' gambling house. When I had lived in Roxbury before, John Hughes had been a big gambler who wouldn't have spoken to me. But during the war, the Roxbury Wire had carried a lot about things I was doing in Harlem, and now the New York name magic was on me. That was the feeling that hustlers everywhere else had. If you could hustle and make it in New York, they were well off to know you. It gave them prestige. Anyway, through the same flush war years, John Hughes had hustled profitably enough to be able to open a pretty good gambling house. John one night was playing in a game I was in. After the first two cards were dealt around the table, I had an ace showing. I looked beneath it at my whole card, another ace, a pair, back to back. My ace showing made it my turn to bet, but I didn't rush. I sat there and studied. Finally, I knocked my knuckles on the table, passing, leaving the betting to the next man. My action implied that beneath my ace was some nothing card that I didn't care to risk my money on. The player sitting next to me took the bait. He bet pretty heavily. And the next man raised him. Possibly each of them had small pairs. Maybe they just wanted to scare me out before I drew another ace. Finally, the bet reached John, who had a queen showing. He raised everybody. Now, there was no telling what John had. John truly was a clever gambler. He could gamble as well as anybody I had gambled with in New York. So the bet came back to me. It was going to cost me a lot of money to call all the raises. Some of them obviously had good cards, but I knew I had every one of them beat. But again, I studied and studied. I pretended perplexity. And finally, I put in my money, calling the bets. The same betting pattern went on with each new card right around to the last card. And when that last card went around, I hit another ace in sight. Three aces. And John hit another queen in sight. He bet a pile. Now everyone else studied a long time, and one by one all folded their hands, except me. All I could do was put what I had left on the table. If I'd had the money, I could have raised $500 or more, and he'd have had to call me. John couldn't have gone the rest of his life wondering if I had bluffed him out of a pot that big. I showed my whole card ace. John had three queens. As I hauled in the pot, something over $500, my first real stake in Boston, John got up from the table. He'd quit. He told his houseman, anytime Red comes in here and wants anything, let him have it. He said, I've never seen a young man play his whole card like he played. John said, young man, being himself about 50, I guess, although you can never be certain about a Negro's age. He thought, as most people would have, that I was about 30. No one in Roxbury except my sisters, Ella and Mary, suspected my real age. The story of that poker game helped my on-scene reputation among the other gamblers and hustlers around Roxbury. Another thing that happened in John's gambling house contributed. The incident that made it known that I carried not a gun, but some guns. John had a standing rule that anyone who came into the place to gamble had to check his guns if he had any. I always checked two guns. Then, one night, when a gambler tried to pull something slick, I drew a third gun from its shoulder holster. This added to the rest of my reputation the word that I was trigger happy and crazy. Looking back, I think I really was at least slightly out of my mind, 
I viewed narcotics as most people regard food. I wore my guns as today I wear my neckties. Deep down, I actually believe that after living as fully as humanly possible, one should then die violently. I expected then, as I still expect today, to die at any time. But then, I think I deliberately invited death in many, sometimes insane ways. For instance, a merchant marine sailor who knew me and my reputation came into a bar carrying a package. He motioned me to follow him downstairs into the men's room. He unwrapped a stolen machine gun. He wanted to sell it. I said, how do I know it works? He loaded it with a cartridge clip and told me that all I would have to do then was squeeze the trigger release. I took the gun, examined it, and the first thing he knew, I had it jammed right up in his belly. I told him I would blow him wide open. He went backwards out of the restroom and up the stairs, the way Bill Bojangles Robinson used to dance going backwards. He knew I was crazy enough to kill him. I was insane enough not to consider that he might just wait his chance to kill me. For perhaps a month, I kept the machine gun at Shorty's before I was broke and sold it. When Reginald came to Roxbury visiting, he was shocked at what he'd found out upon returning to Harlem. I spent some time with him. He still was the kid brother, whom I still felt more family toward than I felt now even for our sister Ella. Ella still liked me. I would go to see her once in a while. But Ella had never been able to reconcile herself to the way I had changed. She has since told me that she had a steady foreboding that I was on my way into big trouble. But I always had the feeling that Ella somehow admired my rebellion against the world, because she, who had so much more drive and guts than most men, often felt stymied by having been born female. Had I been thinking only in terms of myself, maybe I would have chosen steady gambling as a hustle. There were enough chump gamblers that hung around John Hughes for a good gambler to make a living off them. Chumps that worked, usually. One would just have to never miss the games on their paydays. Besides, John Hughes had offered me a job dealing for games. I didn't want that. But I had come around to thinking not only of myself, I wanted to get something going that could help Shorty, too. We had been talking. I really felt sorry for Shorty. The same old musician story. The so-called glamour of being a musician, earning just about enough money so that after he paid rent and bought his reefers and food and other routine things, he had nothing left. Plus debts. How could Shorty have anything? I'd spent years in Harlem and on the road around the most popular musicians, the names even, who really were making big money for musicians, and they had nothing. For that matter, all the thousands of dollars I'd handled, and I had nothing. Just satisfying my cocaine habit alone cost me about $20 a day. I guess another $5 a day could have been added for reefers and plain tobacco cigarettes that I smoked. Besides getting high on drugs, I chain smoked as many as four packs a day. And if you ask me today, I'll tell you that tobacco, in all its forms, is just as much an addiction as any narcotic. When I opened the subject of a hustle with Shorty, I started by first bringing him to agree with my concept, of which he was a living proof, that only squares kept on believing they could ever get anything by slaving. And when I mentioned what I had in mind, house burglary, Shorty, who always had been so relatively conservative, really surprised me by how quickly he agreed. He didn't even know anything about burglarizing. When I began to explain how it was done, Shorty wanted to bring in this friend of his, whom I had met and liked, called Rudy. Rudy's mother was Italian. His father was a Negro. He was born right there in Boston, a short, light fellow, a pretty boy type. Rudy worked regularly for an employment agency that sent him to wait on tables at exclusive parties. He had a side deal going, a hustle that took me right back to the old steering days in Harlem. Once a week, Rudy went to the home of this old, rich, Boston blue blood, pillar of society aristocrat. He paid Rudy to undress them both, then pick up the old man like a baby, lay him on his bed, then stand over him and sprinkle him all over with talcum powder. Rudy said the old man would actually reach his climax from that. I told him and Shorty about some of the things I'd seen. Rudy said that as far as he knew, Boston had no organized specialty sex houses, just individual rich whites who had their private specialty desires catered to by Negroes who came to their homes camouflaged as chauffeurs, maids, waiters, or some other accepted image. Just as in New York, these were the rich, the highest society, the predominantly old men past the age of ability to conduct any kind of ordinary sex, always hunting for new ways to be sensitive. Rudy, I remember, spoke of one old white man who paid a black couple to let him watch them have intercourse on his bed. 
Another was so sensitive that he paid to sit on a chair outside a room where a couple was. He got his satisfaction just from imagining what was going on inside. A good burglary team includes, I knew, what is called a finder. A finder is one who locates lucrative places to rob. Another principal need is someone able to case these places' physical layouts to determine means of entry, the best getaway routes, and so forth. Rudy qualified on both counts. Being sent to work in rich homes, he wouldn't be suspected when he sized up their loot and cased the joint, just running around looking busy with a white coat on. Rudy's reaction when he was told what we had in mind was something I remember like, man, when do we start? But I wasn't rushing off half-cocked. I had learned from some of the pros and from my own experience how important it was to be careful and plan. Burglary, properly executed, though it had its dangers, offered the maximum chances of success with the minimum risk. If you did your job so that you never met any of your victims, it first lessened your chances of having to attack or perhaps kill someone. And if through some slip-up you were caught, later, by the police, there was never a positive eyewitness. It is also important to select an area of burglary and stick to that. There are specific specialities among burglars. Some work apartments only, others houses only, others stores only, or warehouses. Still others will go after only safes or strong boxes. Within the residence burglary category, there are further specialty distinctions. There are the day burglars, the dinner and theater time burglars, the night burglars. I think that any city's police will tell you that very rarely do they find one type who will work at another time. For instance, Jump Steady in Harlem was a nighttime apartment specialist. It would have been hard to persuade Jump Steady to work in the daytime if a millionaire had gone out for lunch and left his front door wide open. I had one very practical reason never to work in the daytime, aside from my inclinations. With my high visibility, I'd have been sunk in the daytime. I could just hear people. A reddish-brown Negro over six feet tall. One glance would be enough. Setting up what I wanted to be the perfect operation, I thought about pulling the white girls into it for two reasons. One was that I realized we'd be too limited relying only upon places where Rudy worked as a waiter. He didn't get to work in too many places. It wouldn't be very long before we ran out of sources. And when other places had to be found encased in the rich, white residential areas, Negroes hanging around would stick out like sore thumbs, but these white girls could get invited into the right places. I disliked the idea of having too many people involved all at the same time, but with Shorty and Sophia's sister so close now, and Sophia and me as though we had been together for 50 years, and Rudy as eager and cool as he was, nobody would be apt to spill. Everybody would be under the same risk. We would be like a family unit. I never doubted that Sophia would go along. Sophia would do anything I said and her sister would do anything that Sophia said. They both went for it. Sophia's husband was away on one of his trips to the coast when I told her and her sister. Most burglars I knew were caught not on the job, but trying to dispose of the loot. Finding the fence we used was a rare piece of luck. We agreed upon the plan for operations. The fence didn't work with us directly. He had a representative, an ex-con, who dealt with me and no one else in my gang. Aside from his regular business, he owned around Boston several garages and small warehouses. The arrangement was that before a job, I would alert the representative and give him a general idea of what we expected to get, and he'd tell me at which garage or warehouse we should make the drop. After we had made our drop, the representative would examine the stolen articles. He would remove all identifying marks from everything. Then he would call the fence, who would come and make a personal appraisal. The next day, the representative would meet me at a prearranged place and would make the payment for what we had stolen in cash. One thing I remember, this fence always sent your money in crisp, brand new bills. He was smart. Somehow that had a very definite psychological effect upon all of us. After we had pulled a job, walking around with that crisp green money in our pockets, he may have had other reasons. We needed a base of operations, not in Roxbury. The girls rented an apartment in Harvard Square. Unlike Negroes, these white girls could go shopping for the locale and physical situation we wanted. It was on the ground floor, where, moving late at night, all of us could come and go without attracting notice. In any organization, someone must be the boss. If it's even just one person, you've got to be the boss of yourself. At our gang's first meeting in the apartment, we discussed how we were going to work. The girls would get into houses to case them by ringing bells and saying they were saleswomen, poll takers, college girls making a survey, or anything else suitable. 
Once in the houses, they would get around as much as they could without attracting attention. Then, back, they would report what special valuables they had seen and where. They would draw the layout for Shorty, Rudy, and me. We agreed that the girls would actually burglarize only in special cases where there would be some advantage. But generally, the three men would go, two of us to do the job while the third kept watch in the getaway car with the motor running. Talking to them, laying down the plans, I had deliberately sat on a bed away from them. All of a sudden, I pulled out my gun, shook out all five bullets, and then let them see me put back only one bullet. I twirled the cylinder and put the muzzle to my head. Now I'm going to see how much guts all of you have, I said. I grinned at them. All of their mouths had flapped open. I pulled the trigger. We all heard it click. I'm going to do it again now. They begged me to stop. I could see in Shorty's and Rudy's eyes some idea of rushing me. We all heard the hammer click on another empty cylinder. The women were in hysterics. Rudy and Shorty were begging, Man, Red, cut it out, man. Freeze. I pulled the trigger once more. I'm doing this, showing you I'm not afraid to die, I told them. Never cross a man not afraid to die. Now let's get to work. I never had one moment's trouble with any of them after that. Sophia acted odd. Her sister all but called me Mr. Red. Shorty and Rudy were never again quite the same with me. Neither of them ever mentioned it. They thought I was crazy. They were afraid of me. We pulled the first job that night, the place of the old man who hired Rudy to sprinkle him with talcum powder. A cleaner job couldn't have been asked for. Everything went like clockwork. The fence was full of praise. He proved he meant it with his crisp new money. The old man later told Rudy how a small army of detectives had been there, and they decided that the job had the earmarks of some gang which had been operating around Boston for about a year. We quickly got it down to a science. The girls would scout and case in wealthy neighborhoods. The burglary would be pulled. Sometimes it took no more than 10 minutes. Shorty and I did most of the actual burglary. Rudy generally had the getaway car. If the people weren't at home, we'd use a passkey on a common door lock. On a patent lock, we'd use a jimmy, as it's called, or a lock pick. Or sometimes we would enter by windows from a fire escape or a roof. Gullible women often took the girls all over their houses just to hear them exclaiming over the finery. With the help of the girls' drawings and a finger beam searchlight, we went straight to the things we wanted. Sometimes the victims were in their beds asleep. That may sound very daring. Actually, it was almost easy. The first thing we had to do when people were in the house was to wait, very still, and pick up the sounds of breathing. Snorers we loved. They made it real easy. In stockinged feet, we'd go right into the bedrooms. Moving swiftly like shadows, we would lift clothes, watches, wallets, handbags, and jewelry boxes. The Christmas season was Santa Claus for us. People had expensive presents lying all over their houses, and they had taken more cash than usual out of their banks. Sometimes, working earlier than we usually did, we even worked houses that we hadn't cased. If the shades were drawn full and no lights were on, and there was no answer when one of the girls rang the bell, we would take the chance and go in. I can give you a very good tip if you want to keep burglars out of your house. A light on for the burglar to see is the very best single means of protection. One of the ideal things is to leave a bathroom light on all night. The bathroom is one place where somebody could be for any length of time at any time of the night, and he would be likely to hear the slightest strange sound. The burglar, knowing this, won't try to enter. It's also the cheapest possible protection. The kilowatts are a lot cheaper than your valuables. We became efficient. The fence sometimes relayed tips as to where we could find good loot. It was in this way that, for one period, one of our best periods, I remember, we specialized in oriental rugs. I have always suspected that the fence himself sold the rugs to the people we stole them from. But anyway, you wouldn't imagine the value of those things. I remember one small one that brought us $1,000. There's no telling what the fence got for it. Every burglar knew that fences robbed the burglars worse than the burglars had robbed the victims. Our only close brush with the law came once when we were making our getaway, three of us in the front seat of the car and the back seat loaded with stuff. Suddenly we saw a police car around the corner coming toward us and it went on past us. They were just cruising. But then in the rear view mirror, we saw them make a U-turn and we knew they were going to flash us to stop. They had spotted us in passing as Negroes and they knew that Negroes had no business in the area at that hour. It was a close situation. 
There was a lot of robbery going on. We weren't the only gang working. We knew, not by any means. But I knew that the white man is rare who will ever consider that a Negro can outsmart him. Before their light began flashing, I told Rudy to stop. I did what I'd done once before, got out and flagged them, walking toward them. When they stopped, I was at their car. I asked them, bumbling my words like a confused Negro, if they could tell me how to get to a Roxbury address. They told me, and we and they went on about our respective businesses. We were going along fine. We'd make a good pile and then lay low a while, living it up. Shorty still played with his band. Rudy never missed attending his sensitive old man or the table waiting at his exclusive parties. And the girls maintained their routine home schedules. Sometimes I still took the girls out to places where Shorty played and to other places, spending money as though it were going out of style, the girls dressed in jewelry and furs they had selected from our halls. No one knew our hustle, but it was clear that we were doing fine. And sometimes the girls would come over and we'd meet them either at Shorty's in Roxbury or in our Harvard Square place and just smoke reefers and play music. It's a shame to tell on a man, but Shorty was so obsessed with the white girl that even if the lights were out, he would pull up the shade to be able to see that white flesh by the street lamp from outside. Early evenings when we were laying low between jobs, I often went to a Massachusetts Avenue nightclub called the Savoy, and Sophia would telephone me there punctually. Even when we pulled jobs, I would leave from this club, then rush back there after the job. The reason was so that if it was ever necessary, people could testify that they had seen me at just about the time the job was pulled. Negroes being questioned by policemen would be very hard to pin down on any exact time. Boston at this time had two Negro detectives. Ever since I had come back on the Roxbury scene, one of these detectives, a dark brown fellow named Turner, had never been able to stand me and it was mutual. He talked about what he would do to me, and I had promptly put an answer back on the wire. I knew from the way he began to act that he had heard it. Everyone knew that I carried guns, and he did have sense enough to know that I wouldn't hesitate to use them, and on him, detective or not. This early evening, I was in this place when at the usual time, the phone in the booth rang. It rang just as this detective Turner happened to walk in through the front door. He saw me start to get up. He knew the call was for me but stepped inside the booth and answered. I heard him saying, looking straight at me, hello, hello, hello. And I knew that Sophia, taking no chances with the strange voice, had hung up. Wasn't that call for me? I asked Turner. He said that it was. I said, well, why didn't you say so? He gave me a rude answer. I knew he wanted me to make a move first. We both were being cagey. We both knew that we wanted to kill each other. Neither wanted to say the wrong thing. Turner didn't want to say anything that repeated, would make him sound bad. I didn't want to say anything that could be interpreted as a threat to a cop, but I remember exactly what I said to him anyway, purposely loud enough for some people at the bar to hear me. I said, you know, Turner, you're trying to make history. Don't you know that if you play with me, you certainly will go down in history because you've got to kill me? Turner looked at me. Then he backed down. He walked on by me. I guess he wasn't ready to make history. I had gotten to the point where I was walking on my own coffin. It's a law of the rackets that every criminal expects to get caught. He tries to stave off the inevitable for as long as he can. Drugs helped me push the thought to the back of my mind. They were the center of my life. I had gotten to the stage where every day I used enough drugs, reefers, cocaine, or both, so that I felt above any worries, any strains. If any worries did manage to push their way through to the surface of my consciousness, I could float them back where they came from until tomorrow and then until the next day. But where, always before, I had been able to smoke the reefers and to sniff the snow and rarely show it very much, by now it was not that easy. One week when we weren't working, after a big haul, I was just staying high, and I was out night clubbing. I came into this club, and from the bartender's face when he spoke, hello, Red, I knew that something was wrong, but I didn't ask him anything. I've always had this rule, never ask anybody in that kind of situation. They will tell you what they want you to know but the bartender didn't get a chance to tell me if he had meant to. When I sat down on a stool and ordered a drink, I saw them. Sophia and her sister sat at a table inside, near the dance floor, with a white man. I don't know how I ever made such a mistake as I next did. I could have talked to her later. I didn't know, or care, who the white fellow was. My cocaine told me to get up. It wasn't Sophia's husband. It was his closest friend. They had served in the war together. 
With her husband out of town, he had asked Sophia and her sister out to dinner, and they went. But then, later, after dinner, driving around, he had suddenly suggested going over to the Black Ghetto. Every Negro who lives in a city has seen the type a thousand times, the northern cracker who will go to visit Nigger Town to be amused at the Coons. The girl so well known in the Negro places in Roxbury had tried to change his mind, but he had insisted. So they had just held their breaths coming into this club where they had been a hundred times. They walked in stiff-eyeing the bartenders and waiters who caught their message and acted as though they never had seen them before. And they were sitting there with drinks before them, praying that no Negro who knew them would barge up to their table. Then up I came. I know I called them baby. They were chalky white. He was beet red. That same night, back at the Harvard Square place, I really got sick. It was less of a physical sickness than it was all of the last five years catching up. I was in my pajamas in bed, half asleep, when I heard someone knock. I knew that something was wrong. We all had keys. No one ever knocked at the door. I rolled off and under the bed. I was so groggy it didn't cross my mind to grab for my gun on the dresser. Under the bed, I heard the key turn, and I saw the shoes and pants cuffs walk in. I watched them walk around. I saw them stop. Every time they stopped, I knew what the eyes were looking at, and I knew before he did that he was going to get down and look under the bed. He did. It was Sophia's husband's friend. His face was about two feet from mine. It looked congealed. Ha, 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 I fooled you, didn't I? I said. It wasn't at all funny. I got out from under the bed, still fake laughing. He didn't run. I'll say that for him. He stood back. He watched me as though I were a snake. I didn't try to hide what he already knew. The girls had some things in the closets and around. He had seen all of that. We even talked some. I told him the girls weren't there, and he left. What shook me the most was realizing that I had trapped myself under the bed without a gun. I really was slipping. I had put a stolen watch into a jewelry shop to replace a broken crystal. It was about two days later when I went to pick up the watch that things fell apart. As I have said, a gun was as much a part of my dress as a necktie. I had my gun in a shoulder holster under my coat. The loser of the watch, the person from whom it had been stolen by us, I later found, had described the repair that it needed. It was a very expensive watch. That's why I had kept it for myself. And all of the jewelers in Boston had been alerted. The Jew waited until I had paid him before he laid the watch on the counter. He gave his signal, and this other fellow suddenly appeared from the back, walking toward me. One hand was in his pocket. I knew he was a cop. He said quietly, step into the back. Just as I started back there, an innocent Negro walked into the shop. I remember later hearing that he had just that day gotten out of the military. The detective, thinking he was with me, turned to him. There I was, wearing my gun, and the detective talking to that Negro with his back to me. Today I believe that Allah was with me even then. I didn't try to shoot him, and that saved my life. I remember that his name was Detective Slack. I raised my arm and motioned to him, here, take my gun. I saw his face when he took it. He was shocked. Because of the sudden appearance of the other Negro, he had never thought about a gun. It really moved him that I hadn't tried to kill him. Then, holding my gun in his hand, he signaled. And out from where they had been concealed walked two other detectives. They'd had me covered. One false move, I'd have been dead. I was going to have a long time in prison to think about that. If I hadn't been arrested right when I was, I could have been dead another way. Sophia's husband's friend had told her husband about me. And the husband had arrived that morning and had gone to the apartment with a gun, looking for me. He was at the apartment just about when they took me to the precinct. The detectives grilled me. They didn't beat me. They didn't even put a finger on me. And I knew it was because I hadn't tried to kill the detective. They got my address from some papers they found on me. The girls soon were picked up. Shorty was pulled right off the bandstand that night. The girls also had implicated Rudy. To this day, I have always marveled at how Rudy, somehow, got the word. And I know he must have caught the first thing smoking out of Boston, and he got away. They never got him. I have thought a thousand times, I guess, about how I so narrowly escaped death twice that day. That's why I believe that everything is written. The cops found the apartment loaded with evidence, fur coats, some jewelry, other small stuff, plus the tools of our trade. A jimmy, a lockpick, glass cutters, screwdrivers, pencil beam flashlights, false keys, and my small arsenal of guns. The girls got low bail. They were still white, burglars or not. Their worst crime was their involvement with Negroes. 
But Shorty and I had bail set at $10,000 each, which they knew we were nowhere near able to raise. The social workers worked on us. White women in league with Negroes was their main obsession. The girls weren't so-called tramps or trash. They were well-to-do upper-middle-class whites. That bothered the social workers and the forces of the law more than anything else. How, where, when had I met them? Did we sleep together? Nobody wanted to know anything at all about the robberies. All they could see was that we had taken the white man's women. I just looked at the social workers. Now, what do you think? Even the court clerks and the bailiffs. Nice white girls. Goddamn niggers. It was the same even from our court-appointed lawyers as we sat down, under guard, at a table as our hearing assembled. Before the judge entered, I said to one lawyer, we seem to be getting sentenced because of those girls. He got red from the neck up and shuffled his papers. You had no business with white girls. Later, when I had learned the full truth about the white man, I reflected many times that the average burglary sentence for a first offender, as we all were, was about two years. But we weren't going to get the average, not for our crime. I want to say before I go on that I have never previously told anyone my sordid past in detail. I haven't done it now to sound as though I might be proud of how bad, how evil I was. But people are always speculating, why am I as I am? To understand that of any person, his whole life, from birth, must be reviewed. All of our experiences fuse into our personality. Everything that ever happened to us is an ingredient. Today, when everything that I do has an urgency, I would not spend one hour in the preparation of a book, which had the ambition to perhaps titillate some readers. But I am spending many hours because the full story is the best way that I know to have it seen and understood that I had sunk to the very bottom of the American white man society when, soon now, in prison, I found Allah and the religion of Islam, and it completely transformed my life. Chapter 10. Satan. Shorty didn't know what the word concurrently meant. Somehow, Lansing to Boston bus fare had been scraped up by Shorty's old mother. Son, read the book of Revelations and pray to God, she had kept telling Shorty, visiting him, and once me, while we awaited our sentencing. Shorty had read the Bible's Revelation pages. He had actually gotten down on his knees, praying like some Negro Baptist deacon. Then we were looking up at the judge in Middlesex County Court. Our, I think, 14 counts of crime were committed in that county. Shorty's mother was sitting, sobbing with her head, bowing up and down to her Jesus over near Ella and Reginald. Shorty was the first of us called to stand up. Count one, eight to ten years. Count two, eight to ten years. Count three. And finally, the sentences to run concurrently. Shorty, sweating so hard that his black face looked as though it had been greased, and not understanding the word concurrently, had counted in his head to probably over a hundred years. He cried out. He began slumping. The bailiffs had to catch and support him. In eight to ten seconds, Shorty had turned as atheist as I had been to start with. I got ten years. The girls got one to five years in the women's reformatory at Framingham, Massachusetts. This was in February 1946. I wasn't quite 21. I had not even started shaving. They took Shorty and me, handcuffed together, to the Charlestown State Prison. I can't remember any of my prison numbers. That seems surprising, even after the dozen years since I have been out of prison. Because your number in prison became part of you. You never heard your name, only your number. On all of your clothing, every item, was your number stenciled. It grew stenciled on your brain. Any person who claims to have deep feeling for other human beings should think a long, long time before he votes to have other men kept behind bars, caged. I am not saying there shouldn't be prisons, but there shouldn't be bars. Behind bars, a man never reforms. He will never forget. He never will get completely over the memory of the bars. After he gets out, his mind tries to erase the experience, but he can't. I've talked with numerous former convicts. It has been very interesting to me to find that all of our minds had blotted away many details of years in prison. But in every case, he will tell you that he can't forget those bars. As a fish, prison slang for a new inmate at Charlestown, I was physically miserable and as evil-tempered as a snake, being suddenly without drugs. The cells didn't have running water. The prison had been built in 1805 in Napoleon's day and was even styled after the Bastille. In the dirty, cramped cell, I could lie on my cot and touch both walls. The toilet was a covered pail. 
I don't care how strong you are. You can't stand having to smell a whole cell row of defecation. The prison psychologist interviewed me, and he got called every filthy name I could think of. And the prison chaplain got called worse. My first letter, I remember, was from my religious brother Philbert in Detroit telling me his holiness church was going to pray for me. I scrawled him a reply I'm ashamed to think of today. Ella was my first visitor. I remember seeing her catch herself, then try to smile at me, now in the faded dungarees stenciled with my number. Neither of us could find much to say until I wished she hadn't come at all. The guards with guns watched about 50 convicts and visitors. I have heard scores of new prisoners swearing back in their cells that when free their first act, would be to waylay those visiting room guards. Hatred often focused on them. I first got high in Charlestown on nutmeg. My cellmate was among at least a hundred nutmeg men who, for money or cigarettes, bought from kitchen worker inmates penny matchboxes full of stolen nutmeg. I grabbed a box as though it were a pound of heavy drugs. Stirred into a glass of cold water, a penny matchbox full of nutmeg had the kick of three or four reefers. With some money sent by Ella, I was finally able to buy stuff for better highs from guards in the prison. I got reefers, Nembutal, and Benzedrine. Smuggling to prisoners was the guard's sideline. Every prison's inmates know that's how guards make most of their living. I served a total of seven years in prison. Now, when I try to separate that first year plus that I spent at Charlestown, it runs all together in a memory of nutmeg and the other semi-drugs, of cursing guards, throwing things out of my cell, balking in the lines, dropping my tray in the dining hall, refusing to answer my number, claiming I forgot it, and things like that. I preferred the solitary that this behavior brought me. I would pace for hours like a caged leopard, viciously cursing aloud to myself and my favorite targets were the Bible and God. But there was a legal limit to how much time one could be kept in solitary. Eventually, the men in the cell block had a name for me, Satan, because of my anti-religious attitude. The first man I met in prison who made any positive impression on me, whatever was a fellow inmate, Bimby. I met him in 1947 at Charlestown. He was a light, kind of red-complexioned Negro, as I was, about my height, and he had freckles. Bimby, an old-time burglar, had been in many prisons. In the license plate shop where our gang worked, he operated the machine that stamped out the numbers. I was along the conveyor belt where the numbers were painted. Bimby was the first Negro convict I'd known who didn't respond to, what you know, daddy. Often, after we had done our day's license plate quota, we would sit around, perhaps 15 of us, and listen to Bimby. Normally, White prisoners wouldn't think of listening to Negro prisoners' opinions on anything, but guards, even, would wander over close to hear Bimby on any subject. He would have a cluster of people riveted, often on odd subjects you never would think of. He would prove to us, dipping into the science of human behavior, that the only difference between us and outside people was that we had been caught. He liked to talk about historical events and figures. When he talked about the history of Concord, where I was to be transferred later, you would have thought he was hired by the Chamber of Commerce, and I wasn't the first inmate who had never heard of Thoreau until Bimby expounded upon him. Bimby was known as the library's best customer. What fascinated me with him most of all was that he was the first man I had ever seen command total respect with his words. Bimby seldom said much to me. He was gruff to individuals, but I sensed he liked me. What made me seek his friendship was when I heard him discuss religion. I considered myself beyond atheism. I was Satan. But Bimby put the atheist philosophy in a framework, so to speak. That ended my vicious cursing attacks. My approach sounded so weak alongside his, and he never used a foul word. Out of the blue one day, Bimby told me flatly, as was his way, that I had some brains if I'd used them. I had wanted his friendship, not that kind of advice. I might have cursed another convict, but nobody cursed Bimby. He told me I should take advantage of the prison correspondence courses and the library. When I had finished the eighth grade back in Mason, Michigan, that was the last time I'd thought of studying anything that didn't have some hustle purpose. And the streets had erased everything I'd ever learned in school. I didn't know a verb from a house. My sister Hilda had written a suggestion that, if possible in prison, I should study English and penmanship. She had barely been able to read a couple of picture postcards I had sent her when I was selling reefers on the road. So, feeling I had time on my hands, I did begin a correspondence course in English. 
When the mimeographed listings of available books passed from cell to cell, I would put my number next to titles that appealed to me, which weren't already taken. Through the correspondence exercises and lessons, some of the mechanics of grammar gradually began to come back to me. After about a year, I guess, I could write a decent and legible letter. About then, too, influenced by having heard Bimby often explain word derivations, I quietly started another correspondence course in Latin. Under Bimby's tutelage, too, I had gotten myself some little cell block swindles going. For packs of cigarettes, I beat just about anyone at Domino's. I always had several cartons of cigarettes in my cell. They were, in prison, nearly as valuable a medium of exchange as money. I booked cigarette and money bets on fights and ball games. I'll never forget the prison sensation created that day in April 1947 when Jackie Robinson was brought up to play with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Jackie Robinson had then his most fanatic fan in me. When he played, my ear was glued to the radio, and no game ended without my refiguring his average up through his last turn at bat. One day in 1948, after I had been transferred to Concord Prison, my brother Filbert, who was forever joining something, wrote me this time that he had discovered the natural religion for the black man. He belonged now, he said, to something called the Nation of Islam. He said I should pray to Allah for deliverance. I wrote Filbert a letter which, although in improved English, was worse than my earlier reply to his news that I was being prayed for by His Holiness Church. When a letter from Reginald arrived, I never dreamed of associating the two letters, although I knew that Reginald had been spending a lot of time with Wilfred, Hilda, and Filbert in Detroit. Reginald's letter was newsy, and also it contained this instruction. Malcolm, don't eat any more pork and don't smoke any more cigarettes. I'll show you how to get out of prison. My automatic response was to think he had come upon some way I could work a hype on the penal authorities. I went to sleep and woke up trying to figure what kind of a hype it could be. Something psychological, such as my act with the New York Draft Board? Could I, after going without pork and smoking no cigarettes for a while, claim some physical trouble that could bring about my release? Get out of prison. The words hung in the air around me. I wanted out so badly. I wanted, in the worst way, to consult with Bimby about it. But something big, instinct said, you spilled to nobody. Quitting cigarettes wasn't going to be too difficult. I had been conditioned by days in solitary without cigarettes. Whatever this chance was, I wasn't going to fluff it. After I read that letter, I finished the pack I then had open. I haven't smoked another cigarette to this day since 1948. It was about three or four days later when pork was served for the noon meal. I wasn't even thinking about pork when I took my seat at the long table. Sit, grab, gobble, stand, file out. That was the Emily Post in prison eating. When the meat platter was passed to me, I didn't even know what the meat was. Usually you couldn't tell anyway. But it was suddenly as though don't eat any more pork flashed on a screen before me. I hesitated with the platter in midair. Then I passed it along to the inmate waiting next to me. He began serving himself. Abruptly, he stopped. I remember him turning, looking surprised at me. I said to him, I don't eat pork. The platter then kept on down the table. It was the funniest thing, the reaction, and the way that it spread. In prison, where so little breaks the monotonous routine, the smallest thing causes a commotion of talk. It was being mentioned all over the cell block by night that Satan didn't eat pork. It made me very proud, in some odd way. One of the universal images of the Negro in prison and out, was that he couldn't do without pork. It made me feel good to see that my not eating it had especially startled the white convicts. Later I would learn, when I had read and studied Islam a good deal, that, unconsciously, my first pre-Islamic submission had been manifested. I had experienced for the first time the Muslim teaching, if you will take one step toward Allah, Allah will take two steps toward you. My brothers and sisters in Detroit and Chicago had all become converted to what they were being taught was the natural religion for the black man of which Filbert had written to me. They all prayed for me to become converted while I was in prison. But after Filbert reported my vicious reply, they discussed what was the best thing to do. They had decided that Reginald, the latest convert, the one to whom I felt closest, would best know how to approach me, since he knew me so well in the street life. Independently of all this, my sister Ella had been steadily working to get me transferred to the Norfolk, Massachusetts prison colony, which was an experimental rehabilitation jail. In other prisons, convicts often said that if you had the right money or connections, 
You could get transferred to this colony whose penal policies sounded almost too good to be true. Somehow, Ella's efforts in my behalf were successful in late 1948, and I was transferred to Norfolk. The colony was, comparatively, a heaven in many respects. It had flushing toilets, there were no bars, only walls, and within the walls, you had far more freedom. There was plenty of fresh air to breathe. It was not in a city. There were 24 house units, 50 men living in each unit, if memory serves me correctly. This would mean that the colony had a total of around 1,200 inmates. Each house had three floors, and greatest blessing of all, each inmate had his own room. About 15% of the inmates were Negroes, distributed about five to nine Negroes in each house. Norfolk Prison Colony represented the most enlightened form of prison that I have ever heard of. In place of the atmosphere of malicious gossip, perversion, grafting, hateful guards, there was more relative culture as culture is interpreted in prisons. A high percentage of the Norfolk Prison Colony inmates went in for intellectual things, group discussions, debates, and such. Instructors for the educational rehabilitation programs came from Harvard, Boston University, and other educational institutions in the area. The visiting rules, far more lenient than other prisons, permitted visitors almost every day and allowed them to stay two hours. You had your choice of sitting alongside your visitor or facing each other. Norfolk Prison Colony's library was one of its outstanding features. A millionaire named Parkhurst had willed his library there. He had probably been interested in the rehabilitation program. History and religions were his special interests. Thousands of his books were on the shelves, and in the back were boxes and crates full for which there wasn't space on the shelves. At Norfolk, we could actually go into the library with permission, walk up and down the shelves, pick books. There were hundreds of old volumes, some of them probably quite rare. I read aimlessly until I learned to read selectively with a purpose. I hadn't heard from Reginald in a good while after I got to Norfolk Prison Colony, but I had come in there not smoking cigarettes or eating pork when it was served. That caused a bit of eyebrow raising. Then a letter from Reginald telling me when he was coming to see me. By the time he came, I was really keyed up to hear the hype he was going to explain. Reginald knew how my street hustler mind operated. That's why his approach was so effective. He had always dressed well, and now, when he came to visit, was carefully groomed. I was aching with wanting the no pork and cigarettes, Riddle answered. But he talked about the family, what was happening in Detroit, Harlem, the last time he was there. I have never pushed anyone to tell me anything before he is ready. The offhand way Reginald talked and acted made me know that something big was coming. He said finally, as though it had just happened to come into his mind, Malcolm, if a man knew every imaginable thing that there is to know, who would he be? Back in Harlem, he had often liked to get at something through this kind of indirection. It had often irritated me because my way had always been direct. I looked at him. Well, he would have to be some kind of a god, Reginald said. There's a man who knows everything. I asked, who is that? Who is? God is a man, Reginald said. His real name is Allah. Allah. That word came back to me from Filbert's letter. It was my first hint of any connection. But Reginald went on. He said that God had 360 degrees of knowledge. He said that 360 degrees represented the sum total of knowledge. To say I was confused is an understatement. I don't have to remind you of the background against which I sat, hearing my brother Reginald talk like this. I just listened, knowing he was taking his time in putting me onto something. And if somebody is trying to put you onto something, you need to listen. The devil has only 33 degrees of knowledge, known as masonry, Reginald said. I can so specifically remember the exact phrases since, later, I was going to teach them so many times to others. The devil uses his masonry to rule other people. He told me that this God had come to America and that he had made himself known to a man named Elijah, a black man, just like us. This God had let Elijah know, Reginald said, that the devil's time was up. I didn't know what to think. I just listened. The devil is also a man, Reginald said. What do you mean? With a slight movement of his head, Reginald indicated some white inmates and their visitors talking, as we were, across the room. Them, he said, the white man is the devil. He told me that all whites knew they were devils, especially Masons. I never will forget. My mind was involuntarily flashing across the entire spectrum of white people I had ever known, and for some reason it stopped upon Jaime, the Jew, who had been so good to me. 
Reginald a couple of times had gone out with me to that Long Island bootlegging operation to buy and bottle up the bootleg liquor for Jaime. I said, without any exception? Without any exception. What about Jaime? What is it if I let you make $500 to let me make 10000 After Reginald left, I thought, I thought, thought, I couldn't make of it head or tail or middle. The white people I had known marched before my mind's eye from the start of my life. The state white people always in our house, after the other whites I didn't know, had killed my father. The white people who kept calling my mother crazy to her face and before me and my brothers and sisters until she finally was taken off by white people to the Kalamazoo Asylum, the white judge and others who had split up the children, the Swirlins, the other whites around Mason, white youngsters I was in school there with, and the teachers, the one who told me in the eighth grade to be a carpenter because thinking of being a lawyer was foolish for a Negro. My head swam with the parading faces of white people, the ones in Boston, in the white-only dances at the Roseland Ballroom where I shined their shoes, at the Parker House where I took their dirty plates back to the kitchen, the railroad crewmen and passengers, Sophia, the whites in New York City, the cops, the white criminals I dealt with, the whites who piled into the Negro speakeasies for a taste of Negro soul, the white women who wanted Negro men, the men I'd steered to the black specialty sex they wanted, the fence back in Boston and his ex-con representative, Boston cops, Sophia's husband's friend and her husband, whom I'd never seen but knew so much about, Sophia's sister, the Jew jeweler who'd helped trap me, the social workers, the Middlesex County Court people, the judge who gave me 10 years, the prisoners I'd known, the guards and the officials. A celebrity among the Norfolk prison colony inmates was a rich, older fellow, a paralytic called John. He had killed his baby, one of those mercy killings. He was a proud, big-shot type, always reminding everyone that he was a 33 RD degree Mason and what powers Masons had, that only Masons ever had been U.S. presidents, that Masons in distress could secretly signal to judges and other Masons in powerful positions. I kept thinking about what Reginald had said. I wanted to test it with John. He worked in a soft job in the prison school. I went over there. John, I said, how many degrees in a circle? He said, 360. I drew a square. How many degrees in that? He said, 360. I asked him, was 360 degrees then the maximum of degrees in anything? He said, yes. I said, well, why is it that Masons go only to 33 degrees? He had no satisfactory answer. But for me, the answer was that Masonry actually is only 33 degrees of the religion of Islam, which is the full projection forever denied to Masons, although they know it exists. Reginald, when he came to visit me again in a few days, could gauge from my attitude the effect that his talking had had upon me. He seemed very pleased. Then, very seriously, he talked for two solid hours about the devil white man and the brainwashed black man. When Reginald left, he left me rocking with some of the first serious thoughts I had ever had in my life, that the white man was fast losing his power to oppress and exploit the dark world that the dark world was starting to rise to rule the world again, as it had before, that the white man's world was on the way down, it was on the way out. You don't even know who you are, Reginald had said. You don't even know the white devil has hidden it from you, that you are a race of people of ancient civilizations and riches in gold and kings. You don't even know your true family name. You wouldn't recognize your true language if you heard it. You have been cut off by the devil white man from all true knowledge of your own kind. You have been a victim of the evil of the devil white man ever since he murdered and raped and stole you from your native land and the seeds of your forefathers. I began to receive at least two letters every day from my brothers and sisters in Detroit. My oldest brother, Wilfred, wrote, and his first wife, Bertha, the mother of his two children, since her death, Wilfred has met and married his present wife, Ruth. Philbert wrote, and my sister, Hilda, and Reginald visited staying in Boston a while before he went back to Detroit, where he had been the most recent of them to be converted. They were all Muslims, followers of a man they described to me as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, a small gentleman whom they sometimes referred to as the Messenger of Allah. He was, they said, a black man like us. He had been born in America on a farm in Georgia. He had moved with his family to Detroit, and there had met a Mr. Wallace D. Fard, who he claimed was God in person. Mr. Wallace Defard had given to Elijah Muhammad Allah's message for the black people who were 
the lost foundation of Islam here in this wilderness of North America, all of them urged me to accept the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Reginald explained that pork was not eaten by those who worshipped in the religion of Islam, and not smoking cigarettes was a rule of the followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad because they did not take injurious things such as narcotics, tobacco, or liquor into their bodies. Over and over I read and heard, the key to a Muslim is submission, the attunement of one toward Allah. And what they termed the true knowledge of the black man that was possessed by the followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was given shape for me in their lengthy letters, sometimes containing printed literature. The true knowledge, reconstructed much more briefly than I received it, was that history had been whitened in the white man's history books, and that the black man had been brainwashed for hundreds of years. Original man was black in the continent called Africa, where the human race had emerged on the planet Earth. The black man, original man, built great empires and civilizations and cultures while the white man was still living on all fours in caves. The devil white man, down through history, out of his devilish nature, had pillaged, murdered, raped, and exploited every race of man not white. Human history's greatest crime was the traffic in black flesh when the devil white man went into Africa and murdered and kidnapped to bring to the West in chains, in slave ships, millions of black men, women, and children who were worked and beaten and tortured as slaves. The devil white man cut these black people off from all knowledge of their own kind and cut them off from any knowledge of their own language, religion, and past culture until the black man in America was the earth's only race of people who had absolutely no knowledge of his true identity. In one generation, the black slave women in America had been raped by the slave master white man until there had begun to emerge a homemade, handmade, brainwashed race that was no longer even of its true color, that no longer even knew its true family names. The slave master forced his family name upon this rape-mixed race, which the slave master began to call the Negro. This Negro was taught of his native Africa that it was peopled by heathen, black savages, swinging like monkeys from trees. This Negro accepted this, along with every other teaching of the slave master that was designed to make him accept and obey and worship the white man. And where the religion of every other people on earth taught its believers of a God with whom they could identify, a God who at least looked like one of their own kind, the slave master injected his Christian religion into this Negro. This Negro was taught to worship an alien god having the same blonde hair, pale skin, and blue eyes as the slave master. This religion taught the Negro that black was a curse. It taught him to hate everything black, including himself. It taught him that everything white was good, to be admired, respected, and loved. It brainwashed this Negro to think he was superior if his complexion showed more of the white pollution of the slave master. This white man's Christian religion further deceived and brainwashed this Negro to always turn the other cheek and grin and scrape and bow and be humble and to sing and to pray and to take whatever was dished out by the devilish white man and to look for his pie in the sky and for his heaven in the hereafter while right here on earth the slave master white man enjoyed his heaven. Many a time I have looked back, trying to assess, just for myself, my first reactions to all this. Every instinct of the ghetto jungle streets, every hustling fox and criminal wolf instinct in me, which would have scoffed at and rejected anything else, was struck numb. It was as though all of that life merely was back there, without any remaining effect or influence. I remember how, sometime later, reading the Bible in the Norfolk Prison Colony Library, I came upon, then I read, over and over, how Paul on the road to Damascus, upon hearing the voice of Christ, was so smitten that he was knocked off his horse in a daze. I do not now, and I did not then, liken myself to Paul, but I do understand his experience. I have since learned, helping me to understand what then began to happen within me, that the truth can be quickly received, or received at all, only by the sinner who knows and admits that he is guilty of having sinned much. Stated another way, only guilt admitted accepts truth. The Bible again. The one people whom Jesus could not help were the Pharisees. They didn't feel they needed any help. The very enormity of my previous life's guilt prepared me to accept the truth. Not for weeks yet would I deal with the direct personal application to myself as a black man of the truth. It still was like a blinding light. 
Reginald left Boston and went back to Detroit. I would sit in my room and stare. At the dining room table, I would hardly eat, only drink the water. I nearly starved. Fellow inmates, concerned and guards apprehensive, asked what was wrong with me. It was suggested that I visit the doctor, and I didn't. The doctor, advised, visited me. I don't know what his diagnosis was, probably that I was working on some act. I was going through the hardest thing, also the greatest thing, for any human being to do, to accept that which is already within you and around you. I learned later that my brothers and sisters in Detroit put together the money for my sister Hilda to come and visit me. She told me that when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was in Detroit, he would stay as a guest at my brother Wilfred's home, which was on McKay Street. Hilda kept urging me to write to Mr. Muhammad. He understood what it was to be in the white man's prison, she said, because he himself had not long before gotten out of the federal prison at Milan, Michigan, where he had served five years for evading the draft. Hilda said that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad came to Detroit to reorganize his Temple No. 1, which had become disorganized during his prison time. But he lived in Chicago, where he was organizing and building his Temple No. 2. It was Hilda who said to me, would you like to hear how the white man came to this planet Earth? And she told me that key lesson of Mr. Elijah Muhammad's teachings, which I later learned was the demonology that every religion has, called Yaqub's history. Elijah Muhammad teaches his followers that first, the moon separated from the earth. Then, the first humans, original man, were a black people. They founded the holy city Mecca. Among this black race were 24 wise scientists. One of the scientists, at odds with the rest, created the especially strong black tribe of Shabazz, from which America's Negroes, so-called, descend. About 6,600 years ago, when 70% of the people were satisfied and 30% were dissatisfied, among the dissatisfied was born a Mr. Yaqub. He was born to create trouble, to break the peace, and to kill. His head was unusually large. When he was four years old, he began school. At the age of 18, Yaqub had finished all of his nation's colleges and universities. He was known as the Big Head Scientist. Among many other things, he had learned how to breed races scientifically. This Big Head Scientist, Mr. Yaqub, began preaching in the streets of Mecca, making such hosts of converts that the authorities, increasingly concerned, finally exiled him with 59,999 followers to the island of Patmos, described in the Bible as the island where John received the message contained in Revelations in the New Testament. Though he was a black man, Mr. Yaqub, embittered toward Allah now, decided, as revenge, to create upon the earth a devil race, a bleached-out white race of people. From his studies, the big-head scientist knew that black men contained two germs, black and brown. He knew that the brown germ stayed dormant as, being the lighter of the two germs, it was the weaker. Mr. Yaqub, to upset the law of nature, conceived the idea of employing what we today know as the recessive gene structure to separate from each other the two germs, black and brown, and then grafting the brown germ to progressively lighter, weaker stages. The humans resulting, he knew, would be, as they became lighter and weaker, progressively also more susceptible to wickedness and evil. And in this way, finally, he would achieve the intended bleached-out white race of devils. He knew that it would take him several total color change stages to get from black to white. Mr. Yaqub began his work by setting up a eugenics law on the island of Patmos. Among Mr. Yaqub's 59,999 all-black followers, every third or so child that was born would show some trace of brown. As these became adult, only brown and brown, or black and brown, were permitted to marry. As their children were born, Mr. Yaqub's law dictated that if a black child, the attending nurse, or midwife should stick a needle into its brain and give the body to cremators. The mothers were told it had been an angel baby, which had gone to heaven to prepare a place for her. But a brown child's mother was told to take very good care of it. Others, assistants, were trained by Mr. Yaqub to continue his objective. Mr. Yaqub, when he died on the island at the age of 152, had left laws and rules for them to follow. According to the teachings of Mr. Elijah Muhammad, Mr. Yaqub, except in his mind, never saw the bleached out devil race that his procedures and laws and rules created. A 200 year span was needed to eliminate on the island of Patmos all of the black people until only brown people remained. 
The next 200 years were needed to create from the brown race the red race, with no more browns left on the island. In another 200 years from the red race was created the yellow race. 200 years later, the white race had at last been created. On the island of Patmos was nothing but these blonde, pale-skinned, cold, blue-eyed devils, savages, nude, and shameless. Hairy like animals, they walked on all fours and they lived in trees. 600 more years passed before this race of people returned to the mainland among the natural black people. Mr. Elijah Muhammad teaches his followers that within six months' time, through telling lies that set the black men fighting among each other, this devil race had turned what had been a peaceful heaven on earth into a hell torn by quarreling and fighting. But finally, the original black people recognized that their sudden troubles stemmed from this devil white race that Mr. Jacob had made. They rounded them up, put them in chains. With little aprons to cover their nakedness, this devil race was marched off across the Arabian desert to the caves of Europe. The lambskin and the cable toe used in masonry today are symbolic of how the nakedness of the white man was covered when he was chained and driven across the hot sand. Mr. Elijah Muhammad further teaches that the white devil race in Europe's caves was savage. The animals tried to kill him. He climbed trees outside his cave, made clubs, trying to protect his family from the wild beasts outside, trying to get in. When this devil race had spent 2,000 years in the caves, Allah raised up Moses to civilize them and bring them out of the caves. It was written that this devil white race would rule the world for 6,000 years. The books of Moses are missing. That's why it is not known that he was in the caves. When Moses arrived, the first of these devils to accept his teachings, the first he let out, were those we call today the Jews. According to the teachings of this Jacob's history, when the Bible says, Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, that serpent is symbolic of the devil white race, Moses lifted up out of the caves of Europe, teaching them civilization. It was written that after Jacob's bleached white race had ruled the world for 6,000 years, down to our time, the black original race would give birth to one whose wisdom, knowledge, and power would be infinite. It was written that some of the original black people should be brought as slaves to North America to learn to better understand at first hand the white devil's true nature in modern times. Elijah Muhammad teaches that the greatest and mightiest God who appeared on the earth was Master W.D. Fard. He came from the east to the west, appearing in North America at a time when the history and the prophecy that is written was coming to realization as the non-white people all over the world began to rise, and as the devil white civilization condemned by Allah was, through its devilish nature, destroying itself. Master W.D. Fard was half black and half white. He was made in this way to enable him to be accepted by the black people in America and to lead them, while at the same time he was enabled to move undiscovered among the white people so that he could understand and judge the enemy of the blacks. Master W.D. Fard in 1931, posing as a seller of silks, met, in Detroit, Michigan, Elijah Muhammad. Master W.D. Fard gave to Elijah Muhammad Allah's message and Allah's divine guidance to save the lost found nation of Islam, the so-called Negroes, here in this wilderness of North America. When my sister Hilda had finished telling me this Jacob's history, she left. I don't know if I was able to open my mouth and say goodbye. I was to learn later that Elijah Muhammad's tales, like this one of Yaqub, infuriated the Muslims of the East. While at Mecca, I reminded them that it was their fault, since they themselves hadn't done enough to make real Islam known in the West. Their silence left a vacuum into which any religious faker could step and mislead our people. Chapter 11. Saved. I did write to Elijah Muhammad. He lived in Chicago at that time, at 6116 South Michigan Avenue. At least 25 times, I must have written that first one-page letter to him over and over. I was trying to make it both legible and understandable. I practically couldn't read my handwriting myself. It shames even to remember it. My spelling and my grammar were as bad, if not worse. Anyway, as well as I could express it, I said I had been told about him by my brothers and sisters, and I apologized for my poor letter. Mr. Muhammad sent me a typed reply. It had an all but electrical effect upon me to see the signature of the messenger of Allah. After he welcomed me into the true knowledge, he gave me something to think about. The black prisoner, he said, symbolized white society's crime of keeping black men oppressed and deprived and ignorant and unable to get decent jobs, turning them into criminals. He told me to have courage. He even enclosed some money for me, a $5 bill. Mr. Muhammad sends money all over the country to prison inmates who write to him, probably to this day. 
Regularly, my family wrote to me, turn to Allah, pray to the East. The hardest test I ever faced in my life was praying. You understand, my comprehending, my believing the teachings of Mr. Muhammad had only required my mind saying to me, that's right, or I never thought of that. But bending my knees to pray, that act, well, that took me a week. You know what my life had been. Picking a lock to rob someone's house was the only way my knees had ever been bent before. I had to force myself to bend my knees, and waves of shame and embarrassment would force me back up. For evil to bend its knees, admitting its guilt, to implore the forgiveness of God, is the hardest thing in the world. It's easy for me to see and to say that now. But then, when I was the personification of evil, I was going through it. Again, again, I would force myself back down into the praying to Allah posture. When finally I was able to make myself stay down, I didn't know what to say to Allah. For the next years, I was the nearest thing to a hermit in the Norfolk prison colony. I never have been more busy in my life. I still marvel at how swiftly my previous life's thinking pattern slid away from me, like snow off a roof. It is as though someone else I knew of had lived by hustling and crime. I would be startled to catch myself thinking in a remote way of my earlier self as another person. The things I felt, I was pitifully unable to express in the one-page letter that went every day to Mr. Elijah Muhammad. And I wrote at least one more daily letter, replying to one of my brothers and sisters. Every letter I received from them added something to my knowledge of the teachings of Mr. Muhammad. I would sit for long periods and study his photographs. I've never been one for inaction. Everything I've ever felt strongly about, I've done something about. I guess that's why, unable to do anything else, I soon began writing to people I had known in the hustling world, such as Sammy the Pimp, John Hughes, the gambling house owner, the thief Jump Steady, and several dope peddlers. I wrote them all about Allah and Islam and Mr. Elijah Muhammad. I had no idea where most of them lived. I addressed their letters in care of the Harlem or Roxbury bars and clubs where I'd known them. I never got a single reply. The average hustler and criminal was too uneducated to write a letter. I have known many slick, sharp-looking hustlers who would have you think they had an interest in Wall Street. Privately, they would get someone else to read a letter if they received one. Besides, neither would I have replied to anyone writing me something as wild as, the white man is the devil. What certainly went on the Harlem and Roxbury wires was that Detroit Red was going crazy in stir, or else he was trying some hype to shake up the warden's office. During the years that I stayed in the Norfolk prison colony, never did any official directly say anything to me about those letters, although, of course, they all passed through the prison censorship. I'm sure, however, they monitored what I wrote to add to the files which every state and federal prison keeps on the conversion of Negro inmates by the teachings of Mr. Elijah Muhammad. But at that time, I felt that the real reason was that the white man knew that he was the devil. Later on, I even wrote to the mayor of Boston, to the governor of Massachusetts, and to Harry S. Truman. They never answered. They probably never even saw my letters. I hand scratched to them how the white man's society was responsible for the black man's condition in this wilderness of North America. It was because of my letters that I happened to stumble upon starting to acquire some kind of a homemade education. I became increasingly frustrated at not being able to express what I wanted to convey in letters that I wrote, especially those to Mr. Elijah Muhammad. In the street, I had been the most articulate hustler out there. I had commanded attention when I said something. But now, trying to write simple English, I not only wasn't articulate, I wasn't even functional. How would I sound writing in slang, the way I would say it? Something such as, look, daddy, let me pull your coat about a cat, Elijah Muhammad. Many who today hear me somewhere in person or on television or those who read something I've said will think I went to school far beyond the eighth grade. This impression is due entirely to my prison studies. It had really begun back in the Charlestown prison when Bimby first made me feel envy of his stock of knowledge. Bimby had always taken charge of any conversation he was in, and I had tried to emulate him. But every book I picked up had few sentences, which didn't contain anywhere from one to nearly all of the words that might as well have been in Chinese. When I just skipped those words, of course, I really ended up with little idea of what the book said. So I had come to the Norfolk prison colony still going through only book reading motions. Pretty soon, I would have quit even these motions, unless I had received the motivation that I did. I saw that the best thing I could do was get hold of a dictionary, to study, to learn some words. I was lucky enough to reason also that I should try to improve my penmanship. It was sad. I couldn't even write in a straight line. 
It was both ideas together that moved me to request a dictionary, along with some tablets and pencils from the Norfolk Prison Colony School. I spent two days just riffling uncertainly through the dictionary's pages. I'd never realized so many words existed. I didn't know which words I needed to learn. Finally, just to start some kind of action, I began copying. In my slow, painstaking, ragged handwriting, I copied into my tablet everything printed on that first page, down to the punctuation marks. I believe it took me a day. Then, aloud, I read back to myself everything I'd written on the tablet. Over and over aloud to myself, I read my own handwriting. I woke up the next morning thinking about those words, immensely proud to realize that not only had I written so much at one time, but I'd written words that I never knew were in the world. Moreover, with a little effort, I also could remember what many of these words meant. I reviewed the words whose meanings I didn't remember. Funny thing, from the dictionary first page right now, that aardvark springs to my mind. The dictionary had a picture of it, a long-tailed, long-eared, burrowing African mammal, which lives off termites caught by sticking out its tongue as an anteater does for ants. I was so fascinated that I went on. I copied the dictionary's next page. And the same experience came when I studied that. With every succeeding page, I also learned of people and places and events from history. Actually, the dictionary is like a miniature encyclopedia. Finally, the dictionary's A section had filled a whole tablet, and I went on into the Bs. That was the way I started copying what eventually became the entire dictionary. It went a lot faster after so much practice helped me to pick up handwriting speed. Between what I wrote in my tablet and writing letters, during the rest of my time in prison, I would guess I wrote a million words. I suppose it was inevitable that as my word base broadened, I could for the first time pick up a book and read and now begin to understand what the book was saying. Anyone who has read a great deal can imagine the new world that opened. Let me tell you something. From then until I left that prison, in every free moment I had, if I was not reading in the library, I was reading on my bunk. You couldn't have gotten me out of books with a wedge. Between Mr. Muhammad's teachings, my correspondence, my visitors, usually Ella and Reginald, and my reading of books, months passed without my even thinking about being imprisoned. In fact, up to then, I never had been so truly free in my life. The Norfolk Prison Colony's library was in the school building. A variety of classes was taught there by instructors who came from such places as Harvard and Boston universities. The weekly debates between inmate teams were also held in the school building. You would be astonished to know how worked up convict debaters and audiences would get over subjects like, should babies be fed milk? Available on the prison library's shelves were books on just about every general subject. Much of the big private collection that Parkhurst had willed to the prison was still in crates and boxes in the back of the library. Thousands of old books. Some of them looked ancient, covers faded, old-time parchment-looking binding. Parkhurst, I've mentioned, seemed to have been principally interested in history and religion. He had the money and the special interest to have a lot of books that you wouldn't have in general circulation. Any college library would have been lucky to get that collection. As you can imagine, especially in a prison where there was heavy emphasis on rehabilitation, an inmate was smiled upon if he demonstrated an unusually intense interest in books. There was a sizable number of well-read inmates, especially the popular debaters. Some were said by many to be practically walking encyclopedias. They were almost celebrities. No university would ask any student to devour literature as I did when this new world opened to me of being able to read and understand. I read more in my room than in the library itself. An inmate who was known to read a lot could check out more than the permitted maximum number of books. I preferred reading in the total isolation of my own room. When I had progressed to really serious reading, every night at about 10 p.m., I would be outraged with the lights out. It always seemed to catch me right in the middle of something engrossing. Fortunately, right outside my door was a corridor light that cast a glow into my room. The glow was enough to read by once my eyes adjusted to it. So when lights out came, I would sit on the floor where I could continue reading in that glow. At one hour intervals, the night guards paced past every room. Each time I heard the approaching footsteps, I jumped into bed and feigned sleep. And as soon as the guard passed, I got back out of bed onto the floor area of that light glow where I would read for another 58 minutes until the guard approached again. That went on until three or four every morning. Three or four hours of sleep a night was enough for me. Often in the years in the streets, I had slept less than that. The teachings of Mr. Muhammad stressed how history had been whitened. 
When white men had written history books, the black man simply had been left out. Mr. Muhammad couldn't have said anything that would have struck me much harder. I had never forgotten how, when my class, me, and all of those whites had studied seventh grade United States history back in Mason, the history of the Negro had been covered in one paragraph, and the teacher had gotten a big laugh with his joke. Negroes' feet are so big that when they walk, they leave a hole in the ground. This is one reason why Mr. Muhammad's teachings spread so swiftly all over the United States, among all Negroes, whether or not they became followers of Mr. Muhammad. The teachings ring true to every Negro. You can hardly show me a black adult in America, or a white one for that matter, who knows from the history books anything like the truth about the black man's role. In my own case, once I heard of the glorious history of the black man, I took special pains to hunt in the library for books that would inform me on details about black history. I can remember accurately the very first set of books that really impressed me. I have since bought that set of books and have it at home for my children to read as they grow up. It's called Wonders of the World. It's full of pictures of archaeological finds, statues that depict usually non-European people. I found books like Will Durant's Story of Civilization. I read H.G. Wells' Outline of History. Souls of Black Folk by Webb Du Bois gave me a glimpse into the black people's history before they came to this country. Carter G. Woodson's Negro History opened my eyes about black empires before the black slave was brought to the United States and the early Negro struggles for freedom. J. Rogers' three volumes of Sex and Race told about race mixing before Christ's time, about Aesop being a black man who told fables, about Egypt's pharaohs, about the great Coptic Christian empires, about Ethiopia, the Earth's oldest continuous black civilization, as China is the oldest continuous civilization. Mr. Muhammad's teaching about how the white man had been created led me to Findings in Genetics by Gregor Mendel. The dictionary's G section was where I had learned what genetics meant. I really studied this book by the Austrian monk. Reading it over and over, especially certain sections, helped me to understand that if you started with a black man, a white man could be produced. But starting with a white man, you never could produce a black man because the white gene is recessive. And since no one disputes that there was but one original man, the conclusion is clear. During the last year or so, in the New York Times, Arnold Toynbee used the word bleached in describing the white man. His words were, white, that is bleached, human beings of North European origin. Toynbee also referred to the European geographic area as only a peninsula of Asia. He said there is no such thing as Europe. And if you look at the globe, you will see for yourself that America is only an extension of Asia. But at the same time, Toynbee is among those who have helped to bleach history. He has written that Africa was the only continent that produced no history. He won't write that again. Every day now, the truth is coming to light. I never will forget how shocked I was when I began reading about slavery's total horror. It made such an impact upon me that it later became one of my favorite subjects when I became a minister of Mr. Muhammad's. The world's most monstrous crime, the sin, and the blood on the white man's hands are almost impossible to believe. Books like the one by Frederick Olmsted opened my eyes to the horrors suffered when the slave was landed in the United States. The European woman, Fanny Kimball, who had married a southern white slave owner, described how human beings were degraded. Of course, I read Uncle Tom's Cabin. In fact, I believe that's the only novel I have ever read since I started serious reading. Parkhurst's collection also contains some bound pamphlets of the abolitionist anti-slavery society of New England. I read descriptions of atrocities, saw those illustrations of black slave women tied up and flogged with whips of black mothers watching their babies being dragged off, never to be seen by their mothers again, of dogs after slaves, and of the fugitive slave catchers, evil white men with whips and clubs and chains and guns. I read about the slave preacher Nat Turner, who put the fear of God into the white slave master. Nat Turner wasn't going around preaching pie in the sky and nonviolent freedom for the black man. There in Virginia one night in 1831, Nat and seven other slaves started out at his master's home, and through the night they went from one plantation, big house, to the next, killing, until by the next morning, 57 white people were dead, and Nat had about 70 slaves following him. White people, terrified for their lives, fled from their homes, locked themselves up in public buildings, hid in the woods, and some even left the state. A small army of soldiers took two months to catch and hang Nat Turner. 
Somewhere I have read where Nat Turner's example is said to have inspired John Brown to invade Virginia and attack Harper's Ferry nearly 30 years later with 13 white men and five Negroes. I read Herodotus, the father of history, or rather I read about him, and I read the histories of various nations, which opened my eyes gradually, then wider and wider, to how the whole world's white men had indeed acted like devils, pillaging and raping and bleeding and draining the whole world's non-white people. I remember, for instance, books such as Will Durant's story of Oriental civilization and Mahatma Gandhi's accounts of the struggle to drive the British out of India. Book after book showed me how the white man had brought upon the world's black, brown, red, and yellow peoples every variety of the sufferings of exploitation. I saw how since the 16th century, the so-called Christian trader white man began to ply the seas in his lust for Asian and African empires and plunder and power. I read, I saw how the white man never has gone among the non-white peoples bearing the cross in the true manner and spirit of Christ's teachings, meek, humble, and Christ-like. I perceived as I read how the collective white man had been actually nothing but a piratical opportunist who used Faustian machinations to make his own Christianity his initial wedge in criminal conquests. First, always religiously, he branded heathen and pagan labels upon ancient non-white cultures and civilizations. The stage thus set, he then turned upon his non-white victims his weapons of war. I read how, entering India, Half a billion deeply religious brown people, the British white man, by 1759, through promises, trickery, and manipulations, controlled much of India through Great Britain's East India Company. The parasitical British administration kept tentacling out to half of the subcontinent. In 1857, some of the desperate people of India finally mutinied, and, accepting the African slave trade, Nowhere has history recorded any more unnecessary bestial and ruthless human carnage than the British suppression of the non-white Indian people. Over 115 million African blacks, close to the 1930s population of the United States, were murdered or enslaved during the slave trade. And I read how, when the slave market was glutted, the cannibalistic white powers of Europe next carved up, as their colonies, the richest areas of the black continent, and Europe's chancelleries for the next century played a chess game of naked exploitation and power from Cape Horn to Cairo. Ten guards in the warden couldn't have torn me out of those books. Not even Elijah Muhammad could have been more eloquent than those books were in providing indisputable proof that the collective white man had acted like a devil in virtually every contact he had with the world's collective non-white man. I listen today to the radio and watch television and read the headlines about the collective white man's fear and tension concerning China. When the white man professes ignorance about why the Chinese hate him so, my mind can't help flashing back to what I read there in prison about how the blood forebears of this same white man raped China at a time when China was trusting and helpless. Those original white Christian traders sent into China millions of pounds of opium. By 1839, so many of the Chinese were addicts that China's desperate government destroyed 20,000 chests of opium. The first opium war was promptly declared by the white man. Imagine declaring war upon someone who objects to being narcotized. The Chinese were severely beaten with Chinese-invented gunpowder. The Treaty of Nanking made China pay the British white man for the destroyed opium, forced open China's major ports to British trade, forced China to abandon Hong Kong, fixed China's import tariffs so low that cheap British articles soon flooded in, maiming China's industrial development. After a second opium war, the Tientsin treaties legalized the ravaging opium trade, legalized a British-French-American control of China's customs. China tried delaying that treaty's ratification. Peking was looted and burned. Kill the foreign white devils, was the 1901 Chinese war cry in the Boxer Rebellion. Losing again, this time the Chinese were driven from Peking's choicest areas. The vicious, arrogant white man put up the famous signs, Chinese and dogs not allowed. Red China after World War II closed its doors to the Western white world. Massive Chinese agricultural, scientific, and industrial efforts are described in a book that Life magazine recently published. Some observers inside Red China have reported that the world never has known such a hate white campaign as is now going on in this non-white country where present birth rates continuing in 50 more years, Chinese will be half the earth's population. And it seems that some Chinese chickens will soon come home to roost 
with China's recent successful nuclear tests. Let us face reality. We can see in the United Nations a new world order being shaped along color lines, an alliance among the non-white nations. America's UN Ambassador Adlai Stevenson complained not long ago that in the United Nations a skin game was being played. He was right. He was facing reality. A skin game is being played. But Ambassador Stevenson sounded like Jesse James accusing the marshal of carrying a gun. Because who in the world's history ever has played a worse skin game than the white man? Mr. Muhammad, to whom I was writing daily, had no idea of what a new world had opened up to me through my efforts to document his teachings in books. When I discovered philosophy, I tried to touch all the landmarks of philosophical development. Gradually, I read most of the old philosophers, Occidental and Oriental. The Oriental philosophers were the ones I came to prefer. Finally, my impression was that most Occidental philosophy had largely been borrowed from the Oriental thinkers. Socrates, for instance, traveled in Egypt. Some sources even say that Socrates was initiated into some of the Egyptian mysteries. Obviously, Socrates got some of his wisdom among the East's wise men. I have often reflected upon the new vistas that reading opened to me. I knew right there in prison that reading had changed forever the course of my life. As I see it today, the ability to read awoke inside me some long dormant craving to be mentally alive. I certainly wasn't seeking any degree, the way a college confers a status symbol upon its students. My homemade education gave me, with every additional book that I read, a little bit more sensitivity to the deafness, dumbness, and blindness that was afflicting the black race in America. Not long ago, an English writer telephoned me from London, asking questions. One was, What's your alma mater? I told him, books. You will never catch me with a free 15 minutes in which I'm not studying something I feel might be able to help the black man. Yesterday I spoke in London, and both ways on the plane across the Atlantic I was studying a document about how the United Nations proposes to ensure the human rights of the oppressed minorities of the world. The American black man is the world's most shameful case of minority oppression. What makes the black man think of himself as only an internal United States issue is just a catchphrase, two words, civil rights. How is the black man going to get civil rights before first he wins his human rights? If the American black man will start thinking about his human rights and then start thinking of himself as part of one of the world's great peoples, he will see he has a case for the United Nations. I can't think of a better case. 400 years of black blood and sweat invested here in America and the white man still has the black man begging for what every immigrant fresh off the ship can take for granted the minute he walks down the gangplank. But I'm digressing. I told the Englishman that my alma mater was books, a good library. Every time I catch a plane, I have with me a book that I want to read, and that's a lot of books these days. If I weren't out here every day battling the white man, I could spend the rest of my life reading, just satisfying my curiosity, because you can hardly mention anything I'm not curious about. I don't think anybody ever got more out of going to prison than I did. In fact, prison enabled me to study far more intensively than I would have if my life had gone differently and I had attended some college. I imagine that one of the biggest troubles with colleges is there are too many distractions, too much panty raiding, fraternities, and bula bula and all of that. Where else but in a prison could I have attacked my ignorance by being able to study intensely sometimes as much as 15 hours a day? Schopenhauer, Kant, Nietzsche, Naturally, I read all of those. I don't respect them. I am just trying to remember some of those whose theories I soaked up in those years. These three, it said, laid the groundwork on which the fascist and Nazi philosophy was built. I don't respect them because it seems to me that most of their time was spent arguing about things that are not really important. They remind me of so many of the Negro intellectuals, so called, with whom I have come in contact. They are always arguing about something useless. Spinoza impressed me for a while when I found out that he was black, a black Spanish Jew. The Jews excommunicated him because he advocated a pantheistic doctrine, something like the allness of God or God in everything. The Jews read their burial services for Spinoza, meaning that he was dead as far as they were concerned. His family was run out of Spain. They ended up in Holland, I think. I'll tell you something. The whole stream of Western philosophy has now wound up in a cul-de-sac. The white man has perpetrated upon himself, as well as upon the black man, so gigantic a fraud that he has put himself into a crack. He did it through his elaborate neurotic necessity to hide the black man's true role in history. 
And today, the white man is faced head on with what is happening on the black continent, Africa. Look at the artifacts being discovered there that are proving over and over again how the black man had great, fine, sensitive civilizations before the white man was out of the caves. Below the Sahara, in the places where most of America's Negroes' foreparents were kidnapped, there is being unearthed some of the finest craftsmanship, sculpture, and other objects that has ever been seen by modern man. Some of these things now are on view in such places as New York City's Metropolitan Museum of Art, gold work of such fine tolerance and workmanship that it has no rival, ancient objects produced by black hands, refined by those black hands with results that no human hand today can equal. History has been so whitened by the white man that even the black professors have known little more than the most ignorant black man about the talents and rich civilizations and cultures of the black man of millenniums ago. I have lectured in Negro colleges and some of these brainwashed black PhDs with their suspenders dragging the ground with degrees have run to the white man's newspapers calling me a black fanatic. Why, a lot of them are 50 years behind the times. If I were president of one of these black colleges, I'd hawk the campus if I had to, to send a bunch of black students off digging in Africa for more, more and more proof of the black race's historical greatness. The white man now is in Africa digging and searching. An African elephant can't stumble without falling on some white man with a shovel. Practically every week we read about some great new find from Africa's lost civilizations. All that's new is white science's attitude. The ancient civilizations of the black man have been buried on the black continent all the time. Here is an example. A British anthropologist named Dr. Louise S. B. Leakey is displaying some fossil bones, a foot, part of a hand, some jaws, and skull fragments. On the basis of these, Dr. Leakey has said it's time to rewrite completely the history of man's origin. This species of man lived 1,818,036 years before Christ, and these bones were found in Tanganyika, in the black continent. It's a crime, the lie that has been told to generations of black men and white men both. Little innocent black children, born of parents who believed that their race had no history. Little black children seeing, before they could talk, that their parents considered themselves inferior. Innocent black children growing up, living out their lives, dying of old age, and all of their lives ashamed of being black. But the truth is pouring out of the bag now. Two other areas of experience which have been extremely formative in my life since prison were first opened to me in the Norfolk prison colony. For one thing, I had my first experiences in opening the eyes of my brainwashed black brethren to some truths about the black race. And the other, when I had read enough to know something, I began to enter the prison colony's weekly debating program, my baptism into public speaking. I have to admit a sad, shameful fact. I had so loved being around the white man that in prison I really disliked how Negro convicts stuck together so much. But when Mr. Muhammad's teachings reversed my attitude toward my black brothers, in my guilt and shame, I began to catch every chance I could to recruit for Mr. Muhammad. You have to be careful, very careful. Introducing the truth to the black man who has never previously heard the truth about himself, his own kind, and the white man. My brother Reginald had told me that all Muslims experience this in their recruiting for Mr. Muhammad. The black brother is so brainwashed that he may even be repelled when he first hears the truth. Reginald advised that the truth had to be dropped only a little bit at a time, and you had to wait a while to let it sink in before advancing the next step. I began first telling my black brother inmates about the glorious history of the black man, things they never had dreamed. I told them the horrible slavery trade truths that they never knew. I would watch their faces when I told them about that because the white man had completely erased the slave's past. A Negro in America can never know his true family name or even what tribe he was descended from. The Mandingos, the Wolof, the Serer, the Fula, the Fanti, the Ashanti, or others. I told them that some slaves brought from Africa spoke Arabic and were Islamic in their religion. A lot of these black convicts still wouldn't believe it unless they could see that a white man had said it. So often, I would read to these brothers selected passages from white men's books. I'd explain to them that the real truth was known to some white men, the scholars, but there had been a conspiracy down through the generations to keep the truth from black men. I would keep close watch on how each one reacted. I always had to be careful. I never knew when some brainwashed black imp, some dyed-in-the-wool Uncle Tom, would nod at me and then go running to tell the white man. 
When one was ripe, and I could tell, then away from the rest, I'd drop it on him, what Mr. Muhammad taught. The white man is the devil. That would shock many of them until they started thinking about it. This is probably as big a single worry as the American prison system has today. The way the Muslim teachings circulated among all Negroes in the country are converting new Muslims among black men in prison, and black men are in prison in far greater numbers than their proportion in the population. The reason is that among all Negroes, the black convict is the most perfectly preconditioned to hear the words, the white man is the devil. You tell that to any Negro, except for those relatively few integration mad so-called intellectuals, and those black men who are otherwise fat, happy, and deaf, dumb, and blinded with their crumbs from the white man's rich table, you have struck a nerve center in the American black man. He may take a day to react, a month, a year. He may never respond openly. But of one thing you can be sure, when he thinks about his own life, he is going to see where, to him, personally, the white man sure has acted like a devil. And as I say, above all Negroes, the black prisoner. Here is a black man caged behind bars, probably for years, put there by the white man. Usually the convict comes from among those bottom of the pile Negroes, the Negroes who through their entire lives have been kicked about, treated like children. Negroes who never have met one white man who didn't either take something from them or do something to them. You let this caged up black man start thinking the same way I did when I first heard Elijah Muhammad's teachings. Let him start thinking how, with better breaks when he was young and ambitious, he might have been a lawyer, a doctor, a scientist, anything. You let this caged up black man start realizing, as I did, how from the first landing of the first slave ship, the millions of black men in America have been like sheep in a den of wolves. That's why black prisoners become Muslim so fast when Elijah Muhammad's teachings filter into their cages by way of other Muslim convicts. The white man is the devil is a perfect echo of that black convict's lifelong experience. I've told how debating was a weekly event there at the Norfolk prison colony. My reading had my mind like steam under pressure. Some way, I had to start telling the white man about himself to his face. I decided I could do this by putting my name down to debate. Standing up and speaking before an audience was a thing that throughout my previous life never would have crossed my mind. Out there in the streets, hustling, pushing dope, and robbing, I could have had the dreams from a pound of hashish, and I'd never have dreamed anything so wild as that one day I would speak in coliseums and arenas at the greatest American universities and on radio and television programs, not to mention speaking all over Egypt and Africa and in England. But I will tell you that right there in the prison, debating, speaking to a crowd, was as exhilarating to me as the discovery of knowledge through reading had been. Standing up there, the faces looking up at me, things in my head coming out of my mouth, while my brain searched for the next best thing to follow what I was saying, and if I could sway them to my side by handling it right, then I had won the debate. Once my feet got wet, I was gone on debating. Whichever side of the selected subject was assigned to me, I'd track down and study everything I could find on it. I'd put myself in my opponent's place and decide how I'd try to win if I had the other side, and then I'd figure a way to knock down those points. And if there was any way in the world, I'd work into my speech the devilishness of the white man. Compulsory military training or none. That's one good chance I got unexpectedly, I remember. My opponent flailed the air about the Ethiopians throwing rocks and spears at Italian airplanes, proving that compulsory military training was needed. I said the Ethiopians' black flesh had been spattered against trees by bombs the Pope in Rome had blessed, and the Ethiopians would have thrown even their bare bodies at the airplanes because they had seen that they were fighting the devil incarnate. They yelled foul that I'd made the subject a race issue. I said it wasn't race, it was a historical fact, that they ought to go and read Pierre Van Possen's Days of Our Years, and something not surprising to me, that book, right after the debate, disappeared from the prison library. It was right there in prison that I made up my mind to devote the rest of my life to telling the white man about himself or die. In a debate about whether or not Homer had ever existed, I threw into those white faces the theory that Homer only symbolized how white Europeans kidnapped black Africans, then blinded them so that they could never get back to their own people. Homer and Omar and Moore, you see, are related terms. It's like saying Peter, Pedro, and Petra, all three of which mean rock. These blinded moors the Europeans taught to sing about the Europeans' glorious accomplishments. 
I made it clear that was the devilish white man's idea of kicks. Aesop's fables, another case in point. Aesop was only the Greek name for an Ethiopian. Another hot debate I remember I was in had to do with the identity of Shakespeare. No color was involved there. I just got intrigued over the Shakespearean dilemma. The King James translation of the Bible is considered the greatest piece of literature in English. Its language supposedly represents the ultimate in using the King's English. Well, Shakespeare's language and the Bible's language are one and the same. They say that from 1604 to 1611, King James got poets to translate, to write the Bible. Well, if Shakespeare existed, he was then the top poet around. But Shakespeare is nowhere reported connected with the Bible. If he existed, why didn't King James use him? And if he did use him, why is it one of the world's best kept secrets? I know that many say that Francis Bacon was Shakespeare. If that is true, why would Bacon have kept it secret? Bacon wasn't royalty when royalty sometimes used the nom de plume because it was improper for royalty to be artistic or theatrical. What would Bacon have had to lose? Bacon, in fact, would have had everything to gain. In the prison debates, I argued for the theory that King James himself was the real poet who used the nom de plume Shakespeare. King James was brilliant. He was the greatest king who ever sat on the British throne. Who else among royalty in his time would have had the giant talent to write Shakespeare's works? It was he who poetically fixed the Bible, which in itself and its present King James Version has enslaved the world. When my brother Reginald visited, I would talk to him about new evidence I found to document the Muslim teachings. In either volume 43 or 44 of the Harvard Classics, I read Milton's Paradise Lost. The devil, kicked out of paradise, was trying to regain possession. He was using the forces of Europe, personified by the popes, Charlemagne, Richard the Lionhearted, and other knights. I interpreted this to show that the Europeans were motivated and led by the devil, or the personification of the devil. So Milton and Mr. Elijah Muhammad were actually saying the same thing. I couldn't believe it when Reginald began to speak ill of Elijah Muhammad. I can't specify the exact things he said. They were more in the nature of implications against Mr. Muhammad, the pitch of Reginald's voice, or the way that Reginald looked, rather than what he said. It caught me totally unprepared. It threw me into a state of confusion. My blood brother, Reginald, in whom I had so much confidence, for whom I had so much respect, the one who had introduced me to the nation of Islam, I couldn't believe it. And now Islam meant more to me than anything I ever had known in my life. Islam and Mr. Elijah Muhammad had changed my whole world. But Reginald kept visiting me. When he had been a Muslim, he had been immaculate in his attire. But now he wore things like a t-shirt, shabby-looking trousers, and sneakers. I could see him on the way down. When he spoke, I heard him coldly. But I would listen. He was my blood brother. Gradually, I saw the chastisement of Allah, what Christians would call the curse, come upon Reginald. Elijah Muhammad said that Allah was chastising Reginald and that anyone who challenged Elijah Muhammad would be chastened by Allah. In Islam, we were taught that as long as one didn't know the truth, he lived in darkness. But once the truth was accepted and recognized, he lived in light, and whoever would then go against it would be punished by Allah. Mr. Muhammad taught that the five-pointed star stands for justice and also for the five senses of man. We were taught that Allah executes justice by working upon the five senses of those who rebel against his messenger or against his truth. We were taught that this was Allah's way of letting Muslims know his sufficiency to defend his messenger against any and all opposition, as long as the messenger himself didn't deviate from the path of truth. We were taught that Allah turned the minds of any defectors into a turmoil. I thought truly that it was Allah doing this to my brother. One letter, I think, from my brother Filbert told me that Reginald was with them in Detroit. I heard no more about Reginald until one day, weeks later, Ella visited me. She told me that Reginald was at her home in Roxbury, sleeping. Ella said she had heard a knock. She had gone to the door, and there was Reginald looking terrible. Ella said she had asked, where did you come from? And Reginald had told her he came from Detroit. She said she asked him, how did you get here? And he had told her, I walked. I believed he had walked. I believed in Elijah Muhammad. And he had convinced us that Allah's chastisement upon Reginald's mind had taken away Reginald's ability to gauge distance and time. There is a dimension of time with which we are not familiar here in the West. Elijah Muhammad said that under Allah's chastisement, the five senses of a man 
can be so deranged by those whose mental powers are greater than his that in five minutes his hair can turn snow white, or he will walk 900 miles as he might walk five blocks. In prison, since I had become a Muslim, I had grown a beard. When Reginald visited me, he nervously moved about in his chair. He told me that each hair on my beard was a snake. Everywhere, he saw snakes. He next began to believe that he was the messenger of Allah. Reginald went around in the streets of Roxbury, Ella reported to me, telling people that he had some divine power. He graduated from this to saying that he was Allah. He finally began saying he was greater than Allah. Authorities picked up Reginald, and he was put into an institution. They couldn't find what was wrong. They had no way to understand Allah's chastisement. Reginald was released. Then he was picked up again and was put into another institution. Reginald is in an institution now. I know where, but I won't say. I would not want to cause him any more trouble than he has already had. I believe today that it was written, it was meant, for Reginald to be used for one purpose only, as a bait, as a minnow to reach into the ocean of blackness where I was, to save me. I cannot understand it any other way. After Elijah Muhammad himself was later accused as a very immoral man, I came to believe that it wasn't a divine chastisement upon Reginald, but the pain he felt when his own family totally rejected him for Elijah Muhammad, and this hurt made Reginald turn insanely upon Elijah Muhammad. It's impossible to dream, or to see, or to have a vision of someone whom you never have seen before, and to see him exactly as he is. To see someone, and to see him exactly as he looks, is to have a prevision. I would later come to believe that my prevision was of Master W.D. Fard, the Messiah, the one whom Elijah Muhammad said had appointed him, Elijah Muhammad, as his last messenger to the black people of North America. My last year in prison was spent back in the Charlestown prison. Even among the white inmates, the word had filtered around. Some of those brainwashed black convicts talked too much. And I know that the censors had reported on my mail. The Norfolk prison colony officials had become upset. They used as a reason for my transfer that I refused to take some kind of shots, an inoculation or something. The only thing that worried me was that I hadn't much time left before I would be eligible for parole board consideration. But I reasoned that they might look at my representing and spreading Islam in another way. Instead of keeping me in, they might want to get me out. I had come to prison with 2020's vision. But when I got sent back to Charlestown, I had read so much by the lights out glow in my room at the Norfolk prison colony that I had astigmatism and the first pair of the eyeglasses that I have worn ever since. I had less maneuverability back in the much stricter Charlestown prison, but I found that a lot of Negroes attended a Bible class and I went there. Conducting the class was a tall, blonde, blue-eyed, a perfect devil, Harvard Seminary student. He lectured, and then he started in a question and answer session. I don't know which of us had read the Bible more, he or I, but I had to give him credit. He really was heavy on his religion. I puzzled and puzzled for a way to upset him and to give those Negroes present something to think and talk about and circulate. Finally, I put up my hand. He nodded. He had talked about Paul. I stood up and asked, what color was Paul? And I kept talking with pauses. He had to be black because he was a Hebrew and the original Hebrews were black, weren't they? He had started flushing red. You know the way white people do. He said, yes. I wasn't through yet. What color was Jesus? He was Hebrew too, wasn't he? Both the Negro and the white convicts had sat bolt upright. I don't care how tough the convict, be he brainwashed black Christian or a devil white Christian, neither of them is ready to hear anybody saying Jesus wasn't white. The instructor walked around. He shouldn't have felt bad. In all of the years since, I never have met any intelligent white man who would try to insist that Jesus was white. How could they? He said Jesus was brown. I let him get away with that compromise. Exactly as I had known it would, almost overnight, the Charlestown convicts, black and white, began buzzing with the story. Wherever I went, I could feel the nodding. And any time I got a chance to exchange words with a black brother in stripes, I'd say, my man, you ever heard about somebody named Mr. Elijah Muhammad? Chapter 12, Savior. During the spring of 1952, I joyously wrote Elijah Muhammad and my family that the Massachusetts State Parole Board had voted that I should be released. But still a few months were taken up with the red tape delay of paperwork that went back and forth, arranging for my parole release in the custody of my oldest brother, Wilfred, in Detroit, who now managed a furniture store. Wilfred got the Jew who owned the store to sign a promise that upon release I would be given immediate employment. 
By the prison system wire, I heard that Shorty also was up for parole, but Shorty was having trouble getting some reputable person to sign for him. Later, I found out that in prison, Shorty had studied musical composition. He had even progressed to writing some pieces. One of them I know he named the Bastille Concerto. My going to Detroit instead of back to Harlem or Boston was influenced by my family's feeling expressed in their letters. Especially my sister Hilda had stressed to me that although I felt I understood Elijah Muhammad's teachings, I had much to learn and I ought to come to Detroit and become a member of a temple of practicing Muslims. It was in August when they gave me a lecture, a cheap Lil Abner suit and a small amount of money and I walked out of the gate. I never looked back but that doesn't make me any different from a million inmates who have left a prison behind them. The first stop I made was at a Turkish bath. I got some of that physical feeling of prison taint steamed off me. Ella, with whom I stayed only overnight, had also agreed that it would be best for me to start again in Detroit. The police in a new city wouldn't have it in for me. That was Ella's consideration, not the Muslims, for whom Ella had no use. Both Hilda and Reginald had tried to work on Ella. But Ella, with her strong will, didn't go for it at all. She told me that she felt anyone could be whatever he wanted to be, Holy Roller, Seventh-day Adventist, or whatever it was, but she wasn't going to become any Muslim. Hilda, the next morning, gave me some money to put in my pocket. Before I left, I went out and bought three things I remember well. I bought a better-looking pair of eyeglasses than the pair the prison had issued to me, and I bought a suitcase and a wristwatch. I have thought since that without fully knowing it, I was preparing for what my life was about to become. Because those are three things I've used more than anything else. My eyeglasses correct the astigmatism that I got from all the reading in prison. I travel so much now that my wife keeps alternate suitcases packed so that, when necessary, I can just grab one. And you won't find anybody more time conscious than I am. I live by my watch, keeping appointments. Even when I'm using my car, I drive by my watch not my speedometer. Time is more important to me than distance. I caught a bus to Detroit. The furniture store that my brother Wilford managed was right in the black ghetto of Detroit. I'd better not name the store if I'm going to tell the way they rob Negroes. Wilford introduced me to the Jews who owned the store. And as agreed, I was put to work as a salesman. Nothing down advertisements drew poor Negroes into that store like flypaper. It was a shame the way they paid three and four times what the furniture had cost because they could get credit from those Jews. It was the same kind of cheap, gaudy-looking junk that you can see in any of the black ghetto furniture stores today. Fabrics were stapled on the sofas, imitation leopard skin bedspreads, tiger skin rugs, such stuff as that. I would see clumsy, work-hardened, calloused hands scrawling and scratching signatures on the contract, agreeing to highway robbery interest rates in the fine print that never was read. I was seeing in real life the same point made in a joke that during the 1964 presidential campaign, Jet Magazine reported that Senator Barry Goldwater had told somewhere. It was that a white man, a Negro, and a Jew were given one wish each. The white man asked for securities, the Negro asked for a lot of money, the Jew asked for some imitation jewelry and that colored boy's address. In all my years in the streets, I'd been looking at the exploitation that for the first time I really saw and understood. Now I watched brothers entwining themselves in the economic clutches of the white man who went home every night with another bag of the money drained out of the ghetto. I saw that the money, instead of helping the black man, was going to help enrich these white merchants who usually lived in an exclusive area where a black man had better not get caught unless he worked there for somebody white. Wilford invited me to share his home, and gratefully I accepted. The warmth of a home and a family was a healing change from the prison cage for me. It would deeply move almost any newly freed convict, I think. But especially this Muslim home's atmosphere sent me often to my knees to praise Allah. My family's letters while I was in prison had included a description of the Muslim home routine but to truly appreciate it, one had to be a part of the routine. Each act and the significance of that act was gently, patiently explained to me by my brother Wilfred. There was none of the morning confusion that exists in most homes. Wilfred, the father, the family protector and provider, was the first to rise. The father prepares the way for his family, he said. He, then I, performed the morning ablutions. Next came Wilfred's wife, Ruth, and then their children so that orderliness prevailed in the use of the bathroom. In the name of Allah, 
I perform the ablution, the Muslim said aloud, before washing first the right hand, then the left hand. The teeth were thoroughly brushed, followed by three rinsings of the mouth. The nostrils were also rinsed out thrice. A shower then completed the whole body's purification in readiness for prayer. Each family member, even children upon meeting each other for that new day's first time, greeted softly and pleasantly, as salam alaikum, the Arabic for peace be unto you. Wa alaikum salam, and unto you be peace, was the other's reply. Over and over again, the Muslim said in his own mind, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. The prayer rug was spread by Wilfred while the rest of the family purified themselves. It was explained to me that a Muslim family prayed with the sun near the horizon. If that time was missed, the prayer had to be deferred until the sun was beyond the horizon. Muslims are not sun worshipers. We pray facing the east to be in unity with the rest of our 725 million brothers and sisters in the entire Muslim world. All the family, in robes, lined up facing east. In unison, we step from our slippers to stand on the prayer rug. Today I say with my family in the Arabic tongue, the prayer which I first learned in English. I perform the morning prayer to Allah, the Most High, Allah is the greatest. Glory to thee, O Allah, thine is the praise, blessed is thy name, and exalted is thy majesty. I bear witness that nothing deserves to be served or worshipped besides thee. No solid food, only juice and coffee, was taken for our breakfast. Wilfred and I went off to work. There, at noon and again, at around three in the afternoon, unnoticed by others in the furniture store, we would rinse our hands, faces, and mouths, and softly meditate. Muslim children did likewise at school, and Muslim wives and mothers interrupted their chores to join the world's 725 million Muslims in communicating with God. Wednesdays, Fridays, and Sundays were the meeting days of the relatively small Detroit Temple No. 1. Near the temple, which actually was a storefront, were three hog-slaughtering pens. The squealing of hogs being slaughtered filtered into our Wednesday and Friday meetings. I'm describing the condition that we Muslims were in back in the early 1950s. The address of Temple Number 1 was 1470 Frederick Street, I think. The first temple to be formed back in 1931 by Master W.D. Fard was formed in Detroit, Michigan. I never had seen any Christian-believing Negroes conduct themselves like the Muslims, the individuals, and the families alike. The men were quietly, tastefully dressed. The women wore ankle-length gowns, no makeup, and scarves covered their heads. The neat children were mannerly, not only to adults, but to other children as well. I had never dreamed of anything like that atmosphere among black people who had learned to be proud they were black, who had learned to love other black people instead of being jealous and suspicious. I thrilled to how we Muslim men used both hands to grasp a black brother's both hands, voicing and smiling our happiness to meet him again. The Muslim sisters both married and single, were given an honor and respect that I'd never seen black men give to their women, and it felt wonderful to me. The salutations which we all exchanged were warm, filled with mutual respect and dignity. Brother, sister, ma'am, sir. Even children speaking to other children use these terms. Beautiful. Lemuel Hassan then was the minister at Temple Number 1. As Salaikum, he greeted us. Wa Salaikum, we returned. Minister Lemuel stood before us, near a blackboard. The blackboard had fixed upon it in permanent paint, on one side, the United States flag, and under it the words, slavery, suffering, and death, then the word, Christianity, alongside the sign of the cross. Beneath the cross was a painting of a black man hanged from a tree. On the other side was painted what we were taught was the Muslim flag, the crescent and star on a red background with the words, Islam, freedom, justice, equality, and beneath that, which one will survive the war of Armageddon? For more than an hour, Minister Lemuel lectured about Elijah Muhammad's teachings. I sat raptly absorbing Minister Lemuel's every syllable and gesture. Frequently, he graphically illustrated points by chalking key words or phrases on the blackboard. I thought it was outrageous that our small temple still had some empty seats. I complained to my brother Wilfred that there should be no empty seats with the surrounding streets full of our brainwashed black brothers and sisters, drinking, cursing, fighting, dancing, carousing, and using dope. The very things that Mr. Muhammad taught were helping the black man to stay under the heel of the white man here in America. From what I could gather, 
The recruitment attitude at the temple seemed to me to amount to a self-defeating waiting view, an assumption that Allah would bring us more Muslims. I felt that Allah would be more inclined to help those who help themselves. I had lived for years in ghetto streets. I knew the Negroes in those streets. Harlem or Detroit were no different. I said I disagreed, that I thought we should go out into the streets and get more Muslims into the fold. All of my life, as you know, I had been an activist. I had been impatient. My brother Wilfred counseled me to keep patience. And for me to be patient was made easier by the fact that I could anticipate soon seeing and perhaps meeting the man who was called the messenger, Elijah Muhammad himself. Today, I have appointments with world-famous personages, including some heads of nations. But I looked forward to the Sunday before Labor Day in 1952 with an eagerness never since duplicated. Detroit Temple No. 1 Muslims were going in a motor caravan, I think about 10 automobiles, to visit Chicago Temple No. 2 to hear Elijah Muhammad. Not since childhood had I been so excited as when we drove in Wilfred's car. At great Muslim rallies since then, I have seen and heard and felt 10,000 Black people applauding and cheering. But on that Sunday afternoon, when our two little temples assembled, perhaps only 200 Muslims, the Chicagoans welcoming and greeting us Detroiters, I experienced tinglings up my spine as I've never had since. I was totally unprepared for the messenger Elijah Muhammad's physical impact upon my emotions. From the rear of Temple Number 2, he came toward the platform. The small, sensitive, gentle, brown face that I had studied in photographs until I had dreamed about it was fixed straight ahead as the messenger strode, encircled by the marching, strapping fruit of Islam guards. The messenger, compared to them, seemed fragile, almost tiny. He and the fruit of Islam were dressed in dark suits, white shirts, and bow ties. The messenger wore a gold-embroidered fez. I stared at the great man who had taken the time to write to me when I was a convict whom he knew nothing about. He was the man whom I had been told had spent years of his life in suffering and sacrifice to lead us, the black people, because he loved us so much. And then, hearing his voice, I sat leaning forward, riveted upon his words. I try to reconstruct what Elijah Muhammad said from having since heard him speak hundreds of times. I have not stopped one day for the past 21 years. I have been standing preaching to you throughout those past 21 years, while I was free, and even while I was in bondage. I spent three and one half years in the federal penitentiary, and also over a year in the city jail, for teaching this truth. I was also deprived of a father's love for his family for seven long years, while I was running from hypocrites and other enemies of this word and revelation of God, which will give life to you and put you on the same level with all other civilized and independent nations and peoples of this planet Earth. Elijah Muhammad spoke of how, in this wilderness of North America, for centuries the blue-eyed devil white man had brainwashed the so-called Negro. He told us how, as one result, the black man in America was mentally, morally, and spiritually dead. Elijah Muhammad spoke of how the black man was original man, who had been kidnapped from his homeland and stripped of his language, his culture, his family structure, his family name, until the black man in America did not even realize who he was. He told us and showed us how his teachings of the true knowledge of ourselves would lift up the black man from the bottom of the white man's society and place the black man where he had begun, at the top of civilization. Concluding, pausing for breath, he called my name. It was like an electrical shock. Not looking at me directly, he asked me to stand. He told them that I was just out of prison. He said how strong I had been while in prison. Every day, he said, for years, Brother Malcolm has written a letter from prison to me and I have written to him as often as I could. Standing there, feeling the eyes of the 200 Muslims upon me, I heard him make a parable about me. When God bragged about how faithful Job was, said Elijah Muhammad, the devil said only God's hedge around Job kept Job so faithful. Remove that protective hedge, the devil told God, and I will make Job curse you to your face. The devil could claim that hedged in prison, I had just used Islam, Mr. Muhammad said. But the devil would say that now, out of prison, I would return to my drinking, smoking, dope, and life of crime. Well now, our good brother Malcolm's hedge is removed and we will see how he does, Mr. Muhammad said. I believe that he is going to remain faithful. And Allah blessed me to remain true, firm, and strong in my faith in Islam, despite many severe trials to my faith. And even when events produced a crisis between Elijah Muhammad and me, I told him at the beginning of the crisis, with all the sincerity I had in me, 
that I still believed in him more strongly than he believed in himself. Mr. Muhammad and I are not together today only because of envy and jealousy. I had more faith in Elijah Muhammad than I could ever have in any other man upon this earth. You will remember my having said that when I was in prison, Mr. Muhammad would be my brother Wilfred's house guest whenever he visited Detroit Temple No. 1. Every Muslim said that never could you do as much for Mr. Muhammad as he would do for you in return. That Sunday, after the meeting, he invited our entire family group and Minister Lemuel Hassan to be his guests for dinner that evening at his new home. Mr. Muhammad said that his children and his followers had insisted that he move into this larger, better 18-room house in Chicago at 4,847 Woodlawn Avenue. They had just moved in that week, I believe. When we arrived, Mr. Muhammad showed us where he had just been painting. I had to restrain my impulse to run and bring a chair for the messenger of Allah. Instead, as I had heard he would do, he was worrying about my comfort. We had hoped to hear his wisdom during the dinner but instead he encouraged us to talk. I sat thinking of how our Detroit temple more or less just sat and awaited a law to bring converts, and beyond that, of the millions of black people all over America who never had heard of the teachings that could stir and wake and resurrect the black man. And there at Mr. Muhammad's table, I found my tongue. I have always been one to speak my mind. During a conversational lull, I asked Mr. Muhammad how many Muslims were supposed to be in our temple number one in Detroit. He said, there are supposed to be thousands. Yes, sir, I said. Sir, what is your opinion of the best way of getting thousands there? Go after the young people, he said. Once you get them, the older ones will follow through shame. I made up my mind that we were going to follow that advice. Back in Detroit, I talked with my brother, Wilfred. I offered my services to our temple's minister, Lemuel Hassan. He shared my determination that we should apply Mr. Muhammad's formula in a recruitment drive. Beginning that day, every evening, Straight from work at the furniture store, I went doing what we Muslims later came to call fishing. I knew the thinking and the language of ghetto streets. My man, let me pull your coat to something. My application had, of course, been made, and during this time I received from Chicago my ex. The Muslim's ex symbolized the true African family name that he never could know. For me, my ex replaced the white slave master name of Little, which some blue-eyed devil named Little had imposed upon my paternal forebears. The receipt of my ex meant that forever after in the nation of Islam, I would be known as Malcolm X. Mr. Muhammad taught that we would keep this ex until God himself returned and gave us a holy name from his own mouth. Recruit as I would in the Detroit ghetto bars, in the pool rooms, and on the corners, I found my poor, ignorant, brainwashed black brothers, mostly too deaf, dumb, and blind, mentally, morally, and spiritually, to respond. It angered me that only now and then would one display even a little curiosity about the teachings that would resurrect the black man. These few I would almost beg to visit Temple Number 1 at our next meeting, but then not half of those who agreed to come would actually show up. Gradually, enough were made interested, though, that each month a few more automobiles lengthened our caravans to Temple 2 in Chicago. But even after seeing and hearing Elijah Muhammad in person, only a few of the interested visitors would apply by formal letter to Mr. Muhammad to be accepted for Nation of Islam membership. With a few months of plugging away, however, our storefront Temple One about tripled its membership, and that so deeply pleased Mr. Muhammad that he paid us the honor of a personal visit. Mr. Muhammad gave me warm praise when Minister Lemuel Hassan told how hard I had labored in the cause of Islam. Our caravans grew. I remember with what pride we led 25 automobiles to Chicago, and each time we went, we were honored with dinner at the home of Elijah Muhammad. He was interested in my potential. I could tell from things he would say, and I worshiped him. In early 1953, I left the furniture store. I earned a little better weekly paycheck working at the Garwood factory in Detroit, where big garbage truck bodies were made. I cleaned up behind the welders each time they finished another truck body. Mr. Muhammad was saying at his dining table by this time that one of his worst needs was more young men willing to work as hard as they would have to in order to bear the responsibilities of his ministers. He was saying that the teachings should be spreading further than they had and temples needed to be established in other cities. It simply had never occurred to me that I might be a minister. I had never felt remotely qualified to directly represent Mr. Muhammad. If someone had asked me about becoming a minister, I would have been astonished and told them I was happy and willing to serve Mr. Muhammad in the lowliest capacity. 
I don't know if Mr. Muhammad suggested it or if our Temple One minister, Lemuel Hassan, on his own decision, encouraged me to address our assembled brothers and sisters. I know that I testified to what Mr. Muhammad's teachings had done for me. If I told you the life I have lived, you would find it hard to believe me. When I say something about the white man, I am not talking about someone I don't know. Soon after that, Minister Lemuel Hassan urged me to address the brothers and sisters with an extemporaneous lecture. I was uncertain and hesitant, but at least I had debated in prison, and I tried my best. Of course, I can't remember exactly what I said, but I do know that in my beginning efforts, my favorite subject was Christianity and the horrors of slavery, where I felt well equipped from so much reading in prison. My brothers and sisters, our white slave master's Christian religion has taught us black people here in the wilderness of North America that we will sprout wings when we die and fly up into the sky where God will have for us a special place called heaven. This is white man's Christian religion used to brainwash us black people. We have accepted it. We have embraced it. We have believed it. We have practiced it. And while we are doing all of that for himself, this blue-eyed devil has twisted his Christianity to keep his foot on our backs, to keep our eyes fixed on the pie in the sky and heaven in the hereafter, while he enjoys his heaven right here on this earth, in this life. Today, when thousands of Muslims and others have been audiences out before me, when audiences of millions have been beyond radio and television microphones, I'm sure I rarely feel as much electricity as was then generated in me by the upturned faces of those 75 or 100 Muslims, plus other curious visitors, sitting there in our storefront temple with the squealing of pigs filtering in from the slaughterhouse just outside. In the summer of 1953, all praise is due to Allah. I was named Detroit Temple Number no. One's assistant minister. Every day after work, I walked fishing for potential converts in the Detroit Black Ghetto. I saw the African features of my black brothers and sisters, whom the devilish white man had brainwashed. I saw the hair as mine had been for years, conked by cooking it with lye until it lay limp, looking straight like the white man's hair. Time and again, Mr. Muhammad's teachings were rebuffed and even ridiculed. Oh, man, get out of my face, you niggers are crazy. My head would reel sometimes, with mingled anger and pity for my poor blind black brothers. I couldn't wait for the next time our minister Lemuel Hassan would let me speak. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock, my brothers and sisters. Plymouth Rock landed on us. Give all you can to help Messenger Elijah Muhammad's independence program for the black man. This white man always has controlled us black people by keeping us running to him, begging, please, Lottie, please, Mr. White Man Boss, would you push me off another crumb down from your table that's sagging with riches? My beautiful black brothers and sisters, and when we say black, we mean everything not white, brothers and sisters, because look at your skins. We're all black to the white man, but we're a thousand and one different colors. Turn around, look at each other. What shade of black African polluted by devil white man are you? You see me? Well, in the streets they used to call me Detroit Red. Yes, yes, that raping red-headed devil was my grandfather. That close? Yes, my mother's father. She didn't like to speak of it. Can you blame her? She said she never laid eyes on him. She was glad for that. I'm glad for her. If I could drain away his blood that pollutes my body and pollutes my complexion, I'd do it because I hate every drop of the rapist blood that's in me. And it's not just me. It's all of us. During slavery, think of it, it was a rare one of our black grandmothers, our great-grandmothers, and our great-great-grandmothers who escaped the white rapist slave master, that rapist slave master who emasculated the black man with threats, with fear, until even today, the black man lives with fear of the white man in his heart, lives even today still under the heel of the white man. Think of it. Think of that black slave man filled with fear and dread, hearing the screams of his wife, his mother, his daughter being taken, in the barn, the kitchen, in the bushes. Think of it, my dear brothers and sisters. Think of hearing wives, mothers, daughters being raped, and you were too filled with fear of the rapist to do anything about it. And his vicious, animal attacks offspring, this white man named things like mulatto and quadroon and octoroon and all those other things that he has called us, you and me when he is not calling us nigger. Turn around and look at each other, brothers and sisters, and think of this. You and me polluted all these colors, and this devil has the arrogance and the gall to think we, his victims, should love him. I would become so choked up that sometimes I would walk in the streets until late into the night. 
Sometimes I would speak to no one for hours, thinking to myself about what the white man had done to our poor people here in America. At the Garwood factory where I worked, one day the supervisor came, looking nervous. He said that a man in the office was waiting to see me. The white man standing in there said, I'm from the FBI. He flipped open, that way they do, to shock you, his little folded black leather case containing his identification. He told me to come with him. He didn't say for what or why. I went with him. They wanted to know, at their office, why hadn't I registered for the Korean War draft? I just got out of prison, I said. I didn't know you took anybody with prison records. They really believed I thought ex-convicts weren't supposed to register. They asked a lot of questions. I was glad they didn't ask if I intended to put on the white man's uniform, because I didn't. They just took it for granted that I would. They told me they weren't going to send me to jail for failing to register, that they were going to give me a break, but that I would have to register immediately. So I went straight from there to the draft board. When they gave me a form to fill out, I wrote in the appropriate places that I was a Muslim and that I was a conscientious objector. I turned in the form. This middle-aged, bored-acting devil who scanned it looked out from under his eyes at me. He got up and went into another office, obviously to consult someone over him. After a while, he came out and motioned for me to go in there. These three, I believe there were three, as I remember, older devils sat behind desks. They all wore that troublesome nigger expression, and I looked white devil right back into their eyes. They asked me on what basis did I claim to be a Muslim in my religion. I told them that the messenger of Allah was Mr. Elijah Muhammad, and that all who followed Mr. Muhammad here in America were Muslims. I knew they had heard this before from some Temple One young brothers who had been there before me. They asked if I knew what conscientious objector meant. I told them that when the white man asked me to go off somewhere and fight and maybe die to preserve the way the white man treated the black man in America, then my conscience made me object. They told me that my case would be pending, but I was put through the physical anyway, and they sent me a card with some kind of classification. That was 1953. Then I heard no more for seven years when I received another classification card in the mail. In fact, I carry it in my wallet right now. Here, it's card number 2219251377. It's dated November 21st, 1960. It says, Class 5A, whatever that means, and stamped on the card's back is Michigan Local Board, number 19, Wayne County, 3604, South Wayne Road, Wayne, Michigan. Every time I spoke at our Temple One, my voice would still be hoarse from the last time. My throat took a long time to get into condition. Do you know why the white man really hates you? It's because every time he sees your face, he sees a mirror of his crime, and his guilty conscience can't bear to face it. Every white man in America, when he looks into a black man's eyes, should fall to his knees and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. My kind has committed history's greatest crime against your kind. Will you give me the chance to atone? But do you brothers and sisters expect any white man to do that? No, you know better. And why won't he do it? Because he can't do it. The white man has created a devil to bring chaos upon this earth. Somewhere about this time, I left the Garwood factory and I went to work for the Ford Motor Company, one of the Lincoln Mercury Division assembly lines. As a young minister, I would go to Chicago and see Mr. Elijah Muhammad every time I could get off. He encouraged me to come when I could. I was treated as if I had been one of the sons of Mr. Muhammad and his dark, good wife, Sister Clara Muhammad. I saw their children only occasionally. Most of them in those years worked around Chicago in various jobs, laborers, driving taxis, and things such as that. Also living in the home was Mr. Muhammad's dear Mother Marie. I would spend almost as much time with Mother Marie as I did with Mr. Muhammad. I loved to hear her reminiscences about her son Elijah's early life when they lived in Sandersville, Georgia, where he was born in 1897. Mr. Muhammad would talk with me for hours. After eating good, healthful Muslim food, we would stay at the dinner table and talk. Or I would ride with him as he drove on his daily rounds between the few grocery stores that the Muslims then owned in Chicago. The stores were examples to help Black people see what they could do for themselves by hiring their own kind and trading with their own kind, and thus quit being exploited by the white man. In the Muslim-owned combination grocery drug store on Wentworth and 31st Street, Mr. Muhammad would sweep the floor or something like that. He would do such work himself as an example to his followers, whom he taught that idleness and laziness were among the black man's greatest sins against himself. 
I would want to snatch the broom from Mr. Muhammad's hand because I thought he was too valuable to be sweeping a floor. But he wouldn't let me do anything but stay with him and listen while he advised me on the best ways to spread his message. The way we were with each other, it would make me think of Socrates on the steps of the Athens marketplace, spreading his wisdom to his students. Or how one of those students, Aristotle, had his students following behind him, walking through the Lyceum. One day, I remember, a dirty glass of water was on a counter, and Mr. Muhammad put a clean glass of water beside it. You want to know how to spread my teachings? He said, and he pointed to the glasses of water. Don't condemn if you see a person has a dirty glass of water, he said. Just show them the clean glass of water that you have. When they inspect it, you won't have to say that yours is better. Of all the things that Mr. Muhammad ever was to teach me, I don't know why, that still stands out in my mind, although I haven't always practiced it. I love too much to battle. I'm inclined to tell somebody if his glass of water is dirty. Mother Marie, when Mr. Muhammad was busy, would tell me about her son's boyhood and of his growing up in Georgia to young manhood. Mother Marie's account of her son began when she was herself, but seven years old. She told me that then she had a vision that one day she would be the mother of a very great man. She married a Baptist minister, Reverend Poole, who worked around Sandersville on the farms and in the sawmills. Among their 13 children, said Mother Marie, little Elijah was very different, almost from when he could walk and talk. The small, frail boy usually settled his older brother's and sister's disputes, Mother Marie said. And young as he was, he became regarded by them as their leader. And Elijah, about the time he entered school, began displaying a strong race consciousness. After the fourth grade, because the family was so poor, Elijah had to quit school and begin full-time working. An older sister taught Elijah as much as she was able at night. Mother Marie said that Elijah spent hours pouring through the Bible, with tears shining in his eyes. Mr. Muhammad told me himself later that as a boy, he felt that the Bible's words were a locked door that could be unlocked, if only he knew how, and he cried because of his frustrated anxiety to receive understanding. Elijah grew up into a still frail teenager who displayed a most uncommonly strong love for his race and, Mother Marie said, instead of condemning Negro's faults, young Elijah always would speak of reasons for those faults. Mother Marie has since died. I believe that she had as large a funeral as Chicago has seen. Not only Muslims, but others knew of the deep bond that Messenger Elijah had with his mother. I am not ashamed to say how little learning I have had, Mr. Muhammad told me. My going to school no further than the fourth grade proves that I can know nothing except the truth I have been taught by Allah. Allah taught me mathematics. He found me with a sluggish tongue and taught me how to pronounce words. Mr. Muhammad said that somehow he never could stand how the Sandersville white farmers, the sawmill foremen, or other white employers would habitually and often curse Negro workers. He said he would politely ask any for whom he worked never to curse him. I would ask them to just fire me if they didn't like my work, but just don't curse me. Mr. Muhammad's ordinary conversation was the manner he used when making speeches. He was not eloquent, as eloquence is usually meant, but whatever he uttered had an impact on me that trained orators did not begin to have. He said that on the jobs he got, he worked so honestly that generally he was put in charge of the other Negroes. After Mr. Muhammad and Sister Clara met and married and their first two children had been born, a white employer early in 1923 did curse Mr. Muhammad, then Elijah Poole. Elijah Poole, determined to avoid trouble, took his family to Detroit, arriving when he was 25. Five more children would be born there in Detroit, and finally the last one in Chicago. In Detroit in 1931, Mr. Muhammad met Master W.D. Fard. The effects of the Depression were bad everywhere, but in the black ghetto, they were horrible, Mr. Muhammad told me. A small, light brown-skinned man knocked from door to door at the apartments of the poverty-stricken Negroes. The man offered for sale silks and other yard goods, and he identified himself as a brother from the East. This man began to tell Negroes how they came from a distant land in the seeds of their forefathers. He warned them against eating the filthy pig and other wrong foods that it was habitual for Negroes to eat. Among the Negroes whom he found most receptive, he began holding little meetings in their poor homes. The man taught both the Quran and the Bible, and his students included Elijah Poole. This man said his name was W.D. Fard. He said that he was born in the Quraysh tribe of Muhammad ibn Abdullah, the Arabian prophet himself. 
This peddler of silks and yard goods, Mr. W.D. Fard, knew the Bible better than any of the Christian-bred Negroes. In the essence, Mr. W.D. Fard taught that God's true name was Allah, that his true religion was Islam, that the true name for that religion's people was Muslims. Mr. W.D. Fard taught that the Negroes in America were directly descended from Muslims. He taught that Negroes in America were lost sheep, lost for 400 years from the nation of Islam, and that he, Mr. Fard, had come to redeem and return the Negro to his true religion. No heaven was in the sky, Mr. Fard taught, and no hell was in the ground. Instead, both heaven and hell were conditions in which people lived right here on this planet Earth. Mr. Fard taught that the Negro in America had been for 400 years in hell, and he, Mr. Fard, had come to return them to where heaven for them was, back home among their own kind. Master Fard taught that as hell was on earth, also on earth was the devil, the white race which was bred from black original man 6,000 years before, purposely to create a hell on earth for the next 6,000 years. The black people, God's children, were gods themselves, Master Fard taught, and he taught that among them was one, also a human being like the others, who was the God of gods, the most, most high, the supreme being, supreme in wisdom and power, and his proper name was Allah. Among his handful of first converts in 1931 in Detroit, Master W.D. Fard taught that every religion says that near the last day or near the end of time, God would come to resurrect the lost sheep, to separate them from their enemies and restore them to their own people. Master Fard taught that prophecy referred to this finder and savior of the lost sheep as the Son of Man, or God in person, or the life giver, the Redeemer, or the Messiah, who would come as lightning from the east and appear in the west. He was the one to whom the Jews referred as the Messiah, the Christians as the Christ, and the Muslims as the Mahdi. I would sit, galvanized, hearing what I then accepted from Mr. Muhammad's own mouth as being the true history of our religion, the true religion for the black man. Mr. Muhammad told me that one evening he had a revelation that Master W.D. Fard represented the fulfillment of the prophecy. I asked him, said Mr. Muhammad, who are you and what is your real name? And he said, I am the one the world has been looking for to come for the past 2,000 years. I said to him again, said Mr. Muhammad, what is your true name? And then he said, my name is Mahdi. I came to guide you into the right path. Mr. Elijah Muhammad says that he sat listening with an open heart and an open mind, the way I was sitting listening to Mr. Muhammad. And Mr. Muhammad said he never doubted any word that the Savior taught him. Starting to organize, Master W.D. Fard set up a class for training ministers to carry the teachings to America's black people. In giving names to these first ministers, Master Fard named Elijah Poole, Elijah Cariam. Next, Master W.D. Fard established in 1931 in Detroit a University of Islam. It had adult classes which taught, among other things, mathematics to help the poor Negroes quit being duped and deceived by the tricknology of the blue-eyed devil white man. Starting a school in the rough meant that it lacked qualified teachers, but a start had to be made somewhere. Mr. Elijah Cariam removed his own children from Detroit public schools to start a nucleus of children in the University of Islam. Mr. Muhammad told me that his older children's lack of formal education reflected their sacrifice to form the backbone for today's universities of Islam in Detroit and Chicago, which have better qualified faculties. Master W.D. Fard selected Elijah Cariam to be the Supreme Minister over all other ministers, and among all of those others sprang up a bitter jealousy. All of them had better education than Elijah Cariam, and also they were more articulate than he was. They raged even in his presence. Why should we bow down to someone who appears less qualified? But Mr. Elijah Karim was then in some way renamed Elijah Muhammad, who as the Supreme Minister began to receive from Master W.D. Fard for the next three and a half years private teachings, during which time he says he heard things never revealed to others. During this period, Mr. Elijah Muhammad and Master W.D. Fard went to Chicago and established Temple No. 2. They also established in Milwaukee the beginnings of a Temple No. 3. In 1934, Master W.D. Fard disappeared without a trace. Elijah Muhammad says that attempts were made upon his life because the other minister's jealousy had reached such a pitch. He says that these hypocrites forced him to flee to Chicago. Temple No. 2 became his headquarters until the hypocrites pursued him there, forcing him to flee again. In Washington, D.C., he began Temple No. 4, 
Also while there, in the Congressional Library, he studied books which he says Master W.D. Fard had told him contained different pieces of the truth that Devil White Man had recorded, but which were not in books generally available to the public. Saying that he was still pursued by the hypocrites, Mr. Muhammad fled from city to city, never staying long in any. Whenever able now and then, he slipped home to see his wife and his eight young children, who were fed by other poor Muslims who shared what little they had. Even Mr. Muhammad's original Chicago followers wouldn't know he was at home, for he says the hypocrites made serious efforts to kill him. In 1942, Mr. Muhammad was arrested. He says Uncle Tom Negroes had tipped off the devil white man to his teachings, and he was charged by this devil white man with draft dodging, although he was too old for military service. He was sentenced to five years in prison. In the Milan, Michigan, federal prison, Mr. Muhammad served three and a half years. Then he was paroled. He had returned to his work in 1946 to remove the blinders from the eyes of the black man in the wilderness of North America. I can hear myself now at the lectern in our little Muslim temple, passionately addressing my black brothers and sisters. This little gentle sweet man, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who is at this very hour teaching our brothers and sisters over there in Chicago, Allah's messenger, which makes him the most powerful black man in America. For you and me, he has sacrificed seven years on the run from filthy hypocrites. He spent another three and a half years in a prison cage. He was put there by the devil white man. That devil white man does not want the Honorable Elijah Muhammad stirring awake, the sleeping giant of you and me, and all of our ignorant, brainwashed kind here in the white man's heaven and the black man's hell here in the wilderness of North America. I have sat at our messenger's feet, hearing the truth from his own mouth. I have pledged on my knees to Allah to tell the white man about his crimes and the black man the true teachings of our honorable Elijah Muhammad. I don't care if it costs my life. This was my attitude. These were my uncompromising words, uttered anywhere, without hesitation or fear. I was his most faithful servant, and I know today that I did believe in him more firmly than he believed in himself. In the years to come, I was going to have to face a psychological and spiritual crisis. Chapter 13 Minister Malcolm X, I quit the Ford Motor Company's Lincoln Mercury Division. It had become clear to me that Mr. Muhammad needed ministers to spread his teachings to establish more temples among the 22 million black brothers who were brainwashed and sleeping in the cities of North America. My decision came relatively quickly. I have always been an activist, and my personal chemistry perhaps made me reach more quickly than most ministers in the Nation of Islam that stage of dedication. But every minister in the nation, in his own time, in his own way, in the privacy of his own soul, came to the conviction that it was written that all of his before life had been only conditioning and preparation to become a disciple of Mr. Muhammad's. Everything that happens, Islam teaches, is written. Mr. Muhammad invited me to visit his home in Chicago as often as possible while he trained me for months. Never in prison had I studied and absorbed so intensely as I did now under Mr. Muhammad's guidance. I was immersed in the worship rituals, and what he taught us were the true natures of men and women, the organizational and administrative procedures, the real meanings, and the interrelated meanings and uses of the Bible and the Quran. I went to bed every night ever more awed, if not Allah, who else could have put such wisdom into that little humble lamb of a man from the Georgia fourth grade and sawmills and cotton patches? The lamb of a man analogy I drew for myself from the prophecy in the book of Revelations of a symbolic lamb with a two-edged sword in its mouth. Mr. Muhammad's two-edged sword was his teachings, which cut back and forth to free the black man's mind from the white man. My adoration of Mr. Muhammad grew in the sense of the Latin root word adorare. It means much more than our adoration or adore. It means that my worship of him was so awesome that he was the first man whom I had ever feared, not fear such as of a man with a gun, but the fear such as one has of the power of the sun. Mr. Muhammad, when he felt me able, permitted me to go to Boston. Brother Lloyd X lived there. He invited people whom he had gotten interested in Islam to hear me in his living room. I quote what I said when I was just starting out, and then later on in other places, as I can best remember the general pattern that I used in successive phases in those days. I know that then I always like to start off with my favorite analogy of Mr. Muhammad. God has given Mr. Muhammad some sharp truth, I told them. It is like a two-edged sword. It cuts into you. It causes you great pain 
but if you can take the truth, it will cure you and save you from what otherwise would be certain death. Then I wouldn't waste any time to start opening their eyes about the devil white man. I know you don't realize the enormity, the horrors of the so-called Christian white man's crime. Not even in the Bible is there such a crime. God in his wrath struck down with fire the perpetrators of lesser crimes. One hundred million of us black people, your grandparents, mine, murdered by this white man. To get 15 million of us here to make us his slaves on the way he murdered 100 million. I wish it was possible for me to show you the sea bottom in those days. The black bodies, the blood, the bones broken by boots and clubs. The pregnant black women who were thrown overboard if they got too sick. Thrown overboard to the sharks that had learned that following these slave ships was the way to grow fat. Why the white man's raping of the black race's woman began right on those slave ships. The blue-eyed devil could not even wait until he got them here. Why, brothers and sisters, civilized mankind has never known such an orgy of greed and lust and murder. The dramatization of slavery never failed intensely to arouse Negroes hearing its horrors spelled out for the first time. It's unbelievable how many black men and women have let the white man fool them into holding an almost romantic idea of what slave days were like. And once I had them fired up with slavery, I would shift the scene to themselves. I want you, when you leave this room, to start to see all this whenever you see this devil white man. Oh yes, he's a devil. I just want you to start watching him in his places where he doesn't want you around. Watch him reveling in his preciousness and his exclusiveness and his vanity while he continues to subjugate you and me. Every time you see a white man, think about the devil you're seeing. Think of how it was on your slave for parents' bloody, sweaty backs that he built this empire that's today the richest of all nations, where his evil and his greed cause him to be hated around the world. Every meeting, the people who had been there before returned, bringing friends. None of them ever had heard the raps taken off the white man. I can't remember any black man ever in those living room audiences in Brother Lloyd X's home at 5 Wellington Street who didn't stand up immediately when I asked after each lecture, will all stand who believe what you have heard? And each Sunday night, some of them stood, while I could see others not quite ready, when I asked, how many of you want to follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? Enough had stood up after about three months that we were able to open a little temple. I remember with what pleasure we rented some folding chairs. I was beside myself with joy when I could report to Mr. Muhammad a new temple address. It was when we got this little mosque that my sister Ella first began to come to hear me. She sat, staring, as though she couldn't believe it was me. Ella never moved, even when I had only asked all who believed what they had heard to stand up. She contributed when our collection was held. It didn't bother or challenge me at all about Ella. I never even thought about converting her as tough-minded and cautious about joining anything as I personally knew her to be. I wouldn't have expected anyone short of Allah himself to have been able to convert Ella. I would close the meeting as Mr. Muhammad had taught me. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of all the worlds, the Beneficent, Merciful Master of the day of judgment in which we now live. Thee alone do we serve, and thee alone do we beseech for thine aid. Guide us on the right path the path of those upon whom thou hast bestowed favors, not of those upon whom thy wrath is brought down, nor the path of those who go astray after they have heard thy teaching. I bear witness that there is no God but thee, and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is thy servant and apostle. I believed he had been divinely sent to our people by Allah himself. I would raise my hand for them to be dismissed. Do nothing unto anyone that you would not like to have done unto yourself. Seek peace and never be the aggressor. But if anyone attacks you, we do not teach you to turn the other cheek. May Allah bless you to be successful and victorious in all that you do. Except for that one day when I had stayed with Ella on the way to Detroit after prison, I had not been in the old Roxbury streets for seven years. I went to have a reunion with Shorty. Shorty, when I found him, acted uncertain. The wire had told him I was in town and on some religious kick. He didn't know if I was serious or if I was another of the hustling preacher pimps to be found in every black ghetto, the ones with some little storefront churches of mostly hardworking, older women who kept their pretty boy young preacher dressed in sharp clothes and driving a fancy car. I quickly let Shorty know how serious I was with Islam, but then, talking the old street talk, I quickly put him at his ease, and we had a great reunion. 
We laughed until we cried at Shorty's dramatization of his reactions when he heard that judge keep saying, count one, 10 years, count two, 10 years. We talked about how having those white girls with us had gotten us 10 years where we had seen in prison plenty of worse offenders with far less time to serve. Shorty still had a little band and he was doing fairly well. He was rightfully very proud that in prison he had studied music. I told him enough about Islam to see from his reactions that he didn't really want to hear it. In prison, he had misheard about our religion. He got me off the subject by making a joke. He said that he hadn't had enough pork chops and white women. I don't know if he has yet or not. I know that he's married to a white woman now, and he's fat as a hog from eating hog. I also saw John Hughes, the gambling house owner, and some others I had known who were still around Roxbury. The wire about me had made them all uncomfortable, but my what you know, daddy, approach at least enabled us to have some conversations. I never mentioned Islam to most of them. I knew from what I had been when I was with them, how brainwashed they were. As Temple Eleven's minister, I served only briefly because as soon as I got it organized, by March 1954, I left it in charge of Minister Ulysses X and the messenger moved me on to Philadelphia. The city of brotherly love black people reacted even faster to the truth about the white man than the Bostonians had and Philadelphia's Temple 12 was established by the end of May. It had taken a little under three months. The next month, because of those Boston and Philadelphia successes, Mr. Muhammad appointed me to be the minister of Temple 7 in vital New York City. I can't start to describe for you my welter of emotions. For Mr. Muhammad's teachings really to resurrect American black people, Islam obviously had to grow, to grow very big. And nowhere in America was such a single temple potential available as in New York's five boroughs. They contained over a million black people. It was nine years since West Indian Archie and I had been stalking the streets, momentarily expecting to try and shoot each other down like dogs. Red, my man, Red, this can't be you. With my natural kinky red hair now close cropped, in place of the old long-haired lie-cooked conch they had always known on my head, I know I looked much different. Give him some skin, man. A drink here, bartender. What? You quit. Oh, man, come off it. It was so good seeing so many whom I had known so well. You can understand how that was. But it was West Indian Archie and Sammy the Pimp for whom I was primarily looking. And the first nasty shock came quickly about Sammy. He had quit pimping. He had gotten pretty high up in the numbers business and was doing well. Sammy even had married some fast young girl. But then shortly after his wedding one morning, he was found lying dead across his bed, they said with $25,000 in his pockets. People don't want to believe the sums that even the minor underworld handles. Why, listen, in March 1964, a Chicago nickel and dime bets Wheel of Fortune man, Lawrence Wakefield, died, and over $760,000 in cash was in his apartment in sacks and bags, all taken from poor Negroes, and we wonder why we stay so poor. Sick about Sammy, I queried from bar to bar among old-timers for West Indian Archie. The wire hadn't reported him dead or living somewhere else, but none seemed to know where he was. I heard the usual hustler fates of so many others. Bullets, knives, prison, dope, diseases, insanity, alcoholism. I imagined it was about in that order. And so many of the survivors whom I knew as tough hyenas and wolves of the streets in the old days now were so pitiful. They had known all the angles, but beneath that surface, they were poor, ignorant, untrained black men. Life had eased up on them and hyped them. I ran across close to 25 of these old timers I had known pretty well, who in the space of nine years had been reduced to the ghetto's minor scavenger hustles to scratch up room rent and food money. Some now work downtown, messengers, janitors, things like that. I was thankful to Allah that I had become a Muslim and escaped their fate. There was Cadillac Drake. He was a big, jolly, cigar-smoking, fat, black, gaudy-dressing pimp, a regular afternoon character when I was waiting on tables in Small's Paradise. Well, I recognized him shuffling toward me on the street. He had gotten hooked on heroin. I'd heard that. He was the dirtiest, sloppiest bum you ever laid eyes on. I hurried past because we would both have been embarrassed if he recognized me, the kid he used to toss a dollar tip. The wire worked to locate West Indian Archie for me. The wire of the streets, when it wants to, is something like Western Union with the FBI for messengers. At one of my early services at Temple 7, an old scavenger hustler, to whom I gave a few dollars, 
came up when services were dismissed. He told me that West Indian Archie was sick, living up in a rented room in the Bronx. I took a taxi to the address. West Indian Archie opened the door. He stood there in rumpled pajamas and barefooted, squinting at me. Have you ever seen someone who seemed a ghost of the person you remembered? It took him a few seconds to fix me in his memory. He claimed hoarsely, Red, I'm so glad to see you. I all but hugged the old man. He was sick in that weak way. I helped him back. He sat down on the edge of his bed. I sat in his one chair, and I told him how his forcing me out of Harlem had saved my life by turning me in the direction of Islam. He said, I always liked you, Red, and he said that he had never really wanted to kill me. I told him it had made me shudder many times to think how close we had come to killing each other. I told him I had sincerely thought I had hit that combinated six-way number for the $300 he had paid me. Archie said that he had later wondered if he had made some mistake since I was so ready to die about it. And then we agreed that it wasn't worth even talking about. It didn't mean anything anymore. He kept saying over and over, in between other things, that he was so glad to see me. I went into a little of Mr. Muhammad's teaching with Archie. I told him how I had found out that all of us who had been in the streets were victims of the white man society. I told Archie what I had thought in prison about him, that his brain, which could tape record hundreds of number combinations a day, should have been put at the service of mathematics or science. Red, that sure is something to think about, I can remember him saying, but neither of us would say that it was not too late. I have the feeling that he knew, as I could see, that the end was closing in on Archie. I became too moved about what he had been and what he had now become to be able to stay much longer. I didn't have much money, and he didn't want to accept what little I was able to press on him, but I made him take it. I keep having to remind myself that then, in June 1954, Temple 7 in New York City was a little storefront. Why? It's almost unbelievable that one bus couldn't have been filled with the Muslims in New York City. Even among our own black people in the Harlem ghetto, you could have said Muslim to a thousand, and maybe only one would not have asked you, what's that? As for white people, except for that relative handful privy to certain police or prison files, not 500 white people in all of America knew we existed. I began firing Mr. Muhammad's teaching at the New York members and the few friends they managed to bring in. And with each meeting, my discomfort grew that in Harlem, choked with poor, ignorant black men, suffering all of the evils that Islam could cure, every time I lectured my heart out and then asked those who wanted to follow Mr. Muhammad to stand, only two or three would. And I have to admit, sometimes not that many. I think I was all the angrier with my own ineffectiveness because I knew the streets. I had to get myself together and think out the problem. And the big trouble, obviously, was that we were only one among the many voices of black discontent on every busy Harlem corner. The different nationalist groups, the Buy Black forces, and others like that, dozens of their stepladder orators were trying to increase their followings. I had nothing against anyone trying to promote independence and unity among black men, but they still were making it tough for Mr. Muhammad's voice to be heard. In my first effort to get over this hurdle, I had some little leaflets printed. There wasn't a much-traveled Harlem street corner that five or six good Muslim brothers and I missed. We would step up right in front of a walking black man or woman so that they had to accept our leaflet. And if they hesitated one second, they had to hear us saying some catch things such as, hear how the white man kidnapped and robbed and raped our black race. Next, we went to work fishing on those Harlem corners, on the fringes of the nationalist meetings. The method today has many refinements, but then it consisted of working the always shifting edges of the audiences that others had managed to draw. At a nationalist meeting, everyone who was listening was interested in the revolution of the black race. We began to get visible results almost immediately after we began thrusting handbills in people's hands. Come to hear us too, brother. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us how to cure the black man's spiritual, mental, moral, economic, and political sicknesses. I saw the new faces of our Temple 7 meetings, and then we discovered the best fishing audience of all, by far the best conditioned audience for Mr. Muhammad's teachings, the Christian churches. Our Sunday services were held at 2 p.m. all over Harlem during the hour or so before that. Christian church services were dismissing. We by passed the larger churches with their higher ratio of so-called middle-class Negroes who were so full of pretense and status that they wouldn't be caught in our little storefront. 
We went fishing fast and furiously when those little evangelical storefront churches each let out their 30 to 50 people on the sidewalk. Come to hear us, brother, sister. You haven't heard anything until you have heard the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. These congregations were usually Southern migrant people, usually older, who would go anywhere to hear what they called good preaching. These were the church congregations who were always putting out little signs announcing that inside they were selling fried chicken and chitlin dinners to raise some money. And three or four nights a week, they were in their storefront rehearsing for the next Sunday, I guess, shaking and rattling and rolling the gospels with their guitars and tambourines. I don't know if you know it, but there's a whole circuit of commercial gospel entertainers who have come out of these little churches in the city ghettos or from down south. People such as Sister Rosetta Tharp, the Claire Award singers, are examples. And there must be 500 lesser lights of the same general order. Mahalia Jackson the greatest of them all. She was a preacher's daughter in Louisiana. She came up there to Chicago where she worked cooking and scrubbing for white people and then in a factory while she sang in the Negro churches, the gospel style that, when it caught on, made her the first Negro that Negroes ever made famous. She was selling hundreds of thousands of records among Negroes before white people ever knew who Mahalia Jackson was. Anyway, I know that somewhere I once read that Mahalia said that every time she can, she will slip unannounced into some ghetto storefront church and sing with her people. She calls that my filling station. The black Christians we fished to our temple were conditioned, I found, by the very shock I could give them about what had been happening to them while they worshipped a blonde, blue-eyed God. I knew the temple that I could build if I could really get to those Christians. I tailored the teachings for them. I would start to speak and sometimes be so emotionally charged I had to explain myself. You see my tears, brothers and sisters? Tears haven't been in my eyes since I was a young boy. But I cannot help this when I feel the responsibility I have to help you comprehend for the first time what this white man's religion that we call Christianity has done to us. Brothers and sisters here for the first time, please don't let that shock you. I know you didn't expect this, because almost none of us black people have thought that maybe we were making a mistake not wondering if there wasn't a special religion somewhere for us, a special religion for the black man. Well, there is such a religion. It's called Islam. Let me spell it for you. I-S-L-A-M, Islam. But I'm going to tell you about Islam a little later. First, we need to understand some things about this Christianity before we can understand why the answer for us is Islam. Brothers and sisters, the white man has brainwashed us black people to fasten our gaze upon a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus. We're worshiping a Jesus that doesn't even look like us. Oh, yes. Now just bear with me. Listen to the teachings of the Messenger of Allah, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Now just think of this. The blonde-haired, blue-eyed white man has taught you and me to worship a white Jesus and to shout and sing and pray to this God that's his God, the white man's God. The white man has taught us to shout and sing and pray until we die, to wait until death for some dreamy heaven in the hereafter when we're dead, while this white man has his milk and honey in the streets paved with golden dollars right here on this earth. You don't want to believe what I'm telling you, brothers and sisters? Well, I'll tell you what you do. You go out of here, you just take a good look around where you live. Look at not only how you live, but look at how anybody that you know lives. That way, you'll be sure that you're not just a bad luck accident. And when you get through looking at where you live, then you take you a walk down across Central Park and start to look at what this white God had brought to the white man. I mean, take yourself a look down there at how the white man is living. And don't stop there. In fact, you won't be able to stop for long. His doormen are going to tell you, move on. But catch a subway and keep on downtown. Anywhere you may want to get off, look at the white man's apartments, businesses, Go right on down to the tip of Manhattan Island that this devilish white man stole from the trusting Indians for $24. Look at his city hall down there. Look at his Wall Street. Look at yourself. Look at his God. I had learned early one important thing, and that was to always teach in terms that the people could understand. Also, where the nationalists whom we had fished were almost all men among the storefront Christians, a heavy preponderance were women, and I had the sense to offer something special for them. Beautiful black women, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that the black man is going around saying he wants respect. Well, the black man never will get anybody's respect until he first learns to respect his own women. The black man needs today to stand up and throw off the weaknesses imposed upon him by the slave master white man. 
the black man needs to start today to shelter and protect and respect his black women. 100% would stand up without hesitation when I said, how many believe what they have heard? But still never more than an agonizing few would stand up when I invited. Will those stand who want to follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? I knew that our strict moral code and discipline was what repelled them most. I fired at this point at the reason for our code. The white man wants black men to stay immoral, unclean, and ignorant. As long as we stay in these conditions, we will keep on begging him and he will control us. We never can win freedom and justice and equality until we are doing something for ourselves. The code, of course, had to be explained to any who were tentatively interested in becoming Muslims. And the word got around in their little storefronts quickly, which is why they would come to hear me, yet wouldn't join Mr. Muhammad. Any fornication was absolutely forbidden in the nation of Islam. Any eating of the filthy pork or other injurious or unhealthful foods. Any use of tobacco, alcohol, or narcotics. No Muslim who followed Elijah Muhammad could dance, gamble, date, attend movies or sports, or take long vacations from work. Muslims slept no more than health required. Any domestic quarreling, any discourtesy, especially to women, was not allowed. No lying or stealing, and no insubordination to civil authority, except on the grounds of religious obligation. Our moral laws were policed by our fruit of Islam, able, dedicated, and trained Muslim men. Infractions resulted in suspension by Mr. Muhammad, or isolation for various periods, or even expulsion for the worst offenses from the only group that really cares about you. Temple 7 grew somewhat with each meeting. It just grew too slowly to suit me. During the weekdays, I traveled by bus and train. I taught each Wednesday at Philadelphia's Temple 12. I went to Springfield, Massachusetts to try to start a new temple. A temple which Mr. Muhammad numbered 13 was established there with the help of Brother Osborne, who had first heard of Islam from me in prison. A lady visiting a Springfield meeting asked if I'd come to Hartford, where she lived. She specified the next Thursday and said she would assemble some friends. And I was right there. Thursday is traditionally domestic servants' day off. This sister had in her housing project apartment about 15 of the maids, cooks, chauffeurs, and housemen who worked for the Hartford area white people. You've heard that saying, no man is a hero to his valet. Well, those Negroes who waited on wealthy whites hand and foot opened their eyes quicker than most Negroes. And when they went fishing enough among more servants and other black people in and around Hartford, Mr. Muhammad before long was able to assign a Hartford temple the number 14. And every Thursday I scheduled my teaching there. Mr. Muhammad, when I went to see him in Chicago, had to chastise me on some point during nearly every visit. I just couldn't keep from showing in some manner that with his ministers equipped with the power of his message, I felt the nation should go much faster. His patience and his wisdom in chastising me would always humble me from head to foot. He said one time that no true leader burdened his followers with a greater load than they could carry, and no true leader sets too fast a pace for his followers to keep up. Most people seeing a man in an old touring car going real slow think the man doesn't want to go fast. Mr. Muhammad said, but the man knows that to drive any faster would destroy the old car. When he gets a fast car, then he will drive at a fast speed. And I remember him telling me another time, when I complained about an inefficient minister at one of his mosques, I would rather have a mule I can depend upon than a racehorse that I can't depend upon. I knew that Mr. Muhammad wanted that fast car to drive. And I don't think you could pick the same number of faithful brothers and sisters from the Nation of Islam today and find fishing teams to beat the efforts of those who helped to bring growth to the Boston, Philadelphia, Springfield, Hartford, and New York temples. I'm, of course, just mentioning those that I knew most about because I was directly involved. This was through 1955. And 1955 was the year I made my first trip of any distance. It was to help open the temple that today is number 15 in Atlanta, Georgia. Any Muslim who ever moved for personal reasons from one city to another was of course exhorted to plant seeds for Mr. Muhammad. Brother James X, one of our top Temple 12 brothers, had interested enough black people in Atlanta so that when Mr. Muhammad was advised, he told me to go to Atlanta and hold a first meeting. I think I have had a hand in most of Mr. Muhammad's temples, but I'll never forget that opening in Atlanta. A funeral parlor was the only place large enough that Brother James X could afford to rent. Everything that the Nation of Islam did in those days, from Mr. Muhammad on down, was strictly on a shoestring. 
When we all arrived, though, a Christian Negro's funeral was just dismissing, so we had to wait a while, and we watched the mourners out. You saw them all crying over their physical dead, I told our group when we got inside. But the nation of Islam is rejoicing over you, are mentally dead. That may shock you, but oh yes, you just don't realize how our whole black race in America is mentally dead. We are here today with Mr. Elijah Muhammad's teachings, which resurrect the black man from the dead. And speaking of funerals, I should mention that we never failed to get some new Muslims when non-Muslims, family and friends of a Muslim deceased, attended our short moving ceremony that illustrated Mr. Muhammad's teaching, Christians have their funerals for the living, ours are for our departed. As the minister of several temples, conducting the Muslim ceremony had occasionally fallen to my lot. As Mr. Muhammad had taught me, I would start by reading over the casket of the departed brother or sister a prayer to Allah. Next, I read a simple obituary record of his or her life. Then I usually read from Job two passages in the 7th and 14th chapters where Job speaks of no life after death. Then another passage where David, when his son died, spoke also of no life after death. To the audience before me, I explained why no tears were to be shed and why we had no flowers or singing or organ playing. We shed tears for our brother and gave him our music and our tears while he was alive. If he wasn't wept for and given our music and flowers then, well, now there is no need because he is no longer aware. We now will give his family any money we might have spent. Appointed Muslim sisters quickly passed small trays from which everyone took a thin, round patty of peppermint candy. At my signal, the candy was put into mouths. We will file by now for a last look at our brother. We won't cry, just as we don't cry over candy. Just as this sweet candy will dissolve, so will our brother's sweetness that we have enjoyed when he lived now dissolve into a sweetness in our memories. I have had probably a couple of hundred Muslims tell me that it was attending one of our funerals for a departed brother or sister that first turned them toward Allah. But I was to learn later that Mr. Muhammad's teaching about death and the Muslim funeral service was in drastic contradiction to what Islam taught in the East. We had grown by 1956. Well, sizable. Every temple had fished with enough success that there were far more Muslims, especially in the major cities of Detroit, Chicago, and New York, than anyone would have guessed from the outside. In fact, as you know, in the really big cities, you can have a very big organization, and if it makes no public show or noise, no one will necessarily be aware that it is around. But more than just increase in numbers, Mr. Muhammad's version of Islam now had been getting in some other types of Black people. We began now getting those with some education, both academic and vocations and trades, and even some with positions in the white world. And all of this was starting to bring us closer to the desired fast car for Mr. Muhammad to drive. We had, for instance, some civil servants, some nurses, clerical workers, salesmen from the department stores. And one of the best things was that some brothers of this type were developing into smart, fine, aggressive young ministers for Mr. Muhammad. I went without a lot of sleep trying to merit his increasing evidences of trust and confidence in my efforts to help build our nation of Islam. It was in 1956 that Mr. Muhammad was able to authorize Temple 7 to buy and assign for my use in New Chevrolet. The car was the nation's, not mine. I had nothing that was mine but my clothes, wristwatch, and suitcase. As in the case of all of the nation's ministers, my living expenses were paid and I had some pocket money. Where once you couldn't have named anything, I wouldn't have done for money. Now money was the last thing to cross my mind. Anyway, in letting me know about the car, Mr. Muhammad told me he knew how I loved to roam, planting seeds for new Muslims or more temples, so he didn't want me to be tied down. In five months, I put about 30,000 miles of fishing on that car before I had an accident. Late one night, a brother and I were coming through Wethersfield, Connecticut, when I stopped for a red light and a car smashed into me from behind. I was just shook up, not hurt. That excited devil had a woman with him, hiding her face, so I knew she wasn't his wife. We were exchanging our identification. He lived in Meriden, Connecticut, when the police arrived, and their actions told me he was somebody important. I later found out he was one of Connecticut's most prominent politicians. I won't call his name. Anyway, Temple 7 settled on a lawyer's advice, and that money went down on an Oldsmobile the make of car I've been driving ever since. I had always been very careful to stay completely clear of any personal closeness with any of the Muslim sisters. 
My total commitment to Islam demanded having no other interests, especially, I felt, no women. In almost every temple, at least one single sister had let out some broad hint that she thought I needed a wife. So I always made it clear that marriage had no interest for me whatsoever. I was too busy. Every month when I went to Chicago, I would find that some sister had written complaining to Mr. Muhammad that I talked so hard against women when I taught our special classes about the different natures of the two sexes. Now, Islam has very strict laws and teachings about women, the core of them being that the true nature of man is to be strong and a woman's true nature is to be weak. And while a man must at all times respect his woman, at the same time, he needs to understand that he must control her if he expects to get her respect. But in those days, I had my own personal reasons. I wouldn't have considered it possible for me to love any woman. I'd had too much experience that women were only tricky, deceitful, untrustworthy flesh. I had seen too many men ruined, or at least tied down, or in some other way, messed up by women. Women talk too much. To tell a woman not to talk too much was like telling Jesse James not to carry a gun, or telling a hen not to cackle. Can you imagine Jesse James without a gun? or a hen that didn't cackle. And for anyone in any kind of a leadership position, such as I was, the worst thing in the world that he could have was the wrong woman. Even Samson, the world's strongest man, was destroyed by the woman who slept in his arms. She was the one whose words hurt him. I mean, I'd had so much experience. I had talked to too many prostitutes and mistresses. They knew more about a whole lot of husbands than the wives of those husbands did. The wives always filled their husbands' ears so full of wife complaints that it wasn't the wives. It was the prostitutes and mistresses who heard the husband's innermost problems and secrets. They thought of him and comforted him, and that included listening to him, and so he would tell them everything. Anyway, it had been 10 years since I thought anything about any mistress, I guess, and as a minister now, I was thinking even less about getting any wife, and Mr. Muhammad himself encouraged me to stay single. Temple Seven Sisters used to tell brothers, you're just staying single because Brother Minister Malcolm never looks at anybody. No, I didn't make it any secret to any of those sisters how I felt. And, yes, I did tell the brothers to be very, very careful. This sister, well, in 1956, she joined Temple Seven. I just noticed her, not with the slightest interest, you understand. For about the next year, I just noticed her. You know, she never would have dreamed I was even thinking about her. In fact, probably you couldn't have convinced her I even knew her name. It was Sister Betty X. She was tall, brown-skinned, darker than I was and she had brown eyes. I knew she was a native of Detroit, and that she had been a student at Tuskegee Institute down in Alabama, an education major. She was in New York at one of the big hospitals' school of nursing. She lectured to the Muslim girls and women's classes on hygiene and medical facts. I ought to explain that each weeknight a different Muslim class or event is scheduled. Monday night, every temple's fruit of Islam trains. People think this is just military drill, judo, karate, things like that, which is part of the FOI training, but only one part. The FOI spends a lot more time in lectures and discussions on men learning to be men. They deal with the responsibilities of a husband and father, what to expect of women, the rights of women, which are not to be abrogated by the husband, the importance of the father-male image in the strong household, current events, why honesty and chastity are vital in a person, a home, a community, a nation, and a civilization, why one should bathe at least once each 24 hours, business principles, and things of that nature. Then, Tuesday night in every Muslim temple is Unity Night, where the brothers and sisters enjoy each other's conversational company and refreshments, such as cookies and sweet and sour fruit punches. Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. is what is called student enrollment, where Islam's basic issues are discussed. It is about the equivalent of catechism class in the Catholic religion. Thursday nights, there are the MGT, Muslim Girls Training, and the GCC, General Civilization class, where the women and girls of Islam are taught how to keep homes, how to rear children, how to care for husbands, how to cook, sew, how to act at home and abroad, and other things that are important to being a good Muslim sister and mother and wife. Fridays are devoted to Civilization Night when classes are held for brothers and sisters in the area of the domestic relations, emphasizing how both husbands and wives must understand and respect each other's true natures. Then Saturday night is for all Muslims a free night, when usually they visit at each other's homes. And of course, on Sundays, every Muslim temple holds its services. 
on the Thursday MGT and GCC nights, sometimes I would drop in on the classes and maybe at Sister Betty X's classes, just as on other nights I might drop in on the different brothers' classes. At first, I would just ask her things like, how were the sisters learning? Things like that. And she would say, fine, brother minister. I'd say, thank you, sister. Like that. And that would be all there was to it. And after a while, I would have very short conversations with her just to be friendly. One day, I thought it would help the women's classes if I took her, just because she happened to be an instructor to the Museum of Natural History. I wanted to show her some museum displays having to do with the Tree of Evolution that would help her in her lectures. I could show her proofs of Mr. Muhammad's teachings of such things as that the filthy pig is only a large rodent. The pig is a graft between a rat, a cat, and a dog, Mr. Muhammad taught us. When I mentioned my idea to Sister Betty X, I made it very clear that it was just to help her lectures to the sisters. I had even convinced myself that this was the only reason. Then, by the time of the afternoon I said we would go, well, I telephoned her. I told her I had to cancel the trip, that something important had come up. She said, well, you sure waited long enough to tell me, Brother Minister. I was just ready to walk out of the door. So I told her, well, all right, come on then, I'd make it somehow. But I wasn't going to have much time. While we were down there, offhandedly, I asked her all kinds of things. I just wanted some idea of her thinking. You understand? I mean, how she thought. I was halfway impressed by her intelligence and also her education. In those days, she was one of the few whom we had attracted who had attended college. Then, right after that, one of the older sisters confided to me a personal problem that Sister Betty X was having. I was really surprised that when she had had the chance, Sister Betty X had not mentioned anything to me about it. Every Muslim minister is always hearing the problems of young people whose parents have ostracized them for becoming Muslims. Well, when Sister Betty X told her foster parents, who were financing her education, that she was a Muslim, they gave her a choice. Leave the Muslims, or they'd cut off her nursing school. It was right near the end of her term, but she was hanging on to Islam. She began taking babysitting jobs for some of the doctors who lived on the grounds of the hospital where she was training. In my position, I would never have made any move without thinking how it would affect the Nation of Islam organization as a whole. I got to turning it over in my mind. What would happen if I just should happen, sometime, to think about getting married to somebody? For instance, Sister Betty X, although it could be any sister in any temple, but Sister Betty X, for instance, would just happen to be the right height for somebody my height and also the right age. Mr. Elijah Muhammad taught us that a tall man married to a too short woman or vice versa, they looked odd, not matched. And he taught that a wife's ideal age was half the man's age, plus seven. He taught that women are physiologically ahead of men. Mr. Muhammad taught that no marriage could succeed where the woman did not look up with respect to the man and that the man had to have something above and beyond the wife in order for her to be able to look to him for psychological security. I was so shocked at myself when I realized what I was thinking. I quit going anywhere near Sister Betty X or anywhere I knew she would be. If she came into our restaurant and I was there, I went out somewhere. I was glad I knew that she had no idea what I had been thinking about. My not talking to her wouldn't give her any reason to think anything, since there had never been one personal word spoken between us, even if she had thought anything. I studied about if I just should happen to say something to her, what would her position be? Because she wasn't going to get any chance to embarrass me. I had heard too many women bragging, I told that chump, get lost. I'd had too much experience of the kind to make a man very cautious. I knew one good thing, she had few relatives. My feeling about in-laws was that they were outlaws. Right among the Temple Seven Muslims, I had seen more marriages destroyed by in-laws usually anti-Muslim, than any other single thing I knew of. I wasn't about to say any of that romance stuff that Hollywood and television had filled women's heads with. If I was going to do something, I was going to do it directly. And anything I was going to do, I was going to do my way. And because I wanted to do it, not because I saw somebody do it or read about it in a book or saw it in a moving picture somewhere. I told Mr. Muhammad when I visited him in Chicago that month that I was thinking about a very serious step. He smiled when he heard what it was. I told him I was just thinking about it, that was all. Mr. Muhammad said that he'd like to meet this sister. The nation by this time was financially able to bear the expenses so that instructor sisters from different temples could be sent to Chicago to attend the headquarters Temple Two women's classes and, while there, 
to meet the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in person. Sister Betty X, of course, knew all about this, so there was no reason for her to think anything of it when it was arranged for her to go to Chicago. And like all visiting instructor sisters, she was the house guest of the messenger and Sister Clara Muhammad. Mr. Muhammad told me that he thought that Sister Betty X was a fine sister. If you are thinking about doing a thing, you ought to make up your mind if you are going to do it or not do it. One Sunday night, after the Temple 7 meeting, I drove my car out on the Garden State Parkway. I was on my way to visit my brother Wilfred in Detroit. Wilfred, the year before, in 1957, had been made the minister of Detroit's Temple 1. I hadn't seen him or any of my family in a good while. It was about 10 in the morning when I got inside Detroit. Getting gas at a filling station, I just went to their payphone on a wall. I telephoned Sister Betty X. I had to get information to get the number of the nurses' residents at this hospital. Most numbers I memorized, but I had always made at some point never to memorize her number. Somebody got her to the phone finally. She said, oh, hello, Brother Minister. I just said it to her direct, look, do you want to get married? Naturally, she acted all surprised and shocked. The more I've thought about it, to this day, I believe she was only putting on an act. Because women know, they know. She said, just like I knew she would, yes. Then I said, well, I didn't have a whole lot of time. She'd better catch a plane to Detroit. So she grabbed a plane. I met her foster parents who lived in Detroit. They had made up by this time. They were very friendly and happily surprised. At least they acted that way. Then I introduced Sister Betty X at my oldest brother Wilford's house. I had already asked him where people could get married without a whole lot of mess and waiting. He told me in Indiana. Early the next morning, I picked up Betty at her parents' home. We drove to the first town in Indiana. We found out that only a few days before, the state law had been changed, and now Indiana had a long waiting period. This was the 14th of January, 1958, a Tuesday. We weren't far from Lansing, where my brother Philbert lived. I drove there. Philbert was at work when we stopped at his house, and I introduced Betty X. She and Philbert's wife were talking when I found out on the phone that we could get married in one day if we rushed. We got the necessary blood test, then the license, where the certificate said religion, I wrote Muslim. Then we went to the Justice of the Peace. An old hunchbacked white man performed the wedding, and all of the witnesses were white. Where you are supposed to say all those I do's, we did. They were all standing there, smiling and watching every move. The old devil said, I pronounce you man and wife, and then kiss your bride. I got her out of there. All of that Hollywood stuff like these women wanting men to pick them up and carry them across thresholds, and some of them way more than you do. I don't know how many marriage breakups are caused by these movie and television addicted women expecting some bouquets and kissing and hugging and being swept out like Cinderella for dinner and dancing, then getting mad when a poor, scraggly husband comes in tired and sweaty from working like a dog all day looking for some food. We had dinner there at Filbert's home in Lansing. I've got a surprise for you. I told him when we came in. You haven't got any surprise for me, he said. When he got home from work and heard I'd been there introducing a Muslim sister, he knew I was either married or on the way to get married. Betty's nursing school schedule called for her to fly right back to New York, and she could return in four days. She claimed she didn't tell anybody in Temple 7 that we had married. That Sunday, Mr. Muhammad was going to teach at Detroit's Temple 1. I had an assistant minister in New York now. I telephoned him to take over for me. Saturday, Betty came back. The messenger, after his teaching on Sunday, made the announcement. Even in Michigan, my steering clear of all sisters was so well known, they just couldn't believe it. We drove right back to New York together. The news really shook everybody in Temple 7. Some young brothers looked at me as though I had betrayed them, but everybody else was grinning like Cheshire cats. The sisters just about ate up Betty. I never will forget hearing one exclaim, You got him! That's like I was telling you the nature of women. She'd got me. That's part of why I never have been able to shake it out of my mind that she knew something. All the time. Maybe she did get me. Anyway, we lived for the next two and a half years in Queens, sharing a house of two small apartments with Brother John Ali and his wife of that time. He's now the National Secretary in Chicago. Atala, our oldest daughter, was born in November 1958. She's named for Attila the Hun. He sacked Rome. Shortly after Atala came, we moved to our present seven-room house in an all-black section of Queens, Long Island. Another girl, Kubala, named after Kubala Khan, was born on Christmas Day of 1960. Then, Ilyasa, 
Elias is Arabic for Elijah, was born in July 1962. And in 1964, our fourth daughter, Amila, arrived. I guess by now I will say I love Betty. She's the only woman I ever even thought about loving. And she's one of the very few, four women, whom I have ever trusted. The thing is, Betty's a good Muslim woman and wife. You see, Islam is the only religion that gives both husband and wife a true understanding of what love is. The Western love concept, you take it apart, it really is lust. But love transcends just the physical. Love is disposition, behavior, attitude, thoughts, likes, dislikes. These things make a beautiful woman, a beautiful wife. This is the beauty that never fades. You find in your Western civilization that when a man's wife's physical beauty fails, she loses her attraction. But Islam teaches us to look into the woman and teaches her to look into us. Betty does this so she understands me. I would even say I don't imagine many other women might put up with the way I am. Awakening this brainwashed black man and telling this arrogant, devilish white man the truth about himself, Betty understands, is a full-time job. If I have work to do when I am home, the little time I am at home, she lets me have the quiet I need to work in. I'm rarely at home more than half of any week. I have been away as much as five months. I never get much chance to take her anywhere, and I know she likes to be with her husband. She is used to my calling her from airports anywhere from Boston to San Francisco, or Miami to Seattle, or here lately, cabling her from Cairo, Accra, or the holy city of Mecca. Once on the long-distance telephone, Betty told me in beautiful phrasing the way she thinks. She said, you are present when you are away. Later that year, after Betty and I were married, I exhausted myself trying to be everywhere at once, trying to help the nation to keep growing. Guest teaching at the temple in Boston, I ended as always, who among you wish to follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? And then I saw, in utter astonishment, that among those who were standing was my sister, Ella. We have a saying that those who are the hardest to convince make the best Muslims. And for Ella, it had taken five years. I mentioned, you will remember, how in a big city, a sizable organization can remain practically unknown unless something happens that brings it to the general public's attention. Well, certainly no one in the Nation of Islam had any anticipation of the kind of thing that would happen in Harlem one night. 